Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill 2020, Further consideration in Committee of the Whole. The Committee is considering the Transport Security Amendment, Serious Crimes Bill of 2020, and Amendment 1 um, on Sheet 1117 revised, moved by Senator Keneally. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I appreciate the call. Uh, yesterday in the committee debate, I note that the minister, uh, Zed Sisalja, Minister Sisalja, uh, started to make comments about the fact that this important debate on an important national security bill was somehow, quote, holding up the passage of the bill. And I think it might be useful to put on the record the history of this legislation, because if there is anyone holding up the passage of important reforms to transport security clearances, it is the Liberal National Government. Let's understand the background of this bill. Similar bills have been previously introduced in the 44th and 45th Parliament, and both failed to pass the Parliament. In the 44th Parliament, uh, the bill was put forward. Labor senators provided additional comments in a Senate inquiry, uh, and the bill was allowed by the Liberal National Government to lapse at the election. So here we have the 2016 election. This bill, which has, is before the parliament, is allowed by this government, this Liberal and National Government, to lapse at the election. In the 45th Parliament, Labor supported the legislation in principle, but successfully amended it in 2017 with support from the Greens, Senator Lambie. Uh, and uh, we have here that uh, One Nation senators did not vote on that amendment. The bill was also amended uh, by then Senator Lionhelm. What happened to that bill? What happened to that bill in the 45th Parliament? the bill was allowed to lapse by the Morrison government at the 2019 election. So here we have a government that all of a sudden disco discovers an urgency about the transport security bill that had a similar bill in the 44th parliament, they allowed it to lapse, had a similar bill in the 45th parliament, they allowed it to lapse. I'm not going to stand here and be lectured by a liberal national government that's, that for some six years now has had half-hearted attempts to get a transport security bill up in the parliament and keeps letting it lapse, that does not even have the courage to put it forward for a vote. Now, this current bill, introduced to the 46th parliament, is largely similar to other bills. There are some changes that have been uh, highlighted in Senate inquiries. More than three years had passed since the legislation was last reviewed by a Senate committee, which is why it was referred to a Senate inquiry again. In that inquiry, there were a number of issues ventilated, raised, about the fact that the bill didn't even have a definition 
of serious crime, even though the bill was called the Serious Crime Amendment, that the bill did absolutely nothing to address the gaping hole that sits in this legislation around foreign crew on flag of convenience vessels. And that gaping hole has not been pointed out by the Labor Party. It hasn't been pointed out by the unions. It has been pointed out by the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, the national security agencies upon which this parliament should be taking its advice. As this bill went through the House of Representatives earlier this year, it was the government that moved another amendment to the bill. It was the government that added something onto the bill. And since what they added on was an entirely new process to do with criminal intelligence assessments, that was supported, an inquiry was supported by this Senate to look at that very issue. Let me be clear. We didn't relish the idea of having to go off to another inquiry. It was the mismanagement of the Liberal and National Government with their own legislation, the fact that they introduced legislation that wasn't finished into the House of Representatives and the Senate after the Senate inquiry, and then they go and amend it. Then they go and move an amendment to their own legislation. And this Senate, with the support of the crossbench, agreed to another inquiry into that. If the government had had their act together and put the legislation fully formed before the parliament, we might have had a more efficient process. If the government had had their act together and actually put the legislation as amended by this Senate in the last parliament, if they'd put that legislation to a vote, if they'd accepted the amendments, we would have had this regime in place. It is entirely within the discretion of the Liberal national government, the Morrison government, that set the agenda in the parliament to determine whether bills come forward for a vote. They let it lapse in, for in the 44th parliament, they let it lapse in the 45th parliament, and then they completely mismanaged the process in this parliament. I mean, I'm tempted to say it's like a clown car of ministers over there running around trying to work out what to do with their own legislation. Now, while all this mismanagement is happening, while all this mismanagement is happening, we have the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, last week in a clumsy misfire trying to say that Labor is responsible for you know, holding up the national security legislation. It was a clumsy and stupid statement by the Prime Minister. He cited three bills. He cited the Identify and Disrupt bill. That is currently with the PJCIS, a Liberal-dominated committee. He cited the International Production Orders Bill. That was the subject of a bipartisan, unanimous report by the PJCIS recommending the bill be passed, subject to legislative and non-legislative changes, and the government haven't even responded to that report yet. The Prime Minister doesn't even know what his own members are doing on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. He seems ignorant of the fact that the PJCIS had a unanimous recommendation supporting the passage of the bill. So let's not be lectured by the Prime Minister on who is doing what in relation to national security when he seems completely unaware of what is happening with various pieces of national security legislation. And if he had been truthful with the Australian people, he would have acknowledged that it was his government that let the transport security bill lapse at the 2019 election. It was his government that mismanaged this legislation through the parliament. It was his government that brought forward an additional amendment requiring the Senate to have to look at a new process through an inquiry. So let's not be lectured that this government, by this government, that somehow the uh, scrutiny, the appropriate scrutiny that opposition and crossbench are so apply, so applying to this bill is somehow holding it up. It is entirely the Liberal National Government, the Morrison Government, that is holding up this legislation. And if they had just fixed 
the foreign crew issue that the Department of Immigration and Border Protection has flagged as a gaping hole in this legislation, in the regime at our ports and airports, this bill would have already been passed. So let's take no lectures from Mr. Morrison on national security legislation. He doesn't know what he is talking about. Now, I also want to point out that the government which sets the agenda in the Senate found time this year to prioritize super yacht legislation. Great that the Senate has dealt with super yachts. We have not yet dealt with national security clearances at our ports and our airports. They set the agenda, they allocate the time, they make those decisions. Why have they prioritized super yacht legislation over the fundamental need to have security clearance regimes in place, appropriate security clearance regimes in place at our ports and airports? So, yesterday, the Minister, Michaelia Cash, made statements that foreign crew are constantly supervised. They must be always supervised at maritime ports when they are in a secure area. My question to the minister in the chair, can she confirm that foreign crew do not require additional security checks because they will always be under con constant supervision while they are in a maritime port? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> D Deputy President. I can confirm that anyone seeking to have unescorted uh, access to secure areas of both our airports and our seaports must have an ASIC or an MSIC card, regardless of their nationality. And again, as per yesterday, Senator Keneally is uh, deliberately seeking to muddy the waters. There is no gov Australian government requirement for all Australian seafarers to hold an MSIC. Senator Keneally. I never said there was. Did I ever say there was a requirement for every Australian port worker to hold an M6? Of course not. The minister coming late to this, and I will forgive her for that misstatement because she is now late. She is new to this uh, debate. She was not in the chair yesterday. I'd like to flag for the minister that the Panama flagged glorious plumeria carrying wood chips arrived at Car Carayo Key in Geelong on Friday. Now, yesterday, Senator Seselja confirmed that the Geelong port is a secure zone, and all people in the zone are required to have an MSIC or be escorted by an MSIC officer. That is the advice we received from Senator Seselja yesterday. If the government needs to correct that advice, I'd be happy to hear it. The glorious plumeria was docked about 500 metres from the port's main security station. Approximately at 2 a.m. on Sunday, 13 June, two sailors, who have only been described in media reports as Asian, reportedly creep at pace down a gangway and a set of stairs before disappearing into the night. This is Sunday, 13 June, like a few days ago. Not last year, not 2016, a couple of days ago. After that, it's speculated these two sailors jumped onto the beach and escaped along the foreshore or scaled a standard barbed wire fence to make their getaway. At the time, the Australian Border Force did not alert the local community. I understand the Australian Border Force took 19 hours to respond to questions from the Geelong advertiser, but refused to answer these questions. I'm advised the ABF only responded with, quote, the ABF is aware two foreign nationals who absconded from a commercial vessel that arrived in North Geelong Port on Friday, the 11th of June, 2021. The ABF is working closely with state and federal authorities. And the ABF has not provided any updates via Twitter or on its media release. This goes to the very point that the opposition and crossbench have been arguing that the checks and the security arrangements when it comes to foreign crew at our maritime ports are not sufficient. 
Yesterday, Minister Cash and Minister Seselja both repeatedly claimed that foreign crew did not require additional security checks because they would always be under constant supervision while in port. Mar Senator Cash said, maritime crew visa holders who do not hold an MSIC are required to be escorted and monitored by an MSIC holder at all times while in a restricted zone of a seaport. Senator Seselja said an MCV check uh, is tailored to a temporary visa for entering Australia. The ASIC MSIC checks are for more detailed assessments of people with an ongoing need for unsupervised access to the security areas of Australia's ports and airports. But yet here we have, just a few days ago, two foreign crew absconding, and it seems the ABF don't know where they are, what's happening, how did it happen? So my first question, to the minister, who are the men that the Australian Border Force are now searching for? Minister. Uh, thank you. In relation to the question of those, uh, the crew desertions, I'll make two points. Uh, and I will come to the identity because I do have some further information for, for the chamber on that. Mm -hmm. But I would again. Uh, council Labor against conflating, deliberately conflating two very separate issues. You've got the maritime crew visa, visas, of which uh, the two crew members mentioned were holders of vi those visas, which I understand have now been cancelled. And again, you are conflating it with the requirement for an MSIC. Uh, as Senator Zizel just said yesterday, uh, as I understand it, part of the port of Geelong is a secured area, but part of it is not. But regardless, any foreign crew need to have a visa. And Senator Keneally, through you, uh, Deputy President, you can keep you know, filibustering by being completely insulting to, to the minister, to the prime minister and many others, but it does not change the fact that you have had five years to consider this legislation and endless filibustering uh, does not make our ports any safer. Now, in relation to the detail of the incident that you raised uh, of the glorious uh, Pula Marina, the two crew that deserted over the weekend are Vietnamese nationals. Uh, and at approximately 10 uh, o'clock yesterday, ABF Vicpol and DHHS were notified that these two uh, members uh, were unaccounted for during their morning crew muster. Uh, ABF officers boarded the vessel to conduct uh, the master's questionnaire and relevant ship search at approximately midday, just after midday. Uh, and ABF officers uh, cancelled or ceased the uh, crew members' visas. Uh, the master advised the ABF that the crew were in possession of their passports, which they had obtained from the master's cabin where the passports had been secured. And the master advised that one of the missing crew uh, cleans the master's cabin daily and noted that that was likely how he had obtained uh, the two passports. Now, investigations remain ongoing. And uh, Senator Keneally, uh, your concern at the time it took the ABF to get back to the Geelong advertiser is noticed. But I would also note that their primary responsibility is to do exactly what they did yesterday, is to work with Vic Pohl and other relevant authorities to investigate this. And again, it, it is a valiant effort uh, you are putting up to, to filibuster on this and to conflate these two issues, but they are two separate issues. Senator Keneally. Thank you. Uh, here we have it again, the government trying to say that somehow they're not responsible for the fact this bill in various forms. Five years, exactly, Minister. And with the Minister, I'll take that interjection from the Minister. I'll take it. I will take that interjection from the Minister. She seems not to have listened to the fact that it was her government that allowed this bill to lapse at the 2016 election, didn't bring it forward for a vote. Minister, how can Labor be holding something up your government doesn't bring forward for a vote? Secondly, your government let it vote. Your government let it lapse at the 2019 election. The Morrison government let this bill lapse at the 2019 election after Labor had already voted for it. It was amended, and in a fit of petulance and stubbornness, the Morrison government didn't accept the amendments. They didn't even deal with them. They just let the bill lapse. Let's understand this, Minister. This bill would be law today if your government had not let it lapse at two elections. So don't talk about filibustering. Your government did not even prioritize this legislation. You put time in for the super yacht legislation, but you didn't put time in for this one. So here we have, here we have a minister 
and her constant little interjections over there, who doesn't seem to understand the basic facts. Yeah, this bill's been hanging around for five years because they let it hang around for five years. They haven't done the work. They mismanaged it. They amended their own bill halfway through the parliamentary debate. Don't sit here and lecture the opposition and the crossbench for applying appropriate scrutiny. I think it is reasonable to have more than one hour debate on a Nash piece of national security legislation, especially when we have a circumstance that makes the very point that the opposition and crossbench have been raising. And that is the regime that exists around maritime crew visas is not sufficient. These aren't my words, Minister. These are the words of the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. 2017 made clear the regulatory regime and the practices around foreign crew allow for the importation of drugs, weapons, and other illegal activities. And this bill doesn't do anything about solving that. It doesn't. In fact, what have we seen? Your government, your border protection, in the last few days has seen foreign crew abscond from a ship in an Australian port. If you think I'm not going to raise that, you've got to be kidding. This is the fundamental part of the bill. Now, the minister just provided some additional information about these two uh, crew members on the Golden Plumeria. She said in her answer, and I thank her for her information, it's a pity it couldn't have been provided to the Geelong Advertiser, who I'm sure are watching this debate and may well be able to make use of that information since they didn't get it through their inquiries. Because, you know, the local community in Geelong are interested in this. Australians are interested in this. How is it the case that our borders are so porous that two crew members can just wander off a ship? Now, the minister said, in her answer there, that somehow these two crew members got hold of their passports while one of them was cleaning the master's cabin, I believe was the information you provided. It's my understanding that these passports are meant to be held in a safe on board a ship. Is the minister saying that the passports were not being held as they should have been on the vessel? Minister. Uh, that is, uh, I have no more information to provide than that that I've already given you, uh, given this chamber, uh, and any further details will, of course, be subject of the AFP and the Victoria Police inquiry. Now, can I just also address uh, what Senator Keneally has also alleged, saying that this legislation does nothing to fix the serious problems that we have uh, at our ports, and that is simply and utterly not true. Uh, and instead of calling for endless reviews, which Labor does all the time. Uh, can I just confirm that we know that there are over 200 individuals with links to serious and organised crime holding ASICs and also MSICs, and I believe up to 70 per cent of those actually hold uh, the MSIC cards. These individuals can currently access secure and sensitive areas of airports and seaports without supervision. We also know that serious and organised criminals use our airport and seaports as transit points to import weapons, illicit drugs and other harmful goods into Australia. Trafficking of these illegal goods puts Australian security and prosperity and the welfare of our communities at great risk. Now, this bill, unlike what Senator Keneally has just said, will establish a regulatory framework that ensures that people convicted of serious offences or with known links to serious and organised crime groups will be ineligible to hold an ASIC or an MSIC card. These amendments will also provide ACIC with the ability to conduct criminal intelligence assessments for use in background checks on both cards. This is important. It is clearly needed. And this government is keen to get this through as soon as possible. And no more stalling, no more delay tactics from those opposite. This bill must be passed. Senator Keneally. Thank you. Labor thinks this is a good bill. It just thinks it should be strengthened. We just think it should be strengthened. And there's no review being called for here. The only review that got called for by this Senate was because your government did, through you, Chair, because the, the Morrison government didn't present their legislation fully formed to the parliament. They amended it after they introduced it. It is laughable 
that the government sits here and insists that somehow this is some kind of model legislative process they've gone through and the rest of us are just standing in the way. What we are trying to do here is deal with what you put forward, which was a half-formed piece of legislation. You amended it halfway through the legislative process. We've held an additional inquiry, supported by the crossbench in the Senate. We think this bill should be strengthened. We're not calling for an additional review. The point of the amendment we are debating right now, for those who are watching this debate at home, is to actually facilitate the implementation of the ASIC card as soon as possible and to invite the government to fix what the Department of Immigration and Border Protection in 2017 said was a hole in our maritime port security when it came to foreign crew. Again, I'm not making this claim. Senator Sheldon isn't making it. Senator Rice isn't making it. Senator Hansen isn't making it. The Department of Immigration and Border Protection is making it. We take that seriously. Whether they take that seriously is up to them, and we'll see when we vote on this amendment where they come down. What I would like to ask the minister to these two people who have on Sunday, these two foreign crew on Sunday, walked off a ship in a secure port there in Geelong. Is there any information she can provide the parliament as to whether or not these men pose a risk to the community? if they pose a COVID risk to the community, and if it is known why the men left the ship. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, as I've said, I can't confirm any more than I currently have, but I'm absolutely confident that between the Victorian Police and the ABF, uh, they will be conducting all necessary inquiries into that matter. And again, that matter, while important, and it's important for ABF and law enforcement to deal with, again, is detracting, uh, not very effectively, I would argue, from Labor's calls to split the aviation and maritime sections of the bill. Can I just remind all in this chamber that serious crime is a major threat to the Australian way of life and it causes enormous human suffering. Now, in relation to your call to split the aviation and maritime sections of this bill, of the 227 ASIC and MSIC cardholders, 73 per cent are in the maritime sector, and by Labor seeking to split the bill, the vast majority of cardholders uh, the ACIC has serious concerns over, that is those with a uh, history of serious and organised uh, crime, will continue to have unsupervised access of maritime secure areas. And that should be of great concern to all Australians that it is the Labor Party who are seeking to have them exempted by uh, the application of their amendments. And I think that is absolutely outrageous. Kilograms, kilograms of illicit goods enter Australia through airports, but tonnes enter through containers uh, through our seaports. We have to close off all entry points to trusted insiders and uh, serious criminals, not just those in the aviation sector. Otherwise, organised criminals will continue to exploit Australia's ports, and there will be only one party to blame for that, and that is the Labor Party that is seeking to split this bill and water down the impact of this legislation. And Senator Keneally, if you really support this legislation, through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, Labor will stop filibustering, you will stop playing games with this bill and you will pass the bill so that we can get on and actually make our airports and our seaports more secure. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, that's amusing, isn't it? We've just been told that we're closing down off entry points. It is simply not true. And I appreciate the fact that the minister has not been informed yesterday or the day before of the answers that were given uh, yesterday morning and yesterday afternoon about the answers that were given regarding the subject. Because they, you aren't closing off all the entry points. In actual fact, Senator Still just said an MCV, a maritime crew visa, check is tailored to a temporary visa for entering Australia. The ASIC MSIC checks are more detailed assessments of people with ongoing need for unsupervised access to secure areas of Australian ports and airports. What they've quite clearly said, and then Senator Cash says, maritime crew visa holders 
who do not hold an MSIC are required to be escorted and monitored by an MSIC holder at all times whilst in a restricted zone of a seaport. Of course, what happened at Geelong? Two people come, go, leave Geelong, two foreign crew who have not been MSIC checked, have not had the more rigorous check, have now absconded into the Australian community. And what was the response from the government and the ABF? Days before they start responding to the Geelong um, advertiser, days before they start making public announcements about what's been happening with those two individuals, and days before they've turned around and given any sort of indication of who these people are. Now, what's particularly worrying about this is the politicising by this government of the ABF. You would have thought when two people are found to have absconded from a ship that you would notify the public, ask for public involvement. But they didn't do that because they wanted to hush it up. National security is not an issue when they want to hush something up. Quite clearly, what this government is doing is turning around and making sure that there is still access to our ports by foreign crews that are carrying out criminal activity, gun running and the sorts of things that put our country in jeopardy. Now, thankfully, at this point, those two people haven't been identified and what their motivation is. But what does demonst is demonstrated by here, they could have been terrorists. They could be somebody who's turned around and importing uh, drugs. They could be gun running. But what do we do? We don't notify the public. These are the people at the forefront of national security. We don't notify the public that this is a national, a national um, breach of our borders. They hush it up because of politics not because they have national security in their interest, because they wanted to make sure they weren't held to account for the failing in the system that we've been highlighting in this last 24 hours. These maritime crew um, visas are critical to be upgraded and reviewed in light of the fact of not only what's happened at Geelong, but as we discussed yesterday, Rio Tinto has eight ships, had eight ships last year off Queensland. Four were Australian vessels with Australian crew, MSIC passes, the high background checks. And then when we look at the four, with the flag, four others were flag of convenience vessels with foreign crew. Low security checks. If you want to make our borders secure, then you make them secure by making sure the standards apply to foreign crews as well. That will protect this community. That will protect all Australians. Now, quite clearly, that we've seen in the case of you know, back to back to Geelong, is that what we've seen is the border force uh, was refusing to give details of the two Asian sailors still at large after they abandoned the ship on Geelong, keeping the community on edge over whether the duo uh, the duo was dangerous or could be carrying COVID-19. That's from a report just this morning from Geelong Advertiser. So, here's here's the advertiser. A major communication network, a major way of actually making sure that we can announce to the public, to the local community in Geelong, keep an eye out. This is important. This is critical. And of course, what's happened is the government keeps trying to hush it up without detail, without making people in Geelong aware for many, many, many hours, and of course, still no detail. But don't worry, we heard this today because, you know. You don't have to actually escort somebody if you're on a maritime crew visa, a foreign crew member, because you are supervised by somebody on an MSIC card. Well, I understand, and certainly from the, the, one of the comments that has been passed in the Geelong Advertiser, I take this as being uh, accurate, that they understood that the security footage showed the pair creep at pace down a gangway and set off stairs before disappearing into the night. Where was the surveillance? It wasn't there. And the thing that's particularly disturbing about this is that we've had evidence after evidence after evidence over the last five years of concerns about security breaches on our ports by these foreign crews. And of course, the government doesn't act. And why didn't they act? Because they say that is too complicated. 
It actually involves too much resources. So here is a government having the hide to say they're protecting our borders. They don't notify the local community for many, many, many hours, still haven't given details after days of these people absconded. Here's this government that's turned around and said that it's too expensive to turn around and make sure our borders are secure. Well, quite clearly, when we're talking about gun running, potential terrorist activity and drug running, is it too expensive? To hear them say to turn around and actually not have a system in place that this, the amendment does propose to make sure there's a system in place by the government properly considered to make sure our ports are protected, that we have security at our ports. Now, of course, you know, they've you know, made quotes in the last number of days that you know, it's this conspiracy and that conspiracy about why we want changes. We want changes because they're self-evident. We want changes because it secures our borders. It secures Geelong. It secures our community. And as I raised yesterday, we have ammonia nitrate, large amounts of ammonia nitrate being moved around on coastal shipping by foreign crews, none of them security checked. Ammonia nitrate, about a third of what was actually, um, unfortunately, an incident in Beirut, about a third of that tonnage is, um, caused that devastation and that terrible loss of life. It's horrific. But in the hands of a terrorist is extremely horrific in any country, and particularly this country, if that was to occur. But don't worry, we haven't done security checks on them. Now, what we do is we, do a, we get a 24 or 48 hour notice that somehow these people are being given low level security check. Well, you know, as we saw in Geelong, how that low level security check actually works. It doesn't work. We saw in Geelong about how supervising and oversighting people that don't have ASICs, uh, M6, how it doesn't work. We've seen another instance where our borders have been put at risk by this government's lack of action. And they're hiding behind politics by cheap political point scoring rather than turning around and making a decision to turn around and make our borders secure and, have, and support the very sensible amendment that's been put up by Labor. Because we will secure our borders. We will protect our borders and we'll protect them from seafarers that are foreign seafarers, not only Australian seafarers, if there's a concern. And quite clearly, the government has failed to act in an appropriate way to turn around and make sure these borders were, are protected. You know, we've seen, as we say, that um, with the Rio Tinto example, we've seen, of course, with the examples with the RAD inquiry, where by questions on notice, uh, number three to the RAD inquiry, Home Affairs also admitted that foreign crew are not subjected to routine, as we've seen, bag checks or inspections for drugs or weapons of other contraband. There's no metal detectors to detect other weapons being imported into the country. No checks by drug detector dogs. And these are the people protecting our border. Well, what they should be, rather than talking about uh, uh, ways and means of turning around and pretending they're securing our borders, they should be. What I'd like to ask the, the minister is that uh, is the government intention uh, to, to review the uh, uh, maritime crew visa? I noted yesterday that they said that they have not done a review of the maritime crew visa whilst doing an assessment of what should happen at our ports and security and leaving the bulk of people left behind. Time fired. Minister. Minister. Uh, thank you. Look, as I've uh, noted several times now, there's only one gaping hole uh, in this chamber, and that is Labor's lack of support for this critically important bill. And all of the filibustering, and uh, both senators in here this morning continue their heroic effort to filibuster on this bill and also to try and water it down by splitting the bill. But in relation to some of your, uh, your comments and for your assertion, Senator Sheldon, I think it is highly insulting and, in fact, demeaning 
to be so rude about the ABF staff and criticise their professionalism. They do an extraordinary job for our nation. And in relation to some of your assertions, uh, ABF officers do conduct regular visits of any vessel of interest. Uh, they do conduct regular wharf patrols and provide high visibility presence. They maintain a periodical uh, or permanent ABF marked vehicle presence at the gangway. And they also seek continuous CCT monitoring by the National Monitoring Centre of Vessel Gangways. So for all of your assertions about their competence, they do do a magnificent job on behalf of our nation and they do take security of ports uh, seriously. Again, there is only one, one side of politics that is seeking to delay or to uh, have this bill not pass the Senate, and that is Labor. And as I've said, uh, of 227 ASIC and MSIC cardholders of concern to the ACIC, 73 per cent are in the maritime sector. And this is exactly the reason we want this bill passed, so that we can implement these measures, so that law enforcement can make sure that people like that no longer have access to secure areas of the ports. And as Labor keeps conflating, let me be very clear. We are talking about these cards and in the secure areas of our ports, uh, not the more general access that we're talking about through the MCVs. Senator Keneally. Thank you. Uh, the Minister now has made several statements about uh, the ACIC assessments in maritime ports. The very amendment that we are dealing with, uh, which is my amendment on sheet 1117, actually only deals with Schedule 1. So if the amendment were accepted, it doesn't deal with Schedule 2, which means that the criminal intelligence matters that you point out can go ahead at maritime ports. Unfortunately, I don't think the minister has properly read the amendment. Um, and I think that demonstrates, yet again, the lack of attention to detail the government has come to when it comes to this legislation. They let the bill lapse in 2016. They let the bill lapse in 2019. They brought it to the parliament here in this parliament, in this term of parliament, the 46th parliament, and then they amended their own legislation halfway through, causing everyone, the, the Senate, including the crossbench, to vote for an additional inquiry. They don't seem to understand that what Labor is seeking to do here is take what we see as a good bill and make it better. That's what this is about, strengthening strengthening the security clearances at our borders. We say their bill has good intention. We supported it in the 45th Parliament. We supported it in the 45th Parliament. It's not our fault in the 45th Parliament that the Morrison government let the bill lapse. They control the agenda. They determine what legislation goes forward. They let it lapse. They write the bills. In the 46th Parliament, this Parliament, they wrote a bill that was half finished. They amended it part way through. And the amendment that I am moving would allow the entire regime to be implemented immediately for aviation. It only affects Schedule 1, not Schedule 2. So the concerns the minister raises around criminal intelligence assessment can be dealt with for maritime workers as well. What we are seeking to do is to get the government to acknowledge what the Department of Immigration and Border Protection has already said. And the minister wasn't here yesterday, so let me uh, make it clear for her what the Department of Immigration and Border Protection told the standing, Senate Standing References Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs in 2017. And I note the minister, no minister, has wanted to touch this advice in this debate with a barge pole. They seem to want to ignore the fact that a national security agency, one that is concerned with border security, has given clear evidence to this chamber that there is a hole in our border security. The minister says, that somehow the hole exists with the opposition and crossbends asking legitimate questions. Let me read to the minister what the Department of Immigration and Border Protection said 
to this chamber in 2017. There are features of flag of convenience registration, regulation, and practice that organized crime syndicates or terrorists may seek to exploit. Reduced transparency or secrecy surrounding complex financial ownership arrangements are factors that can make flag of convenience vessel ships more attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organized crime or terrorist groups. This means flag of convenience vessels may be used in a range of illegal activities, including illegal exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity in protected areas, people smuggling, and facilitating prohibited imports or exports. That is the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. My question to the minister is this, and two ministers yesterday ducked this. Does the government accept this advice of the Department of Immigration and Border Protection? And can the government point to any steps they have taken since 2017 to improve the security arrangements around flag of convenience vessels and foreign crew? Minister. Thank you. Acting Deputy President. It is imperative that this government put measures in place to prevent serious and organised crime for the safety and security of all Australians. This bill was developed in response to a number of independent reviews that recognised the critical vulnerability created by serious and organised criminals exploiting the ASIC and the MSIP schemes for criminal purposes. The government does acknowledge that flags of convenient ships can also pose a risk to the maritime environment that can be exploited by these very same organised crime groups. The government regularly reviews the aviation and maritime environments to address all vulnerabilities and to strengthen aviation and maritime security. Uh, in relation to Senator Keneally's uh, comments uh, about the government, can I just point out some of the facts about Senator Keneally's amendments uh, and, watering, and her attempt on behalf of Labor to water down this bill very significantly? Senator Keneally's amendment links the commencement of this bill to her own private member's bill, the Migration Amendment uh, Bill 2020, which proposes amendments to the Maritime Crew Visa. The new MCV bill provides that the Transport Security Amendment uh, Bill would only commence on the passage of her own bill. The vast majority of MCV holders do not require unescorted access to maritime security zones. Again, I remind those opposite that these are two different issues that you are valiantly trying to conflate. And requiring visa holders to comply with elements of the MSIP scheme could pose a significant financial burden on the administration of the MCV scheme for absolutely no discernible benefit. It would cause a completely unacceptable level of uncertainty and further delay for industry and uh, the government to link both the MCV and the MSIC as well as the commitments of the bills. This is just another delaying tactic by those opposite. And I would just say, please just pass the bill, stop filibustering, stop playing games so we can get on and deal with the ASIC and the MSIC cards and get serious and organised criminals out of our secure areas in our ports, airports and seaports. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. Well, look, I just want to go to a couple of things that the Minister has just stated um, in the series of questions um, that uh, has been answered, including just those ones there. See, they don't want maritime crew visas to be the same level as Australian crew visa checks. They have said clearly, as I've already stated, Senator Zelja and Senator Cash from yesterday, that both of them recognise the fact that the MCV is a dud scheme. It's a scheme that does not give the same virility that we require for ASICs and MSICs and specifically on our ports. And one of the reasons why they, as they keep pressing, and the minister keeps pressing now, is because we, don't, we have surveillance. People don't turn around and you know, walk onto a wharf because they have 
criminal activity in mind, they go and get an MSIC or an ASIC. Now, quite clearly, when we're dealing with security on our ports, we have to look at the serious nature of those people that are on the ships. It is a serious issue. And I'll remind the minister that on March the 12th, 2021, a very exceptionally good work done by, as I recognised again yesterday, by the Australian Federal Police, by um, the ABF and by New South Wales Crime Command, where they intercepted 200 kilos of cocaine. And how did they intercept it? Well, they intercepted it in a number of ways. Because what they became clear and that is that those drugs were being dropped off the back of the ship. That's what the report says. That on the back of the ship to a, to a sister ship, to a daughter ship, is the language they used, that that vehicle, that, um, that boat uh, then brought in the drugs because crew members gave the drugs, handed them over, were part of the deal, were part of the arrangement, were part of the people that would not, do not have requirements to have appropriate and proper security checks that could be done and has the capacity to be done if the government was to pass the amendment. This is about actually making sure that our ports are secure, that there are proper assessments, not an assessment, but proper assessments, ones that actually make sure that our borders are appropriately and properly protected. You know, we've seen that there are a series of questions that were raised by in the, in the case of the Border Force. Um, and, I, and I take the minister on face value. I, I think I've got a lot of time for Border Force. But I've got to say this where the minister's either one or two things has happened in Geelong. Either Border Force has been failing on the job, or did the government interfere about the notification regarding this incident in this, on the, this particular port? Because they still have not turned around and answered a series of important questions raised by their community, a series of critical issues that raise the things that need to be known in the Geelong community to make a difference. It's incredibly important that people in Geelong have confidence that we have a proper system, as it is in the rest of Australia, that we have a system that actually can make sure that when it's dropped off the back of a ship, that those crew members have been checked and we've got a chance to turn around and find out the potential culprits before any culprits are involved. It's important that we turn around and have those unescorted crew members from foreign crews properly checked. I mean, it, it, is, a, it is a bit of a no-brainer. If you're a criminal, you don't get an ASIC or an MSIC. You don't apply for one. They're saying, let's leave it to the criminals to decide whether they should have a higher degree of security check. Can you believe it? We can ask the criminals whether they want to have a higher security check. Guess what the answer will be? No. It's obvious. It's what happens. It's practical. I don't even have to watch crime shows to know that. It's just common sense. The government has to turn around and have a proper approach and a proper understanding on how they're dealing with these issues. They need to make sure that whether it be Rio Tinto last year off the coast of, of uh, Queensland, that where four ships turn around and have MSIC uh, security checks, because Australian crewed ships, including the companies they work for, they're very mindful of the necessity for crew members and the capacity for crew members to move around unescorted areas. They're very mindful also that this gives a higher scrutiny of the people that are on their ships. But what do we do when it comes to foreign ships? We say, we don't care, rip it and burn. Oh, no, sorry, we don't quite say that. We say, oh, if you're a criminal, you can apply for one to be higher security checked. It is ludicrous. Now, we have quite clearly the situation in, in our ports now where we have you know, from answers from questions yesterday where you know, dozens of people can be not security checked MC up to the standard that's required, they can be on an MCV, they can be moving on and off our ports. But don't worry, as the minister said in one of the answers to the questions earlier from Senator Keneally, that not only do we close off all entry points, it uh, didn't happen in Geelong, uh, doesn't happen actually off the coast of Queensland last year either, it didn't happen in Port Botany, 
We haven't closed off all the points. In actual fact, you've got a ripping it hole in the security of our country by the fact that you're not turning around and taking an appropriate stance on what is a very practical and sensible proposition from Labor. And why aren't they doing it? Either they're covering up for cocaine dealers. Well, I don't think that's correct. They're either doing it because they care about terrorists coming into the country. Well, I hope that's not correct. They're doing it because they want gun runners to be able to come in, in the country and run guns. Well, I hope that's not correct. But I'll tell you what, as a consequence of what you're doing, it is correct. You've left our borders open. You've left the opportunities for turning around and these criminal gangs to operate in an appropriate fashion. And case after case after case proves the weaknesses within the border security arrangements that you have. And the intention of this amendment is to make sure that those weaknesses are, are, are dealt with. And I want to ask this question of the minister. Is the security arrangements adequate at Geelong Port when they say some days later to the advertiser, we, we saw it on security footage after the pair had crept at pace down a gangway and set off stair, set of stairs before disappearing into the night. Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. And, uh, Senator Sheldon, I understand that you have asked several questions in relation to this matter that have been responded to uh, by Minister Reynolds. Uh, I will reiterate, as previous ministers have said, because obviously now we're in the filibuster to end all filibusters on what is an incredibly important bill, that I understand uh, your caucus has actually agreed should pass this place, and we'll wait and see uh, if that actually does occur. Um, but as previous ministers have responded to you in relation to questions that you have continually put this morning of this nature, the Australian Border Force are working with uh, the Victorian Police, otherwise known as VicPol. Uh, you are continuing to conflate the issues, and that, that's fine. You and I had this discussion yesterday in terms of the conflation of the issues. I understand you may have had a similar dis discussion with Senator Selger last night. Um, I was sitting outside for a short period of time. You had a similar discussion uh, with Minister Reynolds this morning, uh, as is your right to have the discussion. I can also advise, as Minister Reynolds has already advised uh, in relation to the questions that are being put, Australian Border Force officers conduct regular visits to any vessel of interest. Australian Border Force officers conduct regular wharf patrols and provide high visibility presence, maintaining a periodical or permanent Australian Border Force marked vehicle presence at the gangway. Uh, they seek continuous CCTV monitoring by the National Monitoring Centre of vessel gangways. If a crew member leaves a vessel in contravention of the restriction on board, uh, then local police authorities and or port security will be contacted to affect the irrelevant state government health response. Uh, after that, the only thing I can add is to reiterate what Minister Reynolds has said several times today. The Australian Border Force are working with the Victorian Police, otherwise known as VicPol. Senator Sean. Be brief. I just want to uh, then just turn the minister to answering the que this question, which I raised with her just then. There has been uh, questions raised about the security lapses over the last, and particularly in the last 24 hours, but also after the last five years in a series of inquiries. The particular lapse that I'm asking you about is the Geelong Port, and I'm asking specifically about Geelong Port. Is the security adequate at Geelong Port? Minister. I will repeat my answer for the benefit of Hansard. As previous ministers have stated and as Minister Reynolds uh, has into the, read into the Hansard record, uh, as I have already responded to you, Senator Sheldon, my answer does not change. I am advised as follows. The Australian Border Force are working with the Victorian Police. As I said, they are often referred to as VicPol. Um, in terms of the further information that I can provide to you, I can also advise as follows. The Australian Border Force officers conduct regular visits to any vessel of interest. Australia Border Force officers conduct regular wharf patrols and provide high visibility presence. Maintaining a periodical or permanent Australian Border Force marked vehicle presence at the gangway. They seek continuous CCTV monitoring by the National Monitoring Centre of vessel gangways. If a crew member leaves a vessel in contravention of the restriction on board, noting that they can leave the vessel to conduct essential tasks as long as they are wearing PPE, 
then local police authorities and or port security will be contacted to affect the relevant state government health response. Uh, but again, as I understand, Minister Reynolds has already advised on several occasions uh, in responding to your questions, uh, and I will again reiterate for the Hansard record, I am advised in response to your question that the Australian Border Force are working with the Victorian Police. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank uh, Minister Cash for uh, coming into the chamber and providing some uh, an advice. Uh, I think we are going to have to agree to disagree with the government. And I just want to say, for the record, uh, it still stands throughout this debate. It seems clear that the government has not taken on board the advice provided by the Department of Immigration and Border Protection to this Senate in 2017 that there are the foreign flagged, excuse, sorry, um, flag of convenience vessels and foreign crew pose uh, risks and there are uh, arrangements in terms of regulation and practice that make those vessels and those crew attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organized crime and terrorist groups. The government hasn't taken that advice and there's nothing in this legislation that addresses that risk. It's clear the government has no intention of putting anything in place, either in this legislation or anywhere else, in order to address that risk. The purpose of this amendment was to try and give the government an opportunity to address that risk. They already fixed up this legislation once when they introduced it into the parliament. They could amend it again. They could come up with their own scheme. They haven't done that. So the vote we are about to have on this amendment, let's be clear what it is. It is this Liberal National Government, Mr. Morrison's government, that is refusing to put in place any measures, either in uh, this bill or indeed where appropriate should lie, uh, in other legislation that deals with visas, to ensure that we are addressing the risk that was highlighted to this Senate by the Department of Immigration and Border Protection. We have had example after of example presented in this debate. Captain Salas, who the Department of Immigration and Border Protection, now the Australian Border Force, have had holdings about since 1994, who has been wanted by the New South Wales coroner since 2012 for questioning, who gave evidence on the record, and yet somehow was allowed to come back into Australia to the ports of Weipa and Gladstone in 2016 despite the fact he gave evidence about his illegal and illicit activities, despite the fact he was wanted by the coroner before he gave that evidence for some years, despite the fact the Department of Immigration had information about him, they said on evidence since 1994. We know, we know that the North Korean government were using flag of convenience vessels to smuggle weapons, including 30,000 rocket grenades, that was revealed in August 2017. We know the Tongan government was recently forced to shutter their own flag of convenience vessels because it was found that Al-Qaeda owned the vessels and were using the lax arrangements at ports, maritime ports, to transport weapons, ammunition, and crew to Europe. Now, Labor has sought a sensible solution here to amend Schedule 1 of this bill, to allow the entire regime to go ahead for, a for aviation uh, clear, uh, card holders, for the ASIC card holders, and to allow Schedule 2 to proceed for Marathon, to allow for the intelligence assessments to proceed, but simply to allow the government to have the ability to strengthen this bill, to deal with these very risks that have been highlighted now. So, when this vote occurs on this amendment, let's be clear what we're voting on. And for those who vote, opposite, who vote against the amendment, let's be clear what they're saying. They're disregarding the risks posed by flag of convenience vessels and foreign crew. Honourable Senators, I intend to put the question uh, in relation to the motion moved by Senator Keneally. Uh, on sheet 117 revised. 
I put the question that the amendment be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the noes have it. Division, re division required. Division is required. Ring the bell. Lock the doors. So the question is that um, amendment triple one seven as revised, moved by Senator Keneally, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes.
Order, there being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Which is what? Which is just wait till we get some order. I was just about to give you the call, <laughs> Senator Keneally. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move revi uh, revised amendments numbered one through eight on sheet 1022. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I, I move the revised amendments on sheet 1022. Um, and uh, let me uh, advise the chamber that uh, the, the reason for this amendment is, despite the fact that this bill has in its definition a, that it is about serious crime, it actually lacks a definition in the bill of what is serious crime. Uh, so here we have a bill about transport security that's supposed to deal with serious crime, and it's not clear what serious crime is under this legislation. And it's fair enough to raise this because there are 12 different definitions of serious crime in different Commonwealth Acts and regulations. So while we uh, accept that the government intends to propose a tiered scheme uh, for uh, this, um, uh, this uh, legislation, Labor's amendment proposes to um, seek that minor crimes are not included in the regulations by the government. We think a bill that purports to deal with serious crime should deal with serious crime. And therefore, uh, this amendment defines serious crime as a crime that is punishable by imprisonment for a maximum of at least three years. This is consistent with the definition of serious crime uh, in the Citizenship Cessation Bill currently before the Parliament. And Labor does believe, and we invite uh, members of this chamber to agree, that it's reasonable to include a definition in the legislation of serious crime. Uh, and uh, we. Note the government have not uh, provided a definition. We seek to insert one, and we look forward to support from the chamber for this amendment. Uh, Senator Brockman, you, your microphone's not on, so I'll give you the call. Thank you. Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, we have an indication from Senator Griff that he wished to vote uh, differently on different parts of these amendments. So if, for Senator Griff's sake, we could uh, vote separately on 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 8 as one block and then 3 and 7 as another block. He's seeking leave. I am seeking leave. Oh. I didn't think I had to, but Stan, you don't need leave, but leave appears to be granted. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Minister, do you wish to? Uh, a very brief response. In the interests of time, 
uh, because I understand we can start moving through the bill. And thank you very much, Senator Keneally. Uh, the government will not be supporting the amendments proposed in sheet 1022 uh, on the basis that they are unnecessary and would create loopholes in the ASIC and the NSIP scheme that criminal entities could seek to exploit. So before I put the question, as I understand, I put the, I put the question in relation to uh, subsections 1, 2, 4, 5, 6 and 8, and then I'll put a secondary question to 3 and 7. Yes. Are we all senators happy with that uh, progress? So I'll put the first question uh, that amendments 1, 2, 4, 5 in relation to subsections 1, subclause 1, 2, 4, 5, 6 and 8 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Uh, against no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. So the amendment is moved by Senator Keneally on sheet 1022 has been split into two. So we are voting first on, on putting the question on amendments uh, with um, sections 1, 2, 4, 5, 6 and 8. So the right shall move to the Yes, it shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the eyes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes. Order. There being 30 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now put um, sections 3 to 7 on sheet 1022, as moved by Senator Keneally. Uh, those in favour say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. One minute.
Lock the doors. So the question is that uh, items three to seven on sheet one zero two two revised as moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes. Order. There being 28 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Keneally. Uh, thank you. I advise the chamber that I had intended to move uh, 1097 and 1099, standing in my name, jointly for the efficiency of the chamber. But I am now advised that uh, Senator Griff seeks to vote differently on those two amendments. So I advise the chamber that that's where we are at. We will move them separately uh, in order to accommodate uh, Senator Griff. Uh, so I will move first 1097 for the clarity of the chamber. This is to institute a statutory independent review of the legislation within the first two years of its operation, followed by further independent reviews every five years. Uh, so the clarity of the chamber, that is what we are moving now. Thank you, Senator Keneally. So the question is that uh, amendment a one on sheet 1097 is moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? 
I believe the ayes have it. Senator Keneally. Thank you. I, I now and I thank uh, the chamber uh, for the support for that amendment. Uh, we now move one. Oh, sorry, I would like before I move it. I'd like to also notify the chamber. I do not intend to move opposition amendments on sheets 1067 and 1098. Uh, so I advise the chamber of that. And I now seek to move sheet 1099. Uh, this is an amendment uh, for the clarity of the chamber that seeks to uh, expand the uh, uh, IGIS's role, the independent um, inspector's role, to include oversight of the ACIC. This was recommended by the 2017 Intelligence Review, and despite claiming to accept that recommendation, it's taken the government over three years to finally introduce legislation to implement it. But they've continued to give the ACIC new functions and new powers. Given the nature of the ACIC's work and the potential impact it can have on fundamental rights and freedoms, uh, this amendment seeks to ensure the ACIC's intelligence-related work is subject to the same degree of rigorous oversight as other intelligence agencies. So the question is that um, Amendment 1 on sheet 1099 is moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I uh, believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that uh, number one on sheet 1099 is moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. In the negative, beg your pardon. The question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required? Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator Seaworth as teller for the noes.
order. There being 49 ayes and 10 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Transport Security Amendment Serious Crimes Bill of 2020 and agreed to it with an amendment. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law in relation to transport security and for related purposes. Gov a number two, online safety bill 2021 and the related bill. Resumption of second reading debate. I uh, will just call the speakers, but we'll allow senators who are not participating in this debate to leave the chamber. Senator Pratt, are you good to go? Pity President. I rise today to speak to the online safety bill and online safety transitional provisions and consequential amendments bill of 2021, which, as we know, seeks to create a new online safety framework for Australians, an updated regulatory framework that consolidates and builds on the existing legislative scheme in our nation for online safety. In the Labor Party, we have a strong track record of supporting online safety for Australians, and we support these bills. We support measures to consolidate, update and enhance online safety laws for Australians. For many years, Australians have been protected by laws to support online safety, and it is important these laws are kept up to date. The bill responds to the independent review of online safety laws conducted by Linnell Briggs, which reported to government in October of 2018. And so it's clear that Australia's online safety laws should be brought together in one modernised act and that industry and government should be less reactive, more responsive when it comes to online safety in our nation. So we support this principle of consolidating existing safety, online safety laws into this new framework. For example, in the bill, it retains and replicates provisions in the Enhancing Online Safety Act of 2015, which protects Australians from online harms, such as the non-consensual -consharing, sharing of intimate images, uh, a scheme that Labor is proud to have led calls for. It also reflects a modernised online content, content scheme to replace schemes in Schedule 5 and 7 of the Broadcasting Services Act of 1992 in order to address harmful online content such as uh, refused classification material and updates various elements, including setting new industry benchmarks. We support new elements of the bill, including the creation of a novel complaints-based removal notice scheme for cyber abuse perpetrated against an adult and the articulation of core set, uh, a core set of basic online safety expectations to improve and promote online safety for Australians. However, that said, we very much acknowledge that there are some significant concerns with the bill as drafted and we indeed share some of these concerns. There are concerns around the process uh, and the government's handling of the development of this bill. There was a long delay, years in fact, of releasing the exposure draft of legislation, only to be followed by the rushed introduction of this bill into the parliament, only eight business days after consultation on the exposure draft concluded. This has significantly undermined confidence uh, 
in relation to the consultation process. A number of stakeholders concerned that submissions had not been considered properly and are unsure as to the operation of these, this bill. There are also significant concerns to the substance of this legislation. This, these uh, issues have been well made by stakeholders, including concerns about consultation, transparency and review mechanism, mechanisms, among other things. We note there are some concerns with provisions in the bill which are in fact already the law of the land here in our nation. And it's disappointing that the government was unable to foster a clear shared understanding of the elements of this bill that consolidate existing long-standing law. We have uh, in Labor sought to have constructive good faith negotiations uh, in addressing concerns with this bill. We did not oppose these bills in the House on the basis that the government amendments uh, would be forthcoming. Since then, we've engaged with the government in a constructive good faith way in order to gain an understanding and address concerns with these bills. Overall, we report that this engagement with government has been productive. We have appreciated the attention of the minister and his staff, as well as officials of the department, as well as the commissioner and her staff, to Labor's concerns and suggestions. Some of the concerns have been addressed with proposed government amendments to the bill, as well as the supplementary EM. We welcome these amendments and understand a further addendum to the EM will be forthcoming, which we also welcome. In conjunction with government amendments, some of Labor's concerns have been addressed with clarification from the government as to the operation of the bill. This has been useful. Hopefully, it has served to clarify the government's understanding of the regime as well. However, some of our concerns have not been taken up and addressed by government, and we will be moving, therefore, in this place amendments to strengthen transparency, review oversight of the Commissioner, in administering the online safety framework. In the spirit of this bipartisanship in which online safety has historically been approached in this place, we encourage the government to support or at least not oppose these amendments. We acknowledge the various uh, bill scrutiny processes that have run and note the report of the Senate Scrutiny of Bills Committee as well as the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, both of which made constructive suggestions. We accept the need for the Commissioner to have flexibility administering the framework. In return, however, it's important that the government accept the commensurate need for greater transparency, oversight and review. There is an important balance to be found here between free speech and the protections against certain kinds of speech. And this can be complex. And we are concerned that this bill represents a significant increase in the eSafety Commissioner's discretion to remove material without commensurate checks and balances. The government is correct to expect digital platforms to offer more in terms of transparency, but indeed so must the government be prepared to provide transparency around decision-making, particularly on matters that engage with human rights in our country. So while supportive of a scheme for adult cyber abuse, Labor finds it curious that a government that has made repeated attempts to repeal Section 18C of the Racial Discriminate Discrimination Act on the grounds it unduly restricts free speech despite the availability of defences in 18D, is now seeking to pass a bill that empowers the eSafety Commissioner with discretion to determine matters of speech in relation to adult cyberbullying without greater checks or balances or operational clarity. Labor is concerned that the adult cyber abuse scheme could, in the wrong hands, be used to stifle legitimate debate and freedom of expression given the test for adult cyber abuse is material and that that is, is that it's menacing, harassing or offensive. And I draw attention now to Dr Anne Ali, the member for Cowan's remarks during the debate in the House. And she said, imagine a scenario where somebody is trolling with racist remarks 
and gets called out for it, gets called a racist, and the person, the troll, takes offence to that and reports it. And instead of the racist remarks being removed, the remarks that are calling out racism get removed instead. It is a very likely scenario that somebody who is trolling another individual with racist commentary and gets called out for that racist commentary can claim that they are being bullied and harassed and take action against the person who has called them out. Also consider uh, the case of John Barillaro, the New South Wales Deputy Premier, who is reported to have pursued YouTube comedian uh, Friendly Geordies with charges of stalking and intimidation. According to reports, detectives from New South Wales Police Fixated Persons Union, Unit, acting on a complaint from Barillaro, arrested uh, Christo Lenker at his family home in Dulwich Hill on June 4 and charged him with two offences. He was charged with two counts of stalking intimidating with an intent to cause fear of physical or mental harm. Now, here we see that given the provisions in the adult cyber abuse scheme go to related concepts of menace, harass or offend, it is simply not beyond the realm of contemplation to imagine a politician asserting that a journalist, a satirist or comedian might fall foul of these provisions in the adult cyber abuse scheme, even with clause 233 on the implied freedom of political communication. So we believe there can and must be greater transparency for review and oversight to ensure that this scheme is working to get the balance of human rights and freedom of expression right. We put these concerns to the government during the Senate inquiry, during the debate in the House as part of good faith negotiations, and we welcome government amendments that have been circulated which strengthen transparency and review with greater detail in annual reporting as well as an internal review process. But we believe these uh, need to go further, and that's why we are moving amendments, including for uh, an ACMA review. We'll move an amendment to provide a pathway for independent review by ACMA, where, with full discretion, uh, ACMA may review decisions of the commissioner and report to the minister with the report tabled in Parliament. The Commissioner is an officer of ACMA, and ACMA provides such a review pathway for decisions of the ABC and SBS, and that this would be an important oversight mechanism. Annual reporting will move an amendment to provide greater detail in the Commissioner's annual reporting to include information referrals, including to industry and end users, which account for much of the Commissioner's approach, as well as to include categories of harm dealt with in complaints, formal notices and informal referrals akin to the categories supplied by the Human Rights Commission in the reporting of complaints and investigations. An advisory committee will move amendments to formalise the advisory committee arrangements for the Commissioner. Uh, currently, the Commission has an advisory committee constituted on, on an informal basis uh, with representatives from academia, industry civil society. So, as with ACMA, we believe that these should be formal in law to provide multi-stakeholder engagement and oversight. We appreciate that the makeup of the current committee could be improved with expertise to inform matters that engage with human rights and freedom of expression, uh, such as the Human Rights Commission, ethnic and religious groups, disability groups, consumer groups, public interest media and communications law experts. We think there needs to be independent review uh, of the novel adult cyber abuse scheme in, its, in and after its first year of operation, with the whole bill subject to a review uh, in three years. Uh, and in the context of consultation, we also will seek to move amendments to formalise consultation requirements around restrict, restricted access systems under the online content scheme, as well as consumer representation in the development of industry codes and standards. This aligns with other provisions uh, of the bill. Private messaging. We are concerned about the regulation of private messaging services 
sorry, we note those concerns about private messaging services. We canvassed these concerns with government and interrogated the operation as well as the review process for industry around these provisions. We understand that the government will clarify the operation of this provision in an, in an addendum to the EM, and this is an important clarification. We note that the current law regulates private messaging services and that a significant proportion of cyberbullying occurs in these services. On balance, uh, the flexibility that platforms have in warning end users uh, or suspending accounts of end users who fail to accord with the platform's terms of use, um, uh, and given the clarification from government around the intended operation of this element, we're satisfied that there are appropriate checks and balances on this power. And I seek uh, later to go into these amendments in more detail during the committee stages. Um, in conclusion, I support, uh, we support steps to improve the online safety of Australians. And I'm going to jump to the moving of my second reading uh, notice. And to that end, I move the second reading amendment as circulated in my name. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, and that is that at the end of the motion we add the words that have been circulated. Have they been circulated? Yes, yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. The bills before us today establish a framework to regulate harmful, harmful online content in Australia. Uh, this is an extremely important issue that the Australian Greens acknowledge needs to be addressed. But it should be addressed carefully and in a considered fashion. And our submission is that the government is not addressing it in a careful enough way or in a considered enough fashion. Now, I want to be clear that the Australian Greens do support the establishment of a framework that provides for the quick takedown of inappropriate online content in Australia. And I also want to be clear that the Australian Greens condemn the online bullying and the online abuse of Australians, including obviously child abuse and including the non-consensual sharing of intimate images. These are important issues. It is necessary that we reform the law in these areas, but it is equally necessary that we get it right. So before I speak about the details of the bills themselves, I want to speak about the process the bills have gone through to get us here to where we are today. And unfortunately, I have to say that the government is ramming these bills through this parliament without adequate consideration and without adequate scrutiny. For example, the government flagged its intention to table the bills before consultation on the exposure draft had closed. The bills were then introduced into the House with just a few technical amendments to the exposure draft before the around 40, uh, sorry, 400 submissions to the exposure draft were made public. The bills were referred to the Environment and Communications Committee the next day to report just two short weeks later. Then the government sought to have the bills listed as non-contro so they could be quickly and quietly waived through the Senate. Then the government moved to exempt the bills from the usual requirements that regulate how quickly bills can be brought on for debate in the Senate. And as an example of the uh, indecent haste with which the government has operated, these bills were so rushed that the government is needing to use amendments to fix typos in the original bill. So these bills, which are intended to protect people from cyber bullies, from cyber abuse, from the non-consensual sharing of intimate images and from, and from violent and extremist materials, commendable objectives are being rushed through this place. We want the parliament to get these bills right, and we believe we represent in that 
case most Australians who want this parliament to get these bills right. Now, the Australian Greens do not support the bills in the current form that they are presented to the Senate in. We are, of course, aware of the amendments that have been circulated uh, by the government that, if passed, would address some of the concerns that the Greens have raised in regards to this legislation. We, we still have concerns about the huge regulatory and discretionary powers these bills confer on the eSafety Commissioner, a single person who is not elected by the Australian people to that position. And we are concerned about the lack, in, um, in some cases, of oversight uh, on the eSafety Commissioner. So these bills, I think everyone would agree, provide significant powers to the eSafety Commissioner, but as drafted, provide for limited appeals against decisions of the Commissioner. No internal review process uh, was established in the bill as it was originally drafted and presented. And the risk there, of course, was that people who were acting lawfully or businesses that were acting lawfully, who were adversely affected by decisions of the Commissioner, could have been left with no business or no income, while um, potentially costly appeals slowly work their way through the AAT and ultimately the court system. Now, again, we acknowledge the government has uh, cobbled together an amendment to provide for an internal review process, but we do note that this amendment does not actually create of itself an internal review process. What it does is require the Commissioner to create such a process. So, in a way, the parliament is being asked to sign a blank cheque in regards to the creation of that process because uh, we have no, um, uh, no possibility, as we stand here and debate this bill today, to know what kind of process the eSafety Commissioner will establish. Now, the problem for the government, of course, was that because of its self imposed deadlines and because of the fact that they were uh, so short, the government actually hasn't had the time to come up with such a review mechanism to include the provisions of that mechanism um, in this legislation, so it's effectively hand boarded off into the never-never. As well as lacking uh, a quick and practical review and appeal process with appropriate remedies, uh, the bills as tabled also lack robust transparency reporting. Again, the Greens acknowledge that this has been addressed by, uh, to some extent by the government's amendments. Um, as I said, um, uh, the use of amendments to, create, to uh, correct typos in the original legislation and for folks playing along at home, uh, the amendment that the government has tabled uh, changes cyber bullying B -U -L -L -I -N -G, to cyber bullying. Now, of course, that needs to be fixed up, but, but the fact that we needed an amendment to fix up a typo is symptomatic of um, the, uh, the rush to legislate in an extremely important but also extremely complex policy area. So these bills test the intention of a person posting online, online material, by inquiring whether an ordinary reasonable person would think it likely that the material was intended to cause harm. But this test considers no evidence other than the material itself. Now this is potentially problematic because the context around violent imagery and content is crucial to understanding the purpose of disseminating that content and the level of any harm caused. The Australian Greens also have significant concerns about the bill's powers being used, despite some limited protections, to block and take down public interest news or campaigns that involve violent imagery, for example, campaigns against police brutality. Now, the eSafety Commissioner has made a um, public comment in regards to some of these issues, and we acknowledge uh, and thank her for, um, for those comments. But um, the person who is currently the eSafety Commissioner will not be the eSafety Commissioner forever. And it should be incumbent on parliaments to make sure that we legislate not just with one particular person in one particular position in mind, but 
um, uh, with um, a clear-eyed focus on the need to make sure that protections will exist past the incumbency of any one person in any one particular position. Now, the Commissioner under this legislation will be guided by the National Classification Code. Now, that code is currently being reviewed, and it doesn't provide appropriate classifications for online media, and therefore, in the view of the Greens, is not fit for the purposes of this legislation. Classifications based on the code may capture non-violent sexual activity, including nudity and implied or simulated sexual activity, as well as materials considered unsuitable for a minor to see. Now, th the concerns that the Greens have in this area are that the bills fail to differentiate between actual harm and subjective moralistic constructions of harm. This would allow the Commissioner to act as a moral censor and for the Commissioner's powers to be weaponised by people and organisations with moral or political agendas. And again, I acknowledge comments made by the Commissioner in regards to these issues, and again I point out that the person who is currently the eSafety Commissioner will not be the eSafety Commissioner forever. The bills will also inevitably lead to online platforms resorting to automated processes based on algorithms and artificial intelligence to identify and remove content that could attract penalties. Now, the use of AI and algorithms um, in, uh, in similar circumstances in places like the US has been uh, extremely controversial, to say the least, and um, we are concerned that uh, the use of uh, those technologies could lead to disproportionate outcomes like blanket bans, even if that is not the intent of the Commissioner. Uh, the use of algorithms and AI uh, will also risk importing racial bias into the regulation of Australia's online content ecosystem. And uh, we know that that is a risk because that is exactly what has happened in the US under similar controversial laws such as the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. Sex Trafficking Act, the FOSTA, and the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, the SESTA legislation, as I said, in the US. Now, while a complaint-based framework for the non-consensual sharing of intimate images is very important and absolutely supported in principle by the Australian Greens, uh, we want to make sure, again, that this complex area um, is legislated um, uh, with full care and full consideration. The definition of an intimate image provided by these bills does not clearly state whether it applies at the moment an image is taken, which could have serious implications for the, for the utility of the scheme for transgender folk in Australia. Of particular concern to the Greens and many submitters to the Senate inquiry is the potentially devastating effect the bills will have on uh, sex workers. So sex workers and adult content creators operating lawful businesses that provide lawful products and services, many of whom have, been, uh, have migrated online as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, and we are worried about the potential for this framework um, to be used um, to drive people from the internet uh, back into the streets or ultimately um, into insolvency. Uh, we, we, we are concerned about the unintended consequences that could be both harmful to sex workers and adult businesses and to the broader community. Under the bills, as argued by Scarlet Alliance, sex workers will become more vulnerable as they potentially lose access to income, safety tools and strategies and to vital peer connections. We are also concerned that the bills fail to, provide, uh, to promote the maximum safety and privacy protections that they could. So I say again, the Greens absolutely commend the stated objectives of these bills to keep women, children and, and the broader Australian community safe in online environments. We uh, absolutely support um, women's and children's rights, and uh, we have staunchly opposed uh, extremism 
and radicalisation, particularly uh, right-wing extremism and radicalisation. But we need to make sure that we don't protect one set of rights by trampling over other rights. Bills this significant, targeted at problems this complex, should receive full and proper scrutiny in this place. And that is what the government, unfortunately, is seeking to deny. Now, that is why the Greens will be moving a second reading amendment calling for the bills to be withdrawn and redrafted to take account of the many and significant concerns raised by submitters. And I now move the, amendment, uh, the second reading amendment standing in my name. We will also move other substantive amendments in committee, including for a statutory reveal, uh, review of the bill's powers in two years. And I will speak more to those amendments when the time comes. But I say again, in conclusion, uh, these bills are incredibly important, they're incredibly significant, but they deal with an extremely complex area of policy. And this chamber should have taken the time to make sure that we get it right and that we avoid, to the greatest extent possible, any unintended consequences flowing from this legislation. The Australian Greens are disappointed that this chamber has not been given that opportunity. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Well, um, in writing to make some comments about the online safety bill, I think it is important to note that the, the trend in this area in terms of the trend of regulation and big tech, as it's widely become known, is only going to increase. Uh, big tech has changed our lives for the better, uh, and it has also brought new risks which need to be managed by policymakers. And that is what this bill is an attempt to do. It is an attempt to intervene into the market, into uh, the way that these schemes operate to protect people. And I think that is an important uh, starting point because the, the philosophy that you bring to these debates is, is important. Uh, we, our view has always been that uh, it is important to inject policy and regulation where there is consumer detriment, wherever there is consumer detriment. And this is not a capital and labour thing. This is a consumer protection thing. Now, uh, the, the government, I think, has built up a decent record here of being prepared to intervene where there is consumer detriment or where there is broader con community detriment in relation to technology companies. Now, it's been widely said that tech companies really are the railroads or the oil companies of the 21st century. Uh, these companies have so much power. Uh, they have done much good, uh, but they have the potential to do much bad. Uh, and over the last few months, we've seen uh, world-leading uh, media bargaining code legislation. Uh, we, ha we have led the world in trying to ensure that publishers and public interest journalists are paid for their work. Uh, we have also been uh, prepared to intervene here to ensure that consumers are protected. Now, social media, I mean, it really is the wild west. I, I mean, I, I am not in favour of regulation for regulation's sake, but uh, there is there is so much content on social media, which already contravenes our laws. Many of them, are state laws, I should say. But I, I don't think we should be reluctant about moving into this territory of ensuring that big tech organisations um, have an appropriate level of regulation. Their conduct of big tech organisations during the Media Bargaining Code legislation was probably the worst lobbying I've ever seen in my life um, in terms of the, the conduct of the, of the engagement. Uh, I mean, uh, people would be aware that large companies had threatened to leave Australia, had threatened to do all sorts of things. And I think once you have a company 
a global company uh, threaten a democracy or threaten a country, I mean, it's, the, the country has to win because we can't get, get into a situation where the companies are, are so large that they are able uh, to effectively boss a democracy around. And we've been here before. I mean, people can go back and look at what Theodore Roosevelt said about all these things, and uh, we've, of course, borrowed much of the antitrust uh, principles uh, in Australia as well through our own competition law. And, and so this, I think this is a very welcome initiative. And what it really does is bring to bear a, sim a, a simple, single framework for online safety. I think setting out the basic online safety expectations uh, will be broadly welcomed. Um, I think uh, arming the eSafety Commissioner with, with the power to effectively ensure that people are protected. And the, the concerns that I have here uh, would, be, would be widely shared across this parliament, that there is uh, bullying and abuse that goes on online. Uh, it is uh, rampant at times. Uh, it is uh, leading to people doing all sorts of uh, dreadful things. Uh, and I think that the commitments we've made uh, back at the election campaign to increase penalties uh, for use of a carriage service to menace, harass or cause offence from three to five years is really important. I think it's one of the most important commitments uh, that we took to the last election uh, because people are being bullied, uh, people are being abused, and often it occurs uh, through the cover of anonymity. I mean, there's nowhere else in, in our world, in our society, where you can go under the cover of darkness, uh, pretend to be someone else, and basically attack people, um, use all manner of things to attack people and to try and destroy their lives. And it's just not good enough. I, I mean, you can't do it in broad daylight. Uh, you can't do it in any other theatre in our life. And I think the, the policy here to rein in uh, effectively uh, carriage services um, is a very important one. Now, I won't bore you with the talking points here, but the, 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 the point here really is uh, this will be a, a, a clear framework. It is important that we, we respect the system of uh, parliamentary oversight, and I think it is very welcome that the basic online safety expectations will be set by the minister and be disallowable by uh, by uh, either chamber of the parliament. And I think in this place, in this debate, just as you see in any other similar debate, uh, we don't want to pass down to regulators uh, rulemaking capacity. Uh, I mean, they, these are important rules. Uh, we're balancing, balancing civil liberties here uh, against the desire to protect people. And these are judgments that should be exercised by a minister uh, and they should be disallowable, and that is the intention. Uh, I mean, the eSafety Commissioner, uh, I think, will do a great job here. I have a lot of confidence in the incumbent, um, but the, the framework here of having the minister setting the regulation is an, is an important one. Uh, so, I mean, ultimately, we, we want to have a system where Australia is not a backwater. We want to see technology used. Technology is good, uh, but we want to make sure people are protected. What we don't want to see is people being bullied and harassed online. We don't want to see uh, people coming under the cover of anonymity attacking people because they're too gutless to say who they really are. That's not the sort of uh, debate we want to have. That's not the sort of country we, we want to see. And I personally want to see that sort of behaviour reined in because social media is the Wild West. I mean, anything goes. And uh, it is not good enough for people to use social media platforms to, to break the laws. Of Australia. Now, uh, we have laws in New South Wales on um, anti-incitement and on defamation, and social media should not be a back door to breaking the law. And so it's very important that this scheme ultimately is going to protect people uh, from cyberbullying, from image abuse, uh, and is done in a way which balances out the privacy concerns that are, that are going to be legitimately held and that the rules are made by the minister uh, in that way. So I think this is a very important piece of legislation. It is utterly consistent with our liberal philosophy to intervene where there is the public interest. And I think it builds on the media bargaining code, which was a very important, that was a very important win for Australia because 
Once the big tech companies started to threaten our country, it was so important that we prevailed because we cannot have a situation where large tech companies, which have more power than almost any other non-state actor in the world today, can bully, can bully and defeat a country. So I think Australia has led the world here again. Uh, a very important bill, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Our Senator Polly. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Online Safety Bill 2021 and the Online Safety Transitional Provisions Consequential Amendment Bill 2021. These bills are important if we are able to tackle the sharing of illegal images and to address head-on the prevalence of revenge porn within our communities. Governments are almost always starting from behind when we're talking about technology. Technology advances, travels so quickly, and governments are trying to take their breath and to be able to keep it ahead of the curve. Ideally, these bills continue to build on existing legislation schemes on line safety. Labor welcomes funding to support online safety, with a particular focus on women and children. However, it is disappointing that this government cites the introduction of the Online Safety Bill now before Parliament as evidence of its commitment to women's safety, all the while while it permits the member for Bowman, Andrew Lamming MP, to remain as a member of the LNP who sits in the Liberal Party room on the government benches and remains a chair of a parliamentary committee with the support of the Liberal National Parties. As stated in a number of media reports recently, Mr Lamming has a long history of trolling and abusing his own constituents on Facebook that have undermined the safety and mental health of at least one woman. Mr Lamming's conduct online is precisely what this proposed new adult cyber abuse scheme contained in this bill is designed to address, menacing, harassing or offensive material online. I think it's important that this is on the record and that those opposite are silent to the actions of Mr Lamming. I recently read an article about a study by anthropologists about the use of smartphones and technology and how our phones are changing the human experience at a personal level and a group level. The anthropologist argues that, and I quote, our devices have become an extension of ourselves. Smartphones are now a transportable home. We use them to organise our schedules, find entertainment and communicate with family and friends. They are where we anchor our sense of identity and self. We have become human snails carrying our home in our pockets, they write. The smartphone is perhaps the first object to challenge the house itself and possibly also in the workplace in the terms of the amount of time we dwell in it and while awake. It's an interesting argument. Smartphones have become such a persuasive uh, part of our lives. And let's be honest, who can compete with a smartphone? The interactive capabilities of a smartphone on an intellectual level is superior to any human in terms of sheer amount of variation in information that is accessible from this device. The article went on to argue that there needs to be a new etiquette to manage the digital age, because balancing a physical reality with a digital life causes frustration, disappointment or even offence for those left staring at someone sitting hunched over their device. We know that there is a prevalence of young Australians and Australians of all ages are using their smartphones to transmit inappropriate images, images that can ruin people's lives. Now, the Enhancing Online Safety Act 2015 operates to protect Australians from online harms, such as non-consensual sharing of intimate images. But laws must also improve and ensure the eSafety Commissioner has the ability to ensure images are removed as quickly as possible in an advancement that all should applaud. Labor supports measures to consolidate and update and enhance online safety laws for Australians. Online safety is an area of bipartisanship and Labor is looking for bipartisanship regarding this policy area. It is too important not to get it right. 
There are some concerns around due process, appeals, oversight and transparency requirements in relation to the novel adult cyber abuse scheme, given the important free speech implications and where the powers given to the eSafety Commissioner could subvert the framework of safeguards put in place under the Telecommunications Assistance and Access regime, including its warrant processes and the prohibition, it, the prohibitations it includes on actions that would introduce systemic weaknesses in the communications scheme. Labor notes that it has been almost two and a half years since the Briggs Review, October 2018, recommended a single up-to-date online safety act. Given the significant passage of time, it is disappointing that the Morrison government has proved incapable of conducting a process that satisfies stakeholders in terms of process and substance. The government has been spruiking this new Online Safety Act for almost two years. In the lead-up to the May 2019 federal election, the Morrison government promised to introduce a new Online Safety Act. In September 2019, the Minister for Communications spruiked the new Online Safety Act in answer to questions about what the government was doing to keep Australians safe online, including in relation to the rise of right-wing extremists online hate speech and racism in Australia following the Christchurch terrorist atrocity. A year later, in September 2020, the minister again spruiked the non-existent Online Safety Act in response to questions about what the government was doing to curb graphic content on social media platforms in the wake of a self-harm video on Facebook and TikTok. The minister's October 2020 op-ed kept the promise of a new Online Safety Act alive, while his department at the Senate estimates put the delay down to pressures on drafting resources. A number of stakeholders are concerned the Morrison government introduced the bill into parliament on 24 February 2021, only eight days after consultation on the exposure draft of legislation concluded on the 14th of February 2021. The short time frame at the end of this drawn out process has undermined confidence in the government's exposure draft consultation process, with a number of stakeholders concerned that submissions have not been considered properly. At the same time, the bill was referred to this inquiry on the 25th of February 2021, Labor centres had no visibility of either the number of submissions that have been made on the exposure draft or of the range or, or nature of concerns raised in those submissions. In evidence to the inquiry, the department confirmed that 376 submissions on the exposure draft were received and were uploaded and made available publicly only the day prior to the inquiry hearings. The department further advised that it assessed the submissions and identified 56 issues that warranted further consideration by the minister and that seven amendments of technical nature were made to the bill as a result of that consideration. We note the review of Australia's classification regulations, for which public consultation closed over a year ago on 19 February 2020 is delayed and has fallen out of step with this reform process as a result. On the major issue of free speech, in more detail, Labor understands that the balance between free speech and protection against certain kinds of speech is a complex endeavour, and we are concerned that this bill represents a significant increase in the eSafety Commissioner's discretion to remove material without commensurate requirements for due process, appeals or transparency over and above Senate estimates, annual reporting and the AAT appeals. While supportive of a scheme for adult cyber abuse, we on this side find it curious that a government that has made repeated attempts to repeal Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act on the grounds that it is unduly restricts free speech despite the availability of defences in Section 18D, is now seeking to rush through a bill that empowers the eSafety Commissioner with discretion to determine matters of speech in relation to adult cyberbullying without greater checks and balances. 
The Morrison government talks a big game about its expectations of social media platforms, yet to date it has failed to do its job by updating Australia's online safety laws. While the government is right to expect digital platforms to offer more in terms of transparency, so to must the government be prepared to provide transparency around decision-making, particularly on matters that engage with human rights? For this reason, we on this side recommended that the government consider further amendments to clarify the bill in terms of its scope and to strengthen due process, appeals, oversights and transparency requirements, given important free speech and digital rights considerations it engages. So I would encourage those opposite to stop slouching over their smartphones and have a good intention intended face-to-face -face conversation with those in this chamber so that we can protect more Australians from the misuse of smartphones. If they do that, we can improve and make this truly bipartisan to improve the lives of all Australians and to ensure technology enriches our lives instead of determining our lives. And we all read about it either on social media or we hear through other forms of media, the devastating effect that these faceless people and the anonymity that people use to be able to bully, harass and embarrass people through social media. Now, with all new um, interventions, and we know, as I said, how quickly technology moves, but we have to always ensure that People um, are protected from bullies, from people who want to try and intimidate them, people who want to embarrass them, people that want to use uh, this technology for illegal activities and for abusing people. So I urge people um, in this chamber, and in particular the government, to support our amendment. And uh, I therefore support the bill. Thank you, Senator. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Online Safety Bill 2021 and the Online Safety Transitional Provisions and Consequential Amendments Bill 2021. The Australian Greens agree that online safety is a significant issue and an important concern for Australian internet users. You don't have to be a parent to share concerns about children having access to graphic online content, the prevalence of sharing of intimate photos, exposure to cyberbullying and all without the respectful relationships and consent education that children need to navigate it. I'm also keenly aware of the misogynistic abuse that people experience online. And as the Green spokesperson for women, I understand the national crisis of violence against women and their children and the growing scourge of online and technology facilitated abuse. I hear story after story of coercive and violent ex-partners continuing their abuse online sending violent images, sharing intimate images without consent, bombarding social media with threatening messages, harassing them via email. Any abuse of women and children is completely unacceptable. The reported trebling of cyber abuse and image-based abuse during COVID is a salutary warning that abusers will use all, to, all tools at their disposal to perpetuate their control over others. The Australian Greens believe that we must protect vulnerable internet users and stamp out abuse and violence online and offline. I also acknowledge the work being done by the eSafety Commissioner on these issues and the recognition in the budget of the need to tackle the rise in technology facilitated abuse. However, this bill as it is currently drafted is not the right solution to this very real problem. This bill has been rushed and it, go it gives far too much unfettered discretion to the unelected eSafety Commissioner. The bill as it stands has largely ignored the concerns raised in the over 350 submissions received in response to rushed consultation that happened over the Christmas break. Many of those submissions highlight that what is proposed goes beyond what is needed to address core concerns while still failing to adequately address the more insidious forms of online and technology facilitated abuse that are emerging. It represents a missed opportunity to find a path through this complex area that will achieve appropriate protections. 
For example, the submission from the Women's Services Network, also known as WESNET, notes that the bill will go some way towards improving online safety, uh, and I quote, but in our view underestimates the ways in which perpetrators of domestic and family violence can misuse technology to harm and abuse their victims using online mechanisms. WESNET is concerned that the online safety bill may be presented as a solution to technology-facilitated abuse experienced by survivors of domestic and family violence. In reality, the misuse of technology is far broader than the coverage of this bill. The dynamics of domestic and family violence are often more complex, uh, sorry, often also more complex and multifaceted, and require a much larger and coordinated response. End quote. The amendments that my colleague Senator McKim will move aim to correct that balance, preserving the parts of the bill that provide additional protections for vulnerable internet users, strengthening the protection for digital rights, and removing the provisions likely to be weaponised against women and under undermine the overall objectives of the bill. Submissions from WESNET and Domestic Violence Victoria raise concerns that the bill as drafted will be easily circumvented by perpetrators and could be used against survivors by making false complaints, coercing children to make unsubstantiated complaints, reporting uh, dating profile information from a former partner, or by impersonating the survivor online. This is not the stuff of fantasy. The eSafety Commissioner has reported that in more than a quarter of family violence cases, perpetrators pretend to be the adult victim survivor online. The bill introduces wide powers for the eSafety Commissioner but does not balance these with adequate rights of appeal or ways to prevent vexatious abuse of the complaints process. WESNET and DV Victoria also caution that ordinary person and serious harm tests set up in the bill fail to recognise the unseen harm done by controlling perpetrators who are skilled at using victim survivors' personal experiences and fears against them. In a recent national survey undertaken by WESNET and Curtin University, Many frontline experts working with victim survivors observe that threats are often covert. They're targeted and they're harmful, and they have meaning for the victim that doesn't seem abusive to another person. What might seem like a benign message to an outsider can, in fact, be a targeted threat. A request to pack the kids' Medicare card for their weekend with their dad, quote, in case they get hurt, might be seen as a responsible reminder if you ignore the family violence context in which this is a coded threat to harm the children. It is these complexities that are not adequately addressed by the current bill as it's currently drafted. This bill may be an attempt to improve online safety for victim survivors of abuse, but without amendment and redrafting, it does not create the measures needed to stamp out this abuse, and it has harmful unintended consequences on digital rights and online work. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator, oh, Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. It's my, my great pleasure to rise and speak on the online safety bill. As of this year, there are 22.82 million internet users in Australia, 89 per cent of the population. And more than 20 million of those people are active social media users. On average, Australians spend six hours and 13 minutes per day on the internet. That's almost 40 per cent of their waking hours. A full third of that time is spent on social media. The online world is an incredible place. It is an eradicable part of the everyday lives of millions of Australians. It is a world where we can find everything from obscure mathematical theorems to the latest in fashion. It is a world in which we can engage in conversations with others thousands of kilometres away in forgotten parts of the world in forgotten cities. It is a world of over 30 trillion unique web pages. In such a dizzying labyrinth of text, images and videos, it is easy to be overwhelmed by the sheer volume of information and opinion thrown at us every time we enter it. For an increasing number of Australians, the experience is harrowing and destructive. Over 20 per cent of young people experience abuse online 
and the statistics for the population more generally are no better. Let me just say that again. Over 20 per cent of all young people going online experience some form of abuse. Alarmingly, some 87 per cent of young people have witnessed cyberbullying online. Again, I say that number, 87 per cent. Unlike abuse on the street, cyber abuse and harassment can happen at any time and be broadcast to thousands, if not millions, of strangers. Cyberbullying also shows human beings at their most petty and their most shallow and, at times, their most destructive. 72 per cent of cyberbullying victims are targeted because of the way they look. Given these statistics, it has never been more important to ensure that Australians stay safe, stay safe online. We should enjoy the same standards online as we do in the town square, and this bill guarantees exactly that. Madam Deputy President, I note with some concern the criticism of other senators opposite from the Greens and the Labor Party, and while they are supporting this bill, I note their criticisms. But I say very strongly today I am incredibly proud that the Morrison government is the government fixing this issue. We did not see this sort of action from Labor when it was in power. We did not see the Labor Party combating these issues. And along with all the other work that we have done to protect women in particular and children, to protect their safety, to combat women, um, domestic violence, uh, this bill is a very important part of the suite of measures that our government has taken to protect people in our community. The bill establishes a set of basic online safety expectations for industry and includes mandatory transparency reporting requirements, which allows the eSafety Commissioner to require online services to provide specific information about online harms. These include responses to material depicting abhorrent violent conduct and uh, volumetric attacks in which organised digital lynch mobs uh, can overwhelm a victim with abuse. The bill also includes a strengthened cyberbullying scheme for Australian children, building on the government's existing scheme for protecting children online. The bill sets out a new cyber abuse scheme to remove serious forms of online abuse from the internet. And very importantly, Madam Deputy President, this is backed up by strong civil penalties. Similarly, internet content hosts face new requirements to take down image-based abuse within 24 hours on pain of penalty. The eSafety Commissioner's powers, and let me say the eSafety Commissioner is doing an extraordinary job uh, in our community, an extraordinary job protecting people online and particularly children online. Um, her powers have been expanded and the Commissioner can now use a rapid website blocking power to block material depicting abhorrent violent conduct during an online crisis such as what occurred uh, during the Christchurch church massacre when disgracefully and disgustingly Facebook failed to remove that abhorrent content in any reasonable time frame. The Commissioner's information gathering powers have also been expanded so that the Commissioner can unmask the identities of anonymous online accounts being used to bully, abuse and humiliate innocent people. Statistics tell one kind of story, but it is a remote and abstract one. The concrete reality is that most of us know someone who has been affected by online cyberbullying, cyber abuse or humiliation. This is an issue particularly close to my heart as well, and I have stood in this chamber previously and spoken about the trolling to which I have been subjected by 
my political opponents. And in my particular experience, which happened over a period of some four years, I was subjected to shocking abuse, humiliation, false claims uh, by um, people running a number of anonymous Twitter accounts, which made some really distressing claims, including attaching my face, my headshot, to the photo of a woman who had the name and has the name Sarah Henderson, a woman from Texas who had been charged and now convicted with killing her two children. And so my local political opponents, I can say, on these anonymous Twitter accounts thought it was okay to compare me with a woman by the same name who had killed her two children. How revolting and disgusting is that? I am very pleased that Geelong Police took this on, investigated this conduct, sought uh, a warrant from Twitter, and equally disgustingly, Twitter refused to comply with that warrant and provide Geelong Police with any information about the cowardly people behind those anonymous Twitter accounts. <laughs> And I will not give up on this issue. I will not give up on continuing to hold the people behind these anonymous Twitter accounts uh, to account for what they thought was okay to do. Um, as I say, it was absolutely disgraceful that Twitter refused to comply with a police warrant, despite the head of government relations telling me that Twitter would have no issue in doing so when, once they had a, a police warrant or a court order. So I'm very, very pleased with the government's work in relation to this bill. We must do everything we can to arrest this abhorrent and corrosive phenomenon. So I'm a very, very proud supporter of this bill. It is both necessary. Um, it is an effective bill. It provides immediate response powers. It holds many people to account for their conduct online. And it obviously supports the government's determination to protect Australians from the tsunami of horrific material which can occur online. And I commend these bills to the Senate. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Senator Henderson. Senator Breen. Thank you, uh, Madam Pres Deputy President. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak on the Online Safety Bill 2021 um, and the transitional provisions that go with it. Uh, I was one of the members of the uh, Senate committee that uh, performed an inquiry into this bill and have taken a keen interest in the development of this legislation. The bill will establish a complaint system for cyberbullying material targeted at Australian children and the non-consensual sharing of intimate images cyber abuse material targeted at an Australian adult and the online content scheme. It will also provide for the minister to determine basic online safety expectations for social media services, relevant electronic services and designated internet services. It also creates a new complaint-based system remove for, which allows for the removal notice scheme for cyber abuse targeted at an adult. It creates a specific and targeted power for the Commission to request or require an internet service provider to block access to materials that promote, incite, instruct in or depicts abhorrent violent conduct. And these uh, notices would be for time limited periods. Labor strongly supports the objective of this bill. We can't be clearer than that. Though we do have concerns, genuine concerns, about how long it took for this bill to be drafted after the minister was out there uh, championing this bill for so long without it actually being drafted or uh, introduced into this parliament. The consultation period, as you've heard, uh, was lacking. 
But the fact that the government didn't take into account many of the recommendations from the department or stakeholders continues to be a concern. Many st stakeholders have raised multiple concerns about this bill, including the functions and the powers of the oversight of the e-safety commissioner, who is an unelected official, the clarity and breadth of the basic online safety expectations, the services in the scope of the online content regulation schemes, the clarity and proportionality of the blocking scheme, and the appropriateness of the online content scheme. There's also been concerns about the response time required to remove notices if there is an objection. Madam Deputy President, the safety of Australians online is of paramount importance. I don't think any senator in this chamber would disagree with that. For many Australians, uh, for many years, Australians have been protected by laws to support online safety, and it is crucial that these laws are kept up to date and improved to keep up with tech logical changes. Labor supports the consolidation of online safety laws into a new framework, and we also support the new elements of the bill, which are the elements that uh, attracted so much attention through the inquiry phase. We live in an era that is increasingly spent online, which demands measures to mitigate online harm be kept up to date. Fundamentally, I understand it's important that the need to balance the right between protecting against harmful speech and the right to protect free speech. Uh, and that's not always a black and white thing for legislators to do. So I want to thank all of the people that contributed to the Senate inquiry uh, and for the senators that came along to that inquiry and asked a lot of detailed questions of the commissioner and of stakeholders about how this bill would uh, actually um, uh, be uh, impact people, how it would impact free speech and how it would be delivered. Uh, as a senator, we speak, seek to protect Australians from any harm, but we all, must also be aware of the impact that these provisions could have on freedom of expression. And that is why you will see senators around the um, chamber today raise these questions um, in good faith. Uh, while also supporting the objectives of this bill. One of the issues raised with me during the Senate inquiry into this bill was the lack of transparency around the use of unprecedented powers being conveyed on the Commissioner. I understand that the government has now or will be circulating amendments requiring the Commissioner to report to, in the annual report, the frequency of the use of these powers. And that is a real win for the Senate inquiry process and for the um, submitters that contributed to the Senate inquiry, because that was a really gaping hole in the transparency and accountability uh, to this parliament of this legislation. Labor su supports a hostilic, multifaceted, layered approach, including safety by design, adult supervision, technological measures and the education of both adults and children. While Labor will be supporting this bill, we're certainly not happy with how it's been delivered. As I said, we acknowledge the concerns raised by stakeholders. As usual, the government has been big on announcement and slow on the delivery. You won't be surprised to hear that it was almost two and a half years ago when the Briggs Review recommended a single up-to-date Online Safety Act. And here we are. The government has been spooking the Online Safety Act the entire time, but we're only now getting to the point where we're able to uh, debate this legislation in the parliament. In the lead up to May 2019 federal election, the Morrison government promised to introduce that act, but we've had to wait two years before we could achieve that. And it's interesting because in an extraordinary move, the minister was actually taking credit for the act without actually passing it through parliament in the first place. Um, in 2009, when faced with the rise of right-wing extremism, online hate speech and racism in Australia, the Online Safety Act was their answer, but it hadn't actually been passed through Parliament yet. The Minister also um, uh, used the bill um, in response to questions about what the government was going to do to curb uh, graphic online social media content. In October 2020, when the minister published an op-ed about the new Online Safety Act, the department was in budget estimates, admitting further delays uh, to the bill because of pressures on drafting resources. So while the government is there today congratulating themselves, it has taken a long time to get here, and too long, Labor would say. 
During the consultation period, the department confirmed that there were 376 submissions on the exposure draft, but there were 56 issues with the bill identified by the department themselves. Only seven amendments of a technical nature were made as a result. And I note one of those amendments um, presented to this chamber is actually a spelling mistake of the word bullying. When asked about the key operational aspects of the bill, the e-safety commissioner called it um, a sausage still being made. There's a lot we don't know about how this bill will be implemented. Two and a half years later, the government has proved incapable of conducting a process that satisfies stakeholders in terms of both process and substance. What is even more disappointing is how the government cannot seem to hold its own party room to the same standards set out by the legislation we are voting on today. Those opposites have pointed out the government's so-called commitment to women's safety online. The Prime Minister himself even quote, was quoted, the Morrison government wants Australians to engage confidently, to work, communicate and be entertained without fear of being viciously trolled or exposed to harmful content. But when it comes to turning those words into action, to taking real action, well, the government is completely silent. Because just recently, in my home state of Queensland, the very proud member for Redlands, Kim Richards, stood in the state parliament and tabled evidence of the government's very own member for Bowman, Mr Lamming's harassment of her and other women online. She called on the LNP to do the right thing with regards to Mr Lamming, to turn their words into action. Mr Lamming has a long and proven track record of trolling and abusing his constituents online. Sorry, Mr sorry, Lamming, sorry, I'm sorry, um, Senator, Senator Scar. Point of order, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, my uh, friend, the Senator from Queensland, is uh, making personal reflections upon a member on the other place. Uh, the Honourable Member for Bowman, and I would ask her to, uh, to withdraw those reflections, which I note are the subject of action which is being taken by uh, the Member for Bowman in order to protect his reputation. Senator Green, if you could withdraw, or are you on the point of order? I'm actually referencing comments that Mr Lamming made himself on Facebook. He called himself. He said, "I control them on Facebook." So I'm, I'm actually referring to comments that he made that are publicly available. I, I'll be, I'm being very careful about what I'm saying. But if I'm referring to comments, if Mr. Lamming has called himself a Facebook troll, my submission to you, Chair, is that I should be able to refer to those in those comments. On, on, on that basis, there is there is no point, point of order. Uh. Mr. Lamming himself has stated that he is a Facebook troll. He freely admits to running over 37 Facebook pages. Mr Lamming has made social media posts inciting stalking behaviour, offering cash prizes to get the member for Redlands to answer questions and, in one instance, actually followed the member for Redlands into a public park and took pictures of her. On Valentine's Day, Mr Lamming incited more stalking behaviour via a Facebook post, once again offering a cash prize for details on the member for Redlands, female politician's location and the people in her company. The member for Redlands even sought advice. This is what Kim Richards, the member for Redlands, was forced to do because of Mr Lamming's behaviour. She has had to sought, seek advice about the invasive and personal behaviour of Mr Lamming and, as a result, had to install CCTV cameras and an electronic security gate. She was also advised, because of the uh, detriment that she was um, uh, receiving, because of the behaviour of Mr Lamming, that she should speak with a psychologist. That is how severe Mr Lamming's harassment has been of this woman. Mr Lamming's inappropriate online content is exactly what the government's cyber abuse scheme is aiming to stamp out. In fact, I put this question to the department in estimates. Dep the department secretary told me that the scheme would provide a pathway for people to make complaints about exactly this kind of behaviour. Quote, it is fair to say that absolutely the intention behind this new bill, when it is passed, is to provide an avenue for people experiencing that kind of activity to a pathway to make complaints and to some, someone able to take action. 
So we have this curious situation where the government is here talking about how important online safety is and how particularly how important it is for women's safety online for this bill to be passed. Yet they will not take any action against Mr Lamming despite the evidence, despite the public comments by Mr Lamming himself that he is a Facebook troll. The hypocrisy of this government, on the one hand, championing this bill but also championing Mr Lamming, is absolutely galling. It should not be happening, and this government knows it, but they're too afraid to step up and do something to make sure that Mr Lamming isn't able to harass any more women online. He continues to be a committee chair. He continues to get the support of uh, the government members in the House of Representatives every single day when something is uh, put to them, where they have the cho choice to support Mr Lamming or to support a motion calling out his behaviour. They want to support Mr Lamming. Well, I can tell you that there are many more women like Kim Richards. But I'm very proud of the member for Redlands stepping up and talking about this in the Queensland Parliament. And I will talk about this every single time the government seeks to talk about online safety. Because until they take action against Mr Lamming, until they see that the behaviour that he has contributed to Kim Richards, the member for Redlands, a female politician who deserves so much better from this government, then all of the things that they say about this bill and about this issue are completely hollow. Labor supports this bill and its various elements designed to strengthen protections for Australians online. However, the bills have been delayed and here we are again talking about how this government can, can believe that it's such an important bill for Australian women should be passed today why they haven't taken action against the member for Bowman. He's still on the government backbench. He's still a chair of a parliamentary committee. He's still earning an extra $20,000 a year for that role. Well, members opposite should hang their head in shame. Hang their head in shame that they have failed to step up and do the right thing because the standard that you walk past is the standard that you accept. And what you are telling the many women in Redlands who have suffered online abuse from this member is that you accept that abuse. So Labor supports this bill, but we do not support the behaviour of Mr Lamming, and we are not afraid in this place to say so. Acting Deputy President, I also want to foreshadow that because of this very curious hypocrisy, I will be moving a second reading amendment to this bill, requiring the government to, to lead by example when it comes to keeping women safe online and ensure that the member for Bowman is discharged from the Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training immediately. Thank you. Senator Steele-John. Thank you. Uh, the Greens oppose the legislation as it has, has been put before uh, the Senate today, and I would like to uh, outline um, for the Senate and for those following at home exactly why. Uh, in doing so, I would like to first thank my colleague, uh, Senator McKim, for his outstanding and detailed work on this legislation and also uh, his office led by Andrew Perry in the policy area. I'd also like to thank um, uh, Noelle Martin of Western Australia, um, who has for a very long time uh, been a great source of information and advice uh, to me in relation to these uh, often complex uh, and uh, deeply important issues. Uh, let's just start from a place where I think everybody should be able to agree, and that is that every person should be able to live their lives free of violence, exploitation, abuse or neglect. Now, when we are talking about the need to uh, safeguard this right and this expectation in relation to uh, abuse that somebody might experience uh, in the digital space, we often talk about a, a, a broad terminology uh, called cyberbullying or online abuse. Um, and what is, uh, what is often lost uh, in that terminology is some of the uh, 
deep complexities and different forms that abuse takes uh, when uh, an online environment is also involved. And I'm somebody that has been aware of these issues in uh, a personal capacity, uh, experienced some of them myself, but also as a, as a senator newly elected, one of the first inquiries I was part of uh, was exploring uh, some of these very complicated issues. Uh, and I think it's, it's useful to break them down broadly into three categories. Uh, we have the non-consensual uh, sharing of intimate images. Uh, then we have uh, what we might call uh, bullying that takes place uh, in, the, in a cyber realm as well as in a personal uh, interaction between individuals. Uh, and then finally, we have online facilitated abuse. Uh, now, these are very uh, distinct forms of abuse that have distinct uh, characteristics, all of which require, um, funnily enough, a bespoke uh, policy response uh, from legislators at both the state and federal level. Um, the uh, non-consensual sharing of intimate images uh, is a disgusting and disgraceful um, uh, phenomenon uh, in our society today. Its roots uh, are deeply set in the disrespectful um, and dehumanising ways in which women, people of colour, uh, people who are queer are treated, what standards of behaviour are ex accepted and uh, expected. Um, and to deal with those issues, we need policy responses that deal with both the outcome and the root cause. Um, in relation to cyberbullying, uh, it is often denoted uh, by different social contexts and relationships between those that are the subject of the form of abuse or bullying and those that are the perpetrator. It was very clearly put to uh, myself during one of these inquiry processes that what is critical to understand when analysing cyberbullying is that uh, it is uh, the social phenomena of bullying moving into a digital realm. Um, those that are the victim of it and the perpetrator of it often know each other, um, and there is a high likelihood that the perpetrator of uh, a cyberbullying incident uh, may well also, uh, the victim of a cyberbullying incident, may also be the perpetrator of a subsequent incident, incident and vice versa. Often, cyberbullying uh, takes uh, place in a a close-knit social environment like a school and when involve uh, somebody below the age of 18. And so again, the policy response required is uh, specific, bespoke, um, and balancing the, the reality that we may well be legislating in an area uh, where people below the age of 18 are involved and where there is a need, ultimately, uh, to solve these problems both at the end and at the root cause, often by involving an entire of school, entire of community approach to solving that problem, while always recognising uh, that the vast majority of uh, kids and children at school do not engage in cyberbullying behaviour. The best estimate is around about 40 per cent of kids uh, experience or perpetrate these types of abuses. Um, while that is a large majority, we shouldn't build a picture of an entire generation uh, behaving in this way. And we should also ground it in the reality uh, that before there was a digital space for this to occur in, it just happened interpersonally um, and has been a factor of uh, school life and adolescence um, for a very long time. Uh, online facilitated abuse, again, the third and final category, uh, is denoted and often marked out by uh, the absence of a relationship uh, between the perpetrator and the victim. Um, so the perpetrator is not known to the victim, nor vice versa, um, and the victim is selected at random and is often part of a broader cohort um, which uh, the perpetrator is targeting often above the age of 18, again uh, utilising multiple platforms, multiple identities, therefore requiring, you guessed it, bespoke, nuanced, well thought through legislative responses that address and hold people account, uh, to account for their actions, while also dealing with 
the deep root cause of why people behave in this way, particularly to groups such as women, such as uh, queer folks, such as people of colour, that overwhelmingly experience this online facilitated abuse. Now, uh, people that work in this area understand these social complexities, understand uh, the uh, bespoke policy responses that are needed, and if you speak to them, are really willing to give you this information. I have learnt so much from working in this area over this period of time. And there are folks who are absolutely committed um, and deeply and genuinely want to see action in all three of these areas to make sure that people are not subjected uh, to violence, abuse or exploitation in any context or setting. Um, and those people and their genuinely held beliefs, often driven uh, by a lived experience uh, with this type of phenomenon, uh, should be honoured and respected and appropriately engaged with. We as, uh, well I say we, the major parties as parties of uh, of uh, power in this place should do them the honour and respect always of engaging thoroughly and in detail with these organisations. Now, this is not what has occurred uh, in relationship to the creation of this bill. Now, the government has cited a response to a, a piece of evidence that was given to them, the result of an inquiry report in 2018. And there have been two years, uh, there have been many years intervening since then. The reality of this legislation before this chamber right now is that it is totally and utterly undercooked. It has been rammed through in the smallest possible time. First, the government published an exposure draft of the legislation to which it allowed a mere number of weeks for submitters uh, to give their evidence in relation to what the final piece of legislation should look like. Then it was introduced and attempted to be passed through a section of this chamber's time where it would be open to no amendment nor a vote of opposition. When they Senator, figured out they Senator, couldn't Senator do that. John, uh, the debate is interrupted. You will be in continuation. I will now proceed to Senator's statements. Yeah. Senator Scar. Mr Acting Deputy President, it gives me great honour to rise in this chamber this afternoon to pay tribute to Professor Chao Chui Liang, affectionately known as LG, who passed away on 13 March 2021 at the age of 84. Professor Cho was a deeply respected and highly regarded leader in the Australian Taiwanese community who provided outstanding service both to the people of Australia and the people of Taiwan. I note the presence in the gallery of members of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Australia, including Deputy Representative Mr Ken Lai, Officer Ms Christy Chang and also Officer Mr Vincent Wang. And I sincerely thank them for their presence in the chamber today. Professor Cho was born in Taiwan in 1938. After graduating from the Taiwan National University, he continued his studies in the United States, obtaining a doctorate in 1971. He then chose to make a life for himself and his family in Australia and became naturalised in 1974. During the course of his life, he made three outstanding contributions to both Australia and Taiwan. First, in the area of education. For over 40 years, he served in the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Queensland, my alma mater, with great distinction and great honour. He inspired countless students at the University of Queensland who have gone on to take positions of great responsibility in our nation. And this was reinforced to me, Mr Acting Deputy President, when I attended the double 10 day double 10 day celebration dinner, uh, Taiwanese celebration dinner in 2019. And I was honoured to sit next to Professor Cho. And he recounted to me how one of his favourite students was the Honourable George Brandis, who served in this parliament, in this chamber, as leader of the government on this side of the chamber uh, for many years with great distinction. And in fact, I sent a photograph 
to my good friend George Brandis of myself and Professor Cho sitting together, and George immediately responded affectionately and saying how much Professor Chow meant to him. And this scholarship, this education, was based on a deep intellectual base. And I was greatly interested to go back and review Professor Chow's work, Maoism in Action, the Cultural Revolution. And there were so many lessons from this book that have resonance in the world today. So that was the first aspect of Professor Chow's great contribution to our nation. The second was his promotion of the relationship between Australia and Taiwan. Professor Chow was always close to his Hakka culture and did much to keep that culture alive and prospering in Australia, in my home state of Queensland. In 1993, he founded the Taiwan Institute in Australia, and during his frequent trips and visits to Taiwan and to many other nations around the world, he promoted harmonious relationships between Taiwan and Australia and be between Taiwan and many other countries around the world. And just reflect, just reflect for a moment, Mr Acting Deputy President, the fact that Professor Cho was so well regarded, so well regarded both in Taiwan and in Australia, that made his contribution, his contribution both to Taiwan, Taiwan, to Australia and to relationship between the people of Taiwan and Australia is so special, such a unique contribution from such a unique individual. And third, and perhaps for me most movingly, was Professor Cho's deep commitment to the spirit of democracy. And many times that commitment potentially led him into danger. And many times he had to make personal life choices to honour that spirit of democracy throughout his life. And for me, that is perhaps the most moving contribution that Professor Chow made. And I was, I, in reading many of the articles which Professor Chow wrote over his time as a leading intellectual in this country and as a contributor to the intellectual life in both Taiwan and Australia, I was consistently moved by how much he cherished that spirit of democracy. There was a, a simplicity and a purity to that commitment, which I think everyone serving in this chamber would do well to remember. Professor Chow's service to our country was recognised by Australia in 2003 through the award of a centenary medal. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, we should also remember that Professor Chow was a beloved husband to Flora, a beloved father and father-in-law of Grace and Michael, Leon and Kim and Sue, and a treasured grandfather of Rachel, Lucy, Emma, Sam, Joseph and Caitlin. And when I attended Professor Chow's memorial service, I was greatly moved by the contribution of his grandchildren on that day. And I'm sure Professor Chow would have been incredibly touched by how they contributed to his memory on that day. There is perhaps nothing more special than the love between a grandparent and their grandchildren. Mr Acting Deputy President, Australia is truly blessed that Professor Chow and his wife Flora chose to make a home in our beautiful country in Australia. Just as we are truly blessed that we have such a vibrant Australian Taiwanese community and just as we are truly blessed that we have such positive relations with the people of Taiwan. Professor Chow's contribution to education to promoting the relationship between Australia and Taiwan and his passion for the spirit of democracy is an example to inspire all Australians, regardless of their background. Professor Chow's story is part of who we are as modern-day Australians. It is now part of the Australian story. Professor Chow's commitment to democracy, the purity of his belief in the spirit of democracy, should serve as an inspiration to all of us who have the honour to sit in this chamber, in this Australian parliament. It is now truly fit and proper that Professor Chow's legacy be recorded in the Hansard of the Senate at the heart of Australia's democracy. 
Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this Liberal government is now eight years old, and if it was a child, it would be in grade three. It would have lost some baby teeth. It would know how to read and write, and it would be learning some valuable life lessons. So let's look back on this eight-year-old government and see just how they're tracking against the key lessons that all Australians try to teach their children. Lesson one, actions speak louder than words. When the pandemic started, Prime Minister Morrison thanked our essential workers time and again. But the pandemic only magnified just how dangerous insecure work and low wages are and just how many essential workers are themselves insecure. So did the Prime Minister show his thanks with a good, secure jobs plan? No. Did he show his thanks with a rise in real wages? No. Did he show his thanks by fighting against wage theft? No, no, no. Instead, he introduced a bill to parliament that would have cut workers' wages and increased their job insecurity. Fail. Lesson two, take responsibility. We've seen over the past few years that Prime Minister Morrison is not a huge fan of this life lesson. On the devastating bushfires, he told us he doesn't hold a hose. On the tragic deaths in aged care last year, he told us that it's a problem for the states. On the alleged sexual assault of Brittany Higgins, metres from his office, he said he didn't know about it. On the allegations against Minister Porter, he said he didn't read them. On vaccines and quarantine facilities, again, it's a matter for the states. Whatever the situation, if it casts a bad light on himself or his government, Prime Minister Morrison refuses to take responsibility. So when we say, wash your hands, Prime Minister, we don't mean of everything. Lesson three, respect your elders. Aged care has been in crisis for so long now, long before the pandemic started, but the Morrison government has failed to act time and again for a sector in desperate need of help. They sat on report after report as the horror stories unfolded. Even today, after the Royal Commission and after the budget, there is still no plan to deliver the stable, well-trained workforce that must be the foundation of our aged care system. Workers are still in need of good, secure jobs, and there can be no solution to the aged care crisis without them. Our elders in aged care and the workers who care for them deserve so much better from this government. Fail. Lesson four, don't kick people while they're down. This has been a hard lesson for this government to learn. Robo-debt was introduced by the Prime Minister himself, a nasty scheme that targeted vulnerable Australians with illegal debt notices. It destroyed lives. It tragically led to suicides. The Liberals purposely targeted vulnerable Australians on income support and only stopped when they were dragged into court. They've now been forced to pay back $1.8 billion to the Australians they hounded. And last week, a judge described robo-debt as a shameful chapter, a massive failure, and hearing what he called heart-wrenching stories of pain and anguish from victims. Fail. Lesson five, learn from your mistakes. Well, after 21 breaches from hotel quarantine across the country, you would think that the Morrison government would realise that their approach is not working and that more needs to be done to keep Australians safe and to keep Australia running. You would think they would realise that it is time for them to step up and build safe, fit-for-purpose national quarantine facilities. Just as they were told by their hand-picked advisor, Jane Holton, last October to do. How many more breaches in hotel quarantine do we need to have before this government realises that it isn't working? How many more before they commit to building open-air facilities in every state and territory? Fail. Lesson six, be honest and tell the truth. Well, this one's been particularly tricky for the Morrison government. This government just hasn't been the most transparent and honest of governments, from sports rorts to safer seats rorts, from airport rorts to jobs for mates. This government seems to have a problem with honesty and transparency. And at eight years old, they have failed to establish the National Integrity Commission that Australians so want to see to help restore their faith in government. Fail. 
Lesson seven, value your education. Well, the Liberal government have slashed apprenticeships and have gutted funding from TAFEs right around Australia over their term in office. And last year, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, pushed through a bill that cut a billion dollars from university funding, put uni jobs at risk and doubled the cost of uni degrees for thousands of Australians, making it harder for people to even access university, especially women. Fail. Lesson eight, share. During the pandemic, Prime Minister Morrison was pushed into a nationwide wage subsidy for Australian workers and businesses. And who did he choose to exclude? Thousands of Australia's most insecure workers, casual workers, hospitality workers, gig workers, university workers and more. Workers in some of the hardest hit and most insecure industries. Yet big and profitable businesses like Harvey Norman were able to pocket JobKeeper and still don't have to repay the millions of dollars the government handed out to them. And after excluding so many insecure workers, Prime Minister Morrison then told them to smash open their piggy banks and raid their own super. So instead of sharing the burden equally uh, and instead of helping all Australians, he told some of the most insecure Australians to fund their own pandemic support. Fail. Lesson nine, treat others as you would want to be treated yourself. Well, apparently the Morrison government needs empathy training to understand this basic lesson that Australians try to teach their own children. Recently, Prime Minister Morrison couldn't even sympathise with Brittany Higgins until he looked at her through the lens of a father and uh, of his daughters. He still is actively supporting a known miscreant in his party room, Andrew Lamming, the member for Bowman, who harasses the women in his community that he is meant to represent. The Prime Minister speaks over women in his own party when they're being asked about women's issues within his government. And time and again, Prime Minister Morrison has failed to stand up for women. He has failed to stand up for the women in his party, for the women in this parliament and for the women of Australia. Fail, fail, fail. And lesson 10, apologise when you are in the wrong. Despite all the harm and all the hurt that this government has left in its wake, Saying sorry seems to be the hardest thing to do for the Morrison government. It's always, I regret, or I'm sorry you felt that way. Maybe one of these days they will finally learn the difference between skirting around the S word and a genuine apology, the genuine apology that so many Australians deserve from this government. The Morrison government have failed the basic tests we want all children to pass the tests that mean a child eventually grows up into a well-rounded adult, a responsible and kind person who treats people with respect and plays their part. So will this government ever grow up? Will they grow up and do better? Or can Australians just expect more of the same? A tax on wages and job security, a tax on vulnerable Australians, more rorts, more lies, more cover-ups, disrespect for the women of this country, more buck-passing and more blame-shifting. Australians have had enough of waiting for this eight-year government to finally grow up and to finally learn the life lessons that everyone else in our community seems to understand. Senator Stephen John. Thank you very much, Acting Chair. The National Disability Insurance Scheme was created to give disabled people what we need to live a good life, just like everyone else. Uh, it was supposed to be guided by our goals, our lived experience, uh, and informed by the expertise of the professionals that we know and trust. Now, the Liberal government is trying to undermine these key, key principles of how our NDIS works uh, to make it more difficult for disabled people to get the supports we need. If this wasn't bad enough, they are also trying to make it so that key NDIS decision makers no longer have to listen to the evidence provided by our trusted doctors and specialists. Instead, they want to force disabled people to be assessed by a stranger who is paid by a private corporation who has no understanding of the person they're assessing or their disability. Under these changes, it will be so much more difficult to get the funding for the supports you need. 
Now, we know that it doesn't have to be this way, that the Liberals can only make these changes if they are able to change the law. We know that disabled people across the country are united in a campaign uh, to prevent this from happening uh, and to protect the NDIS from the Morrison government and to ensure that every disabled person has what they need to live a good life, that the scheme works to that purpose. Today I want to take head on uh, one of the key justifications the government uh, has put forward uh, for the need uh, for these so-called changes, and that is the question of cost. Now, this government, which is very happy to fritter away tens of billions of dollars on defunct defence projects, has recently discovered a desire to rein in spending on certain projects and has taken aim at the NDIS. However, if we look at the actual figures of the cost of the agency, of the cost of this scheme, we see a very different story. Every single budget since the NDIS was created, up until the, 20, up until the last uh, two years of financial inf in information, every single one revealed a scheme that was running a significant underspend. There were very, very, very many good reasons uh, for the existence of this underspend, and at every point, disabled people and our organisations said clearly to the government, keep that money in the scheme. Save it for a rainy day so that if costs ever go up higher than expected, that money is there to cover that. Now, this underspend trend culminated in 2019 uh, with a $4.6 billion underspend in the scheme and what it actually cost in that year. And again, disabled people said very clearly to the government, keep that money in the scheme, because at some point it will be needed. And instead, the Morrison government made the decision to replace, to take that money and put it into general consolidated revenue, to put it back in the overall pot and not keep it aligned with the agency. Now, what happened the next year? Just as disabled people have predicted, the, the scheme ran at a slightly higher cost than was expected, about $1.1 billion. Now, the next year, this last budget, again, saw the scheme run a little higher than expected. Now, had the government listened to disabled people and retained that $4.6 billion within the scheme, then today, as we sit here, the NDIS would still be running under budget. The fact that it is running slightly above what it was projected to, slightly more than allocated to it, is a direct result of the Morrison government's decision in 2019 to take the underspent money, put it back into consolidated revenue, and why? So that they could have their back in black budget moment. So that Josh Frydenberg could sit there with his nice little black mug and pat themselves on the back. Everything beyond that moment in time, everything beyond uh, the last uh, set of figures that we've had uh, from the last budget speaking to the actualised cost of the NDIS, which again I cannot overstate, it runs at a, at a slight overspend because of a decision the Morrison government made, everything beyond that point are projections estimations, predictions. And so it is legitimate that the community of disabled people who are staring down the barrel of these terrifying changes being justified because of an increase in cost, in cost of the scheme wish to scrutinise the underlying assumptions that underpin those estimations and those protections. And it is uh, projections. And that is exactly what the disability community have asked the government for, have asked the agency for. We have said very clearly, give us your financial sustainability report, give us the assumptions which underpin your actuarial modelling. Now, why is it that we want those figures? Well, we want them because between October of last year and today, the government's projections of the cost of the NDIS have gone from at the cost of the NDIS in the forward years have gone from 25 billion dollars 
to $30 billion, to $40 billion as I sit here today. And when you have such wild increases in the projected cost of something, it is really quite reasonable to want to see the assumptions that underpin those projections, particularly when the supposed cost of this scheme and its increase between $25 billion and 40 has tracked perfectly with the pressure being applied to this government to drop these terrible changes to our NDIS, almost as though they were racking up the figures to try to pressure the crossbench into passing this legislation. Who would have thunk it from this mob? Now, I also want to make very clear that the proposed changes that the government are putting forward are very likely to have adverse consequences upon communities which they have not factored in, and one which gets very little coverage, but what is indeed, I think, critically important is the impact of these changes upon allied health professionals working in rural and regional communities. The government is proposing that allied health professionals be contracted to undertake so-called independent assessments of disabled people. These are physios, these are psychologists, these are occupational therapists, often who have never worked in these particular fields uh, with these particular participants. They are currently working right now in the mainstream of the allied health profession in rural and regional Australia, communities that we know are chronically understaffed and under-resourced by these professions. And it is the proposition of this government uh, that they would divert those allied health professionals from playing that generalised role to playing this specific role of functioning for the NDIS as assessors, meaning that there will be less of these professionals for the general community, something which has been flagged with us again and again by the peak bodies of these organisations. Now, in the final minutes, I want to also draw uh, the community's attention and the chamber's attention to the commentary of one Professor Bruce Bonhady, who is rightly regarded as the architect of the NDIS, who gave evidence before the inquiry into these changes and said very clearly that the cost pressures that do exist upon the scheme are the result of government inaction in relation uh, to the broader disability sector and what is needed to support disabled people that are not themselves NDIS participants. This government has had control of the agency almost since its exception and has comprehensively failed to develop the tier two supports that are needed to support people who are not themselves NDIS participants. Uh, Mr Bonahady drew our attention particularly uh, to the ways in which this a uh, series of changes conflicts with the original intent of the scheme, and he is right to have done that. But he also brings our attention to the fact that had the Morrison government done its job over the past seven years and worked with the states and territories to develop comprehensive alternatives to coming into contact with the NDIS, then there would not be the certain cost pressures that there are upon the scheme. The Morrison government is attempting to make their failures and their, decision, their decisions disabled people's problems, and that is not okay. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. So I've, I've been a little bit vocal of late around the NDIS and the proposed independent assessments, but the reality is that I have been vocal for a lot longer around the issue of autism. So today I wanted to personally thank all of the families of children with autism, all of the autistic adults who have written to me over the past couple of weeks thanking me for being in their corner. Their stories are like my family's. Concern for our children, what the future has in store for them. How can we best ensure that their life is filled with opportunity? But even more importantly than that, that it's filled with dignity. And one of the most concerning issues that I have had raised with me in a number of instances was that we're seeing that the NDIA is currently refusing to fund evidence 
and research-based best practice therapies for autism, claiming that they are not reasonable and necessary. I mean, seriously, best practice, globally recognised with evidence and research, not reasonable or necessary. I really would like to know what they consider is reasonable and necessary then. But what is actually more concerning when you consider this is the number of families who have now been forced to go to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. This is not being upheld as a decision. It's either sorted out before or, once it hits the tribunal, best practice, evidence and research-based behavioural interventions are deemed reasonable and necessary because they are best practice. So, at a time we're talking about sustainability of the scheme, of ensuring that it is there for the future of all people with a disability and, in fact, for all Australians, because you never know when you or a family member might require the scheme. But at a time we are talking about sustainability and costs, we are seeing costs being expended in fighting families who want best practice therapy for their children, who want to use evidence and research-based therapies, and forcing them through an expensive process at the administrative appeals tribunals with, of course, agency lawyers fighting against them. So what I thought I would do was go through and explain to people what best practice early intervention looks like for autism. This isn't my opinion. This isn't just my thoughts on the matter. This is something that is globally recognised. And we talk quite often about the US's health system not being as, as amazing and, and, uh, and uh, you know, that we're so fortunate to have universal health care here in Australia and they have an insurance uh, model over in the US. But the only therapy that is covered in every single state in the US by all insurers, absolutely in law, is best practice behavioural intervention known as ABA, Applied Behavioural Analysis. Now, I know there are people out there that are about to freak out because ABA has some connotations which are not founded in fact, are founded in thoughts and beliefs going back decades, but we might move to early intensive behavioural intervention as a name just to try and moderate the ABA hysteria. But if we go back to DSS, the government's own department, and we look at the good practice guidelines for autism, for some reason they change from best practice to good practice, but let's just stick with that. Under the Helping Children with Autism package, the only evidence research-based therapies that were approved were ABA and EIBI, Early Intensive Behavioural Intervention. You go to the Raising Children Network, again, the agency could just have a quick look it up because it's run by the government, up to speed, very, very well maintained site, great resource for parents of all children. And they actually have a tab there on the front page, autism and disability. You don't even have to go digging for it. When you click on that and you look at therapies, the very first therapy that comes up, apply behaviour analysis. But this is deemed, when parents ask for it, unreasonable and necessary. That is until it gets to the AAT and thankfully those families are receiving the funding. But if we want to look overseas, National Autism Centre, a very well respected agency in the United States, they actually listed 14 established interventions for children, adolescents but also young adults. And in fact, they also included intervention established and identified for adults. And every single one of them, and the very first one, but every single one of them, looks at behavioural interventions. And because most people don't understand what a behaviour is, people think a behaviour is a tantrum. You're having a bad day and you have a little bit of a wobble, that's a bit of behaviour. A behaviour is everything we do. A behaviour is washing your hands, something we've been encouraging people to do a lot of recently. But I bet most people don't know there's nine steps to washing your hands. And when kids with autism are taught to wash their hands, we teach them in a way called backward chaining. So we, we reinforce positively, we reward, we celebrate them getting the step right. So we start with drying in the hands, because that's the last step. 
and we teach them backwards as we go through every step. The only thing we don't teach backwards is riding a bike because you've got to put your helmet on first. So there is a little safety element to it. But you know, even in Australia recently, there's been a study, research done, in a bid to debunk this obsession that ABA or behavioural interventions are somehow a form of torture. And Monash University, along with the uh, Autism Behavioural Intervention uh, Association (ABIA), have done a study. And I don't have time today to run through all of it, but I would like to, to just highlight a couple of things for you. Because one of the things we hear is that ABA and behavioural interventions are clinic-based; that somehow they're not natural. They don't occur in the home or the natural environment. Now. When this survey was done of both practitioners and families and participants, 88 per cent of therapy is actually done in the home. Now, I would have thought that's a pretty natural setting where you can teach kids what they need to learn. Not in a clinic, not in a centre, in the home. But clinic-based programs play a really vital role as well. And the reason that they are so important is one of the things we do see with families with autism, but also families more broadly with a disability, very, very often one of the parents is forced out of work. I know this. When we ran our intensive early intervention program, I didn't work. I worked from, you know, worked from home, set up an autism charity, didn't get paid for a few years. It's pretty difficult when you're funding an incredibly expensive intensive early intervention program, but that's the sacrifices that the families made pre-NDIS, and it's sacrifices that families continue to make even with the NDIS. But they certainly don't need the additional hurdle of being told that best practice therapy is not reasonable or necessary. So you might ask why would the agency oppose this? Considering this is an insurance scheme, invest early, better outcomes. Now Synergy Economics have done a research project on this and what they established, every dollar we spend on early intensive early intervention will save the community $11. Every dollar will save $11 over the course of the life of that child. It adds up to a saving of almost $2 million per child if we give the intensive, quality, early intervention that's required. And why would they oppose a therapy that actually takes data every session? Every session. There's no wrong answer. They either get it right or they're prompted to do it. So there's no right or wrong. No one's punishing the child. But we have data. So when we're teaching them to hold a pencil, or put their pants on, or toilet train, or sit at the dinner table and use a fork, we take data every step of the way. So why wouldn't an agency that is fundamentally giving taxpayers' monies to families and people with a disability want to see what they're getting for their buck? I would have thought that would have been a logical therapy option for them to look at. But I would like to just point out some of the detractors are vicious and unnecessarily mean-spirited, and that is the nicest way I can put it, because I've received letters telling me that my son's more susceptible to being sexually abused because he had best practice therapy, that they hope he, hate, he grows up to hate me and not speak to me anymore because of the best practice therapy that he received, and that somehow I inflicted torture. Well, I know a number of people in this chamber know the relationship I have with my son. And uh, I think we can all agree that he's probably ridiculously spoiled. He is my favourite human in the world, and I would do anything for him to give him the best opportunity at life. So this is the best practice therapy, and it's about time we recognised it and fund it properly. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I want to thank um, Senator Hughes and Senator Steelejohn for their contributions um, in regards to the NDIS. I know their personal advocacy um, is recognised by members across this chamber. Um, and working uh, with them on the Community Affairs Committee, I've learnt a lot more about the NDIS, but I'm sure there's a lot more for me to learn and a lot of questions for the government to answer about changes that are being proposed. Um, last week, Madam Acting Deputy President, I was lucky enough to watch State of Origin, Game 1, in a brand new North Queensland stadium. I want to congratulate the town of Townsville, especially the Mayor, Jenny Hill, on the success of the event, despite the score which we will not mention today. But every time I visit Townsville, 
I get asked one very important question, and this visit was no different. Every time I visit Townsville, I get asked, where is the $195 million of funding that the member for Herbert, Philip Thompson, to committed to Townsville at the last election? Let me be very clear about this funding and about how it has been misconstrued through uh, comments by the member for Herbert about whether he is responsible for delivering this funding. Here's a brief history of the funding and the announcements. In 2019, the LNP promised this funding before the last election to build stage two of the Horton Pipeline, a $195 million election promise to win the seat of Herbert. At one stage, the member for Herbert actually pulled support for this project uh, after, shortly after he was elected in an embarrassing Facebook video that he later had to retract. The federal government refused to provide the funding with no strings at attached to the state government. So the state government decided that they would step in themselves and fund the pipeline directly. It has now been over 300 days since the member for Herbert said that funding would remain in Townsville, that that $195 million would still go to projects and jobs in Townsville. But despite that commitment, not a single dollar of that funding has been committed to a single project, and not a single job has been created. This is more than two years after this commitment was made to the people of Townsville. Mr Thompson told the Townsville Bulletin a few months ago that he had the new set of projects, that the money was ready to go, but the state Labor government was holding it up for political reasons. Give me a break. At the last department at Senate estimates, we asked the department if this was the case, and surprise, surprise, they have seen the list of projects, but those projects have not received final approval from the federal government. The answer was clearly no. The, the member for Herbert is incorrect in saying that the money is being held up for political reasons. They haven't even provided final approval yet. In fact, there isn't even a timeline yet of when it might be approved. And again, embarrassingly for Mr Thompson, he was forced to agree with these assumptions in the Townsville Bulletin when he confirmed that the projects had not been finally reviewed. So Mr Thompson has not only not delivered on his big election promise, but he's been running around telling his constituents that the state government ate his homework and actually, it's not his fault that he has not delivered on the promise that he made. Why has there been such a, f a monumental failure to the people of Townsville? Why is it that this funding cannot be delivered by Mr Thompson and by the LNP, despite the big promises made before the election? Well, I believe that it's because Mr Thompson is Mr Morrison's mate in Canberra and not a friend of Townsville's. You see, he likes to pick fights in Townsville with state MPs and then come to Canberra and use parliamentary privilege to slag off state MPs about state-based issues. He does that a lot. He picks a lot of fights. But when it comes to the things that he has promised Order. and that he has delivered, when it comes to picking fights on behalf of Townsville, for the things that he's responsible for, well, that simply doesn't happen. Mr Thompson has been absolutely pathetic, in my opinion, about this funding and whether it should be delivered by the federal government. He is happy to keep the Prime Minister happy but disappoint his constituents. Again, not my word. Mr Thompson said that he is disappointed himself in his own failure. Last week at The Origin in Townsville, Mr Thompson posted a photo of what can only be described as a weird fanboy moment, FaceTiming Scott Morrison at the football. Well, wouldn't you think that if Mr Thompson can FaceTime the Prime Minister at the footy, why can't he get the Prime Minister on the phone, face to face, or even FaceTime his best mate, Mr Morrison, and demand that this funding be delivered. In the two years since he's been elected, he has failed to do that. 
Townsville deserves an MP that will actually fight for them, not lay down because your mate the Prime Minister has decided that North Queensland, or more specifically, Townsville isn't a priority right now. When it comes to Medicare, aged care, cashless debit card or the NDIS, people in Townsville need to know whether Mr Thompson has their back or Mr Morrison's back. Because we know that this government sent robo-debt notices to people in Townsville in the aftermath of the floods. That's what they did to people in Townsville. We know that this government is attacking Medicare. We know that they failed to deliver vaccinations to aged care workers. We know, as we've heard today, that they're making fundamental changes to the NDIS in a region where it's already difficult to get NDIS services. And we know that there is the potential for this government to roll out the cashless debit card to more regions and to pensioners. So people in Queensland need to know and people in Townsville need to know that Mr Thompson has their back. And what we clearly know from what has happened with the Horton Pipeline funding, that that is not the case. This tired eight-year-old government is just one inadequacy after the next. The LNP is dangerously slow when it comes to the vaccine rollout in this country. We know that thanks to Scott Morrison's abysmal vaccine rollout, the national borders are going to remain closed for far longer than they should be. Now, nobody here thinks that the borders should be opened uh, aside from health advice. Everyone respects that health advice, but the health advice is determined by our vaccine rollout. We know that. While the rest of the world begins to open up thanks to high uptake of vaccines, Australia will be losing billions upon billions of dollars in tourism revenue thanks to the LNP's not a race strategy. Well, I can tell you, regional Queenslanders, it is a race. Getting vaccines out is a race because we've been in this pandemic for more than a year. And the Prime Minister still can't get quarantine right and he still can't get, get vaccines right. There is no more excuses anymore for the Prime Minister's failure to step up and do his job on vaccines and quarantine. The budget made an assumption about when the vaccine rollout would allow for the borders to open and it wasn't until mid next year. So that means a year from now, Tourism operators in regional Queensland will still be waiting. Will still be waiting for international visitors to visit them. And this prime minister says that the vaccine rollout isn't a race. What we want to see from the members opposite and from the members in the place there isn't patting Mr. Morrison on the back for his failures, isn't protecting Mr. Morrison for his failures but standing up for your communities and doing what you were meant to do, elected for your communities, to support your communities through this. It is not acceptable that this government has failed to roll out the vaccine quick enough to make sure that we keep up with the rest of the world. Now, we get a lot of comparisons with the rest of the world, and this government likes to make them often. But what we know is that other countries are opening up and that international tourism operators in Cairns will be left behind if this government does not successfully deliver a quarantine program and a vaccine program that means that we are ahead of the race. We should be at the front of the race, not the back of the race. We were always told by this government that we were at the front of the queue, well, we are at the back of the queue, and people in Queensland are catching on. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Thank you Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I'd like to take this opportunity to update the Senate on matters relating to my legal appeal against Prime Minister Morrison's attempt to apply cabinet secrecy to block uh, scrutiny of the national cabinet decision-making on Australia's COVID-19 response. As some senators will be aware, I've appealed to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal against the decision by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet under the Freedom of Information Act 1984 uh, to withhold from release minutes of the so-called National Cabinet. The Department, in accordance with the Prime Minister's assertion that National Cabinet is part of the Federal Cabinet, has withheld the minutes of National Cabinet on the grounds that they are Cabinet documents that are entirely and unconditionally exempt 
from FOI release. The reasons behind that assertion were entirely political. Fearful that aspects of Australia's COVID-19 response would prove politi politically contentious, the Prime Minister wanted to cloak national decision-making in absolute secrecy. The Prime Minister did not ask the parliament to change the law. He just declared that National Cabinet was to be part of the Federal Cabinet and, as such, exempt under Cabinet Secrecy Exemption of the FOI Act. And indeed, the basis of uh, purported uh, public interest immunity claims made to the Senate's COVID committee. The matter was deemed uh, of such significance that it was heard by Federal Court Justice Richard White on the 19th of May. We are now awaiting his honour's decision. Senators should be aware that this is no run-of-the-mill AAT case. The issues that we argued before the tribunal go to the very heart of the responsible cabinet government in Australia. At the centre of the proceedings is the Prime Minister's assertion, defended in sworn affidavits by senior officers of his department, most notably the Secretary of PMNC, Mr Phil Gachins, that the Prime Minister has absolute authority to determine the membership, structure and meetings of the cabinet without regard for long-established cabinet conventions and practices. Because it is, it, that is precisely what the Prime Minister has done in claiming that the National Cabinet is part of the Federal Cabinet and consequently is covered by absolute secrecy exemptions under FOI laws. National Cabinet is comprised of a single Commonwealth Minister, the Prime Minister, the Premiers of the States and the Chief Ministers of the Territories. Unlike the Federal Cabinet, or for that matter state cabinets, the National Cabinet is not a meeting of ministers who are ministers of a single government and collectively responsible to a single parliament. All conventions of cabinet government of collective responsibility and confidentiality revolve around the core concept that cabinet is a collective, a council of ministers who form a single government responsible to a single parliament. Now, cabinet is not mentioned in the Australian Constitution and it's barely mentioned in legislation, indeed only in the FOI Act and the Archives Act. But cabinet uh, government is a political institute that uh, predates our federation. It goes back to King George II and it's operated uh, in accord with well-established conventions throughout our life as a nation. Cabinet is a political mechanism that seeks to reconcile the individual responsibilities of ministers for the administration of their departments with the collective uh, accountability to the parliament. A gathering of a body such as National Cabinet, a meeting of federal, state and territory heads of government, is quite outside what has been understood to be cabinet for well over a century. And as the AAT proceedings showed, while National Cabinet is nothing special as an, in, uh, as an intergovernmental body, arguably it is just the Council of Australian Governments by another name. But it is quite without precedence that it is claimed to be part of the Federal Cabinet. The officers of the Prime Minister's Department did try to claim some historical precedence, but they were obliged to concede uh, in the hearing that their scholarship was quite incorrect. In the end, the government's defence of its claim was left rest solely on the assertion of the Prime Minister and his advisers, and those claims sound very much like the logic of Humpty Dumpty in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. In that wonderful, surreal classic, Humpty Dumpty declares, when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Alice replies, the question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. Humpty Dumpty replies, the question is which is to be the master, that's all. And that is the question here. The Prime Minister claims he is the absolute master, able to define cabinet government however he likes to suit his political purposes. Can the PM say that cabinet is whatever it wants to be? Or do the conventions that have uh, for so long defined cabinet as a collective of ministers 
impose some fundamental restraint on the PM's political authority. Because if the PM's position is accepted that he has absolute discretion to define the federal cabinet in any way he, he uh, thinks deems fit, a severe blow will have been dealt against the long-established conventions of responsible cabinet government in Australia. If it is accepted that meetings at which just one federal minister is present, even if, it's just, even if it is the prime minister, he can deem that to be a cabinet meeting, then it's open for the prime minister to declare any meeting with uh, just about anyone as a cabinet meeting, shrouded, shrouded in secrecy. Meetings be between the PM and lobbyists or political donors could be deemed cabinet meetings. Such a state of affair would unquestionably undermine our democratic parliamentary system. It remains to be seen what Justice White will decide in this landmark case. There will also be questions of whether, he, uh, whether his decision, whichever way it goes, will be appealed to the full federal court or eventually even to the High Court. PM and C, in, an, in their submissions, foreshadowed such an event. Whatever the outcome, whether or not our Humpty Dumpty PM is knocked off his pedestal, this has, to, uh, has been and will continue to be an important fight for me. Freedom of information is absolutely critical for political transparency, accountability and the preservation of, responsibility, of responsible government. It's about making sure uh, not just members and senators but also members of the public can participate in our democracy in an informed way. It provides them a mechanism of oversight, of scrutiny. It allows them to congratulate and to criticise. It's extremely important and therefore this is a continuing battle that I uh, will always fight to protect the integrity of our democracy. Now, in conclusion, I'd like to thank my legal representatives, Senior Counsel Geoffrey Watson and Counsel Diana Tang, for assisting pro bono in this important transparency fight. Their finely honed arguments have been impressively effective in forensically demolishing claims made by the Prime Minister's representatives. They could have been uh, doing other highly paid work, but they chose to weigh in and help me in this important battle to protect our system of responsible democratic government. Many thanks again to, Je to Geoffrey and Diana. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to pay tribute to a man who made an incredible contribution to my home state of Queensland and to my party, and that is Sir Llewellyn Roy Edwards, AC. Sir Lou first left school at 15 and started out as an electrician, working in the family business in Ipswich. A few years later, a fall from a ladder would see him in hospital with a broken back. He spent his time recovering hospital thinking, and he decided to change the course of his life. He finished school and he went on to study medicine and become a doctor. And it was while he was working as a, a local GP in Ipswich that another great of Queensland politics, Sir Gordon Chalk, paid him a visit and convinced him to run for state parliament and to run for the seat of Ipswich. And while he was considered an outside chance, Ipswich is, is Labor heartland, his personal popularity and respect in the community saw him defy the political odds of the day and become the first Liberal member for Ipswich in 1972. The 1970s and 1980s was a time when Queensland was coming to its own, and Sir Lou was a steady hand on, on the tiller. He was promoted to become the state's health minister in 1974 before, coming, before going on to become deputy premier, premier and treasurer, working with the great Sir Joe. Quite yet determined, Sir Lou was a true coalitionist working with colleagues across the political spectrum to modernise the health system and invest in regional hospitals to build the roads and dams that would help our state prosper for decades. Salou was a, a builder of modern Queensland. Salou knew that Queensland was brimming with potential, full of passionate people and brilliant ideas, a place blessed not just with good weather and plenty of bananas, but with a great story to tell 
and an exciting future of headed. Salou knew that the best days of Queensland were in the future. So he took that opportunity to share that story with the world when he left Parliament in 1983 and he became CEO and chairman of Expo 88, an event that would capture the imagination of a generation and transform Brisbane from a big country town to an ever-growing city. And I can remember driving with my parents down from Innisfail to visit Expo 88. And, and for those of that age, you get a passport. And, and being the, the cheeky kid that I was, I learnt that if you, didn't, if you didn't go in the front entrance of all the exhibits, you could go in the back entrance and still get your passport stamped without having to go through the rigmarole of going through all the displays. Salou went on to use his expertise in, in private enterprise, most notably his work as a director of James Hardy Industries and chairman of the Medical Research and Compensation Foundation, established to compensate asbestos victims. In 1993, he was elected the 12th Chancellor of his alma mater, the University of Queensland, a role he held to 2009. In that time, he shook the hands of no less than 88,000 excited graduates at graduation ceremonies. Fittingly, a building at the University of St Lucia's campus is named in honour of his contribution. Salou was a giant of my party and, more importantly, a giant of Queensland politics, a true gentleman of the old school who had no concept of prejudice. He offered wise counsel to many and extended a warm greeting to all. He leaves a truly incredible legacy that his loving family attribute to hard work, sacrifice and a dedication to community service. So on behalf of, of my party, the, the Liberal National Party, thank you, Salou, for your vision, your determination and your service to the people of Queensland. Now, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President, what are we going to do about the ABC? What are we going to do about the taxpayer-funded Australian Broadcasting Corporation? This ABC, this ABC has become this mosh pit of Labor Green wokeness. The ABC needs to be urgently reformed to save itself. Because at the moment, the ABC seems to be run by a staff-based workers' collective who are in control of the joint, a cabal who demand diversity except when it comes to diversity of political opinions. And the ABC needs to understand you know, this workers' collective who are running this billion-dollar taxpayer-funded organisation that taxpayers are sick of funding this opinionated gobby blob. Twenty years ago, disaffected viewers of the ABC had no choice where they could go. There was little plurality in the media market. And what the ABC failed to understand is that centre-right listeners and viewers now have options. We can go to streaming services. We can go to Sky News. We can go to the web to get our news sources. And so the ABC fails to understand that it is losing generations of centre-right thought leaders. The Australian Broadcasting Corporation is no longer becoming or no longer the national broadcaster. Indeed, it is becoming sort of the un-Australian national broadcaster, a broadcaster who only accept views of the, of the centre-left or the far-left. Now, I am a fan of the ABC and I have a three-point plan to help save the ABC from itself. Now, we need to sell all of their inner city, off inner city offices, sell the headquarters in Brisbane, in Sydney at Ultimo and down in Melbourne, sell them off, move the staff to the regions or to the suburbs. And I notice that today the ABC have said they're shifting 300 staff from Ultimo to, to Parramatta. Well, that's a, that's a good start. They get like a, a half a tick for that but shift all the staff from Ultimo, sell the building. Look, I'll put an ad on Gumtree and, and sell it, or the trading post. It's worth about $300 million. Now, we need to review the ABC Act and Charter to make it fit for purpose. But in the meantime, let's sell Triple J. Triple J, as ABC keeps telling us, does quite well on the ratings. Well, brilliant. If it, is, it, if it was designed to um, to fill a gap in the market, and if the market is happy to pay for it, well, also let's put Triple J on uh, on the Trading Post or, or Gumtree and sell it off, because the taxpayers don't need to fund it. But we should also put 
ads on the ABC. If the ABC is that good, let commercial businesses and commercial operators put ads on the ABC, as what we've done with, with the SBS, to take the burden off the taxpayers. We should also open up staff recruitment. Because this goes to an early comment. The ABC seems to believe in diversity, and they're very good at making sure that they talk about how, how diverse they are, but they're not diverse when it comes to, to their staff selection. And I'm sure there are many good and great people who work in the ABC, but they all tend to be left wing. They all tend to be quite left wing. And it's, it's, there used to be a, pro, there used to be a, a kids program or a, a game called Where's Wally? Well, you try and find um, in the ABC where the poor conservative is. Well, they're all hiding in a closet somewhere or they're not even in the building. And the issue is with the ABC is we need to make sure we need to make sure that the ABC reflects modern Australia because this bumbling, burbling, taxpayer-funded, sneering, tweeting blob takes the taxpayer for granted. And on behalf of the taxpayers of Australia, I'm saying enough is enough. If the ABC is not going to represent all of Australia, well, it is time for reform. And if people aren't going to reform the ABC, then it's time to send the ABC to the knacker's yard. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Stirl. What a segue. Is that what the word is? Oh, goodness me. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Oh, where do I begin? Oh, no, actually, I'm going to talk about something good. I've got something really good to contribute. Madam Acting Deputy President, look, it gives me great pleasure to share this information with the Senate and those all, all out there in Australia listening. But I've had the pleasure over the last couple of weeks of running around Perth with a little truck picking up second-hand furniture. And as those in this place know that I do do a uh, charity run up to Kununurra each year where I work closely with Paige McLaughlin and Revive and East Kimberley Job Pathways where we transport pre-loved furniture that no normally ends up in um, landfill and it goes up to Revive where it's done up, repairs are made, whatever, it's sold through their front, their shop front. And it gives local people in the East Kimberley an opportunity to access uh, very, very cheap furniture because they don't have that ability. It's 3,000 odd kilometres from Perth. Could you imagine what it cost by the time they did buy new furniture and then sh and transported it up there? But as part of my um, uh, last couple of weeks' work before I got back here, I had the opportunity to go on Radio 6PR with uh, Steve Mills, and every West Australian knows Steve Mills. And I've known Millsy for a number of years, both as he's congratulating me and both as he's given me one hell of a grilling. And nothing changes with Millsy. He is a true, true voice of the people. But Millsy gave me the opportunity to talk about what I've also been up to and what I did do in a, in a recent visit to Fitzroy Crossing, where I have been a regular visitor for the last 30 years. I had the privilege in, uh, to catch up with my very dear friend, Emily Carter. Now, Emily runs Man in Wana Takira Women's Resource Centre. She's done a magnificent job. And for those of us who have been around for a long time, we remember Emily's fine work along with June Oscar when, against uh, all odds, moved to reduce the sale of full-strength takeaway alcohol in the Fitzroy Valley. So um, uh, well, I sat with uh, uh, Emily there about a month ago and said, look, how's things going? It shouldn't come as a shock to us, but it is a shock when Emily said, you know, you know what they would give to be able to get hold of beds, because in the Fitzroy, not just limited to Fitzroy in the Valley and the 17 communities around there, but what we take for granted each night we go home to a bed, clean set of sheets and a blanket or electric blanket, wherever we may be, there are many, many, many people sleeping rough in the Kimberley, our Indigenous population. And I'm not just talking uh, kids and, uh, you know, and we're not just talking adults, but we're talking old people who don't have a bed, who may just sleep on a piece of foam on, on concrete uh, or on the floor in a house. So what's happened is when I spoke to Millsy, I'd shared what I wanted my dream was to let's stop throwing beds away. Long as they're not torn, long as they're not soiled badly, we can put them to good use because I have got great friends in the transport industry that assist me with this. 
and I received a phone call from a gentleman and he offered me a hundred brand new mattresses, brand new king and queen mattresses, which I thought was a magnificent uh, um, uh, donation. I was, I was absolutely wrapped. And uh, we'll be picking them up in one of our semis in the next couple of weeks when we leave here. But I also got a phone call from my friend, my very, very dear friend, who works for another friend of mine, uh, the um, uh, Quinn Liven family who own the OBH Hotel in Cottesloe, Senator Brockman, you would know. And they've kindly donated 40 bunk not that you're always frequenting the OBH, but every West Aussie. Yeah, everyone knows the OBH, okay? And they have a, a part of the OBH, they have a backpackers, which I didn't even know. And there's 40 bunk beds and mattresses, all in great condition. My mates have been down there today to check it all out. They've got 40 single beds on top of that, they, uh, sorry, 10 single beds. They've also got another 10 double beds, all in great condition, all with um, mattress liners, all with pillows, all with um, uh, blankets and sheets that they are kindly donating for this run to Fitzroy. So this may seem like a, uh, you know, a big deal. Well, it is a big deal. For the people of Fitzroy, it's a massive deal. And I delivered that message to Emily last week when I was up in um, um, Fitzroy, to which they're running through the Fitzroy Valley doing an audit of who wants a bed, who's going to get a bed, which kids, which old people. Something as simple as that, something that we just put out on the curb. We can't give it away. No one wants these, these uh, pieces of furniture. But to think what joy that may bring a child or an older person to think that for the, for the first time in their life or for a very, very long time, they're actually going to get a bed, they're going to get off the floor, they're going to get sheets and pillows and blankets. So I want to thank very much uh, David, to you mate, the OBH, I really appreciate that, to my friend who donated the 100 beds, who, who does not want any recognition. You know who you are and I thank you sincerely from the bottom of my heart. And the beauty of it is we'll be carting that up uh, in three, four weeks' time on our way to Kununurra. So just touching on that too, I've got two full road trains, so four semi-trailers going up. Uh, part of the deal is I get the drive one, so there's no downside there. So out comes the boots and the old uh, shirt with no sleeves on. Uh, but I want to take the opportunity to sincerely thank my dear friends in the road transport industry that make this dream come true, who make this possibility in the Kimberley something that we take for granted as life-changing. To you, Arthur, at ACFS Port Logistics, mate, you've been there from the beginning. Thank you so much for your kind donation. Arthur donates a brand new prime mover that I get to pedal up. He chucks a fuel card at us and, we, uh, and, and off we go. My, my very dear friend of over 40 years now, Nick Dadama, at Keys Moving Solutions. Uh, without you, Nick, and your team, mate, I don't know what I'd do. Nick's one of those ones where nothing's impossible. Nick is uh, a, a part of the Kimberley and part of the Pilbara as the largest family-owned, or, or should say privately-owned, furniture removal business in uh, Western Australia. And Nick donates the trailers. Nick donates the storage space. Nick donates the containers when I need them. Nick donates his uh, staff, who are my mates as well, to help me load. Uh, nothing's out of uh, Nick's uh, realm of possibility. Nothing, absolutely nothing, uh, stops Nick being part of this. And for that, Nick, good on you, mate. And this year, Nick, I uh, hope he's going to join me because he's going to be peddling one of the prime movers as well. Uh, also, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank my dear friends at Centurion Transport, and they are a massive uh, transport company. They've celebrated their 50th anniversary this year, and I go back to the days of the founders of Carl and Frank Kadachi. And uh, Carl, you are still a mate of mine, and it was great to have you join me last week coming through the Kimberley to see what we do. And not your first trip, but your second trip. So Centurion and through Carl's son Justin, who now runs the trucking business, they've got a thousand full-time employees. They have 2,000 assets out on the highway. Uh, they run everywhere between Western Australia, the Northern Territory and Queensland. Justin, thank you, mate, for your support. Uh, Justin did say to me, he'd throw, me, he'd throw at me one of his brand new SARs. He did say it's got 18 gears at the moment, but he did also uh, say, still, by the time he gets back to Perth, I hope it's still 18 gears. I'll do my best, Justin. We'll make sure that uh, it gets up there and intact. Also, uh, another dear friend of mine, Cam Dumnancy, the CEO of the Western Roads Federation. Cam, for your support. Thank you, mate. And it'll lead me just back on to um, when we went on the radio and said we wanted, you know, we wanted some uh, pre-loved furniture and preferably beds. It was a great idea at the time, but I found myself uh, parking up my uh, suit and my uh, barter scouts last uh, two weeks ago to put on the boots and with my mates, and I thank my son who also helps out too, we did 46 
pickups around the metropolitan area. We have another 19 we still have to do on top of that. And for every bit of furniture that is donated that may be someone's rubbish, I can't thank you enough for the smiles that you put on the faces of the recipients in the Kimberley, in the East Kimberley. And as I'd said before, for those of us that have been sheltered living in capital cities, when we talk about the East Kimberley, when we talk about people having access to something that we take for granted, when they actually drive from uh, Columbaroo, for those who don't know, 12-hour drive from Columbaroo to uh, to uh, Kununurra to try and purchase second-hand furniture from Wyndham, from Warman, from Halls Creek, from as far south as Balgo, all to go to Kununurra to get the opportunity to purchase cheap furniture. But there's another there's another kicker here, because through East Kimberley Job Pathways and Paige and her team, every single cent that is made in profit at the Revive Store or the Mango Way workshop goes back into training Indigenous youth, Indigenous men and women, to give them the opportunity to get off of welfare. And there is no greater thing when I meet all the crew up there, and there was with me last week was about eight or nine of them, who proudly, proudly look nothing better than to pull on their, their EKJP shirt or their Wunan shirt or their Revive shirt to get up in the morning and go off and work. And part of that work also gives them the opportunity to use the skills that they are taught in welding and in furniture restoration. So to Paige, I say it once again, to Michelle Pucci, the CEO of East Kimberley Job Pathways, and to my very, very, very dear and close friend, Ian Trust from Wunan Foundation, it's the least we can do. And I know that when we roll into town, we're treated like uh, royalty. And you know what? It would be lovely if we had the opportunity. And I know that I've been asked. I've now got other transport companies who have now contacted me to say, how can we roll this out in other places around Australia? So the challenge is there. If anyone wants to kick off and do something really great in remote and rural Australia, I've got the model and we've got the contacts. Thanks, Mr. President. Here, here. Senator Brockman. Short time we have remaining, Mr. President, to pay a tribute across the chamber. It doesn't happen very often, but we just heard Order. a contribution there from Senator Stirl, which demonstrates some of the remarkable charity work that he is doing. And, and I'll make you this offer. I suspect you and I are the only two people with a heavy combination licence in the chamber, mate. So I'll make you the offer. Oh, it's three. Sorry, Senator Gallagher. Uh, uh, Senator Dunningham, do you have one as well? You, you've got a truck licence. <laughs> I, 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 I thought he was perhaps indicating that he had one as well. But if, if, you, need, if you need an extra driver, Senator Stirl, as you head up north, I'm more than happy to get behind the wheel and give you a hand. And uh, in, in the 12 seconds I have remaining, for all of those in the eastern states with a truck licence, there's plenty of jobs in Western Australia, so come west. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Being 2 p.m., questions without notice. Senator Walsh. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday, the minister asserted that, and I quote, every aged care worker who wants access to a vaccine right now has access to a vaccine right now. Does the minister stand by his statement? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Yes, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator Walsh, for the question. Yes, I do stand by my statement. Senator Walsh, supplementary question. Yesterday, the Victorian government was forced to stop bookings for the Pfizer vaccine, including for aged care workers, due to constraints of the supply of the Commonwealth program. Can the minister confirm that not all aged care workers who want a vaccine right now can access one? Order. Order. I'll call Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Walsh, for the question. Um, and I, I do, uh, do confirm that they have, support, have availability. Uh, and so I have a, a text message from uh, Minister Foley from Victoria, who I contacted when I saw a story in The Guardian earlier in the day that was reporting that that was the case. Uh, and Minister Foley says, not right, they are wrong. They still have priority. It's nonsense. We will get on to them. So, Minister Foley, Mr. President, Minister Foley, Minister Foley is order. going to order. So, order. so Mr. President, order. Um, aged care workers, aged care order. workers continue to have access. In fact, they have priority access directly, directly from 
uh, the Victorian Minister, who I have to say I thank for his cooperation Order. and also my conversation earlier with Minister Donnellan. We continue to work very, very cooperatively with the Victorian Government Order. to ensure Senator the rollout Colbeck, and time the workforce for the and aged care has remain— expired. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Yesterday, this minister conceded the Morrison government has had to firstly reassess our vaccine rollout, secondly again re-pivot the rollout and finally reset the vaccine rollout for the aged care work workforce on a number of occasions. Given the Victorian government's decision as a result of supply constraints of the Commonwealth, has the Morrison government had to reassess, re-pivot and reset its rollout yet again? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Um, the, prob the problem of reading a set question after not listening to the uh, answers to the previous two questions, Mr. President, as I've clearly Order. articulated and have ca had confirmed by the Victoria Minister, the, the workers in Victoria continue to have priority access to vaccines. It is a pity, Mr. President, uh, that uh, the Senator didn't take notice of the first questions that we answered. We continue to work. We continue to work very cooperatively with the Victorian government in the interests of getting aged care workers vaccinated, uh, and we will continue to do that, Mr. President. It is a pity. It is a pity that the Labor Party here in Canberra continue to try and undermine, continue to try Order. and undermine the confidence Order. in the uh, vaccination rollout process for their own political purposes, Mr. President. They continue to make Order. these these Order. disgraceful, these disgraceful accusations Order. Mr. President, that are simply Sorry. not Order. Senator true. Senator Wong, there is too much noise in the chamber. There is too much noise in the chamber. I was repeatedly calling senators to order. Order. Senator, all, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, please. Senator Henderson. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister please explain to the Senate how the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement enhances and strengthens Australia's economic recovery? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Smith for his question. I know that Senator Smith, uh, like all coalition senators, but perhaps none more so than Senator Smith, uh, welcomes the in-principle agreement of the Australia-United Kingdom Free Trade Agreement. And indeed, Senator Wong, I, I have no doubt that Senator Smith will be sending a tariff-free bottle uh, of Australian craft-made gin for Her Majesty any time soon. But seriously, Mr President, I am pleased to confirm that Australia and the UK have reached in principle agreement in relation to this free trade agreement. A free trade agreement that will once again deliver more jobs for Australians, more opportunities for Australian exporters and bring both our countries closer together in this current strategic challenging environment. This was an agreement negotiated from scratch in record time, reflecting the close affinity of our two nations and the robust industrial logic of the agreement that has been delivered. This free trade agreement is the right deal for both Australia and the UK, providing each of our nations with greater access to a range of high-quality products, greater access for businesses and workers, greater access for quality services exchange, driving economic growth and job creation. It is significant that the UK turned to Australia to negotiate its first bilateral agreement since leaving the European Union. The UK is already Australia's fifth largest trading partner in 2019-20, with two-way trade worth $36.7 billion, the second largest source of investment stock value, valued at $738 billion. And pleasingly, under this agreement, the UK will liberalise Australian imports into the UK, with 99 per cent of Australian goods set to enter the UK duty-free. This is good news for our farmers, our businesses and Australian jobs. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Mr President, can the minister advise how this free trade agreement demonstrates the coalition government's broader commitment to free trade? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, this agreement does build on a tremendous record of delivering expanded trade opportunities for Australian exporters, for Australian farmers and small businesses across the nation. 
Under the coalition, 10 free trade agreements have been concluded, growing the coverage of Australian exports that enjoy preferential access into international export markets from around 26 per cent of exports when we were elected to office to now around 75 per cent of Australia's exports that will enjoy that market advantage in international export markets as a result of these trade agreements. These free trade agreements with our major trading partners, be they the North Asian partners, be they the recently concluded and entered into force agreement with Indonesia, be they the multi-party agreements such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or indeed our close partnership with our Pacific Island partners, all of them enhancing opportunities for economic growth across these partners. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline to the Senate what are the benefits of free trade to Australia and to every Australian? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, enhanced export opportunities create more jobs for more Australians. All of the research shows they generate more high-paying Australian jobs and, in doing so, help to create the business and economic strength and resilience to fund the essential services that all Australians rely upon. Australian businesses that export on average hire 23 per cent more staff, pay 11 per cent higher wages and have labour productivity 13 per cent higher than non-exporters. Trade of goods and services represented some 40 per cent of Australia's GDP in 2020. We have delivered time and again in terms of expanding the choice and range of opportunities for Australian exporters. Our government has made sure that we expand those opportunities across our near region of ASEAN nations, across our broader region in North Asia, across the Pacific uh, with new trade agreements providing access to Mexico and Canada for the first time ever, now to the UK, and we aspire to the EU Order. and other Senator agreements Birmingham. to be struck in the months Senator, and years to come. Senator Carr. Uh, Mr President, my question uh, without notice is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbert. And given that the minister yesterday confirmed, and I quote, the Australian government is responsible for the vaccination rollout of residents and workers in residential aged care, I'd ask, can the minister explain why the Morrison government has failed to put in place any system to track COVID-19 vaccination of aged care workers? The minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, well, Senator uh, Carr, thank you for the question, Mr President. Uh, it's not true that we don't have a system to track uh, the vaccination of aged care workers. Uh, we, 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 we do Order. have a system to track the vaccination Order. of aged care workers, Mr President. There's a portal that came live uh, a week and a half ago. It's compulsory as of yesterday for aged care uh, providers to report into that portal, uh, Mr President. Order. Uh, as we advised, as we, as we advised the, the, the Senate Committee had estimates a couple of weeks ago. So, Mr President, there is a system in place. There is a system in place to provide uh, with to, to report worker vaccine, vaccinations in uh, for COVID-19. Uh, it has it has been developed uh, as a part Order. of our realignment of the system Order. of vaccination of aged care workers, uh, Mr. President. And uh, we will continue to report those pub those figures publicly, as we've indicated uh, we would at estimates. Order. Order. Senator Carr is on his feet. Senator Thank Carr, a Thank you, Mr. Question. President. I'd ask why did the Morrison government repeatedly reject offers to work cooperatively with the private sector for with, with technology enabling the tracking of COVID-19 vaccinations and aged care prior to the establishment of the portal? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I don't believe that the government has actually rejected any offers. We speak to a lot of. We, 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 uh, we speak to a lot of uh, providers of technology to do a number of things. I've had a number of conversations with providers of technology with respect to worker registration, for example, uh, and uh, we on a number of occasions and a number of different providers. Uh, some of those providers have subsequently come back to us suggesting that their worker registration process uh, might assist us with some of the other things that we were looking to achieve, Mr. President. Uh, we continue to have those discussions, Mr. President. But we, of course, we have committed, Order. as a part of our Royal Commission response, to a workforce registration process. We have committed to that, and, and, and that will be implemented in conjunction with the sector. But we, what we haven't done is we haven't gone to any private sector Order. proprietary businesses 
to take up their particular systems. We're, we're looking to develop a system that provides for registration of the workforce more generally, Mr. President, and one of the features of that workforce order. registration Senator scheme that Colbeck, we are putting in place the could be vaccinated. Order. There's Senator Carr, a final supplementary question. With 84 per cent of the tragic and deadly COVID-19 outbreaks in Victorian residential aged care facilities were actually from infected staff members, why, Minister, did you not heed the warnings of those private sector companies and who now say you are looking to in their office of assistance? Why? Should older Australians have any confidence, Minister, that you can actually help keep Order. them safe? Senator Carr. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I completely reject the premise of Senator Carr's question. Uh, it's factually incorrect, Mr President. We continue— Order. Uh, uh, miss, miss, it, Mr President, uh, we continue to work uh, it, continuously to support senior Australians to ensure that they have access to vaccines, that the workforce continue to have access to vaccines and that we, importantly, uh, ensure that the aged care residents are vaccinated. And as of yesterday, Mr President, uh, over 94 per cent of aged care providers have seen two visits of uh, va uh, vaccinators to provide the doses. 100 per cent of aged care providers have had a first visit. Uh, and in fact, I th the figure now is uh, uh, is, is 147,879 residents have been vaccinated. Order. Mr. Senator President, Senator so Colbeck, we continue time our for the work answer has expired. The time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, you seek the call. Yes, I, I seek the call. I seek leave to table the answer to the question on notice, confirming that 84 per cent of the tragic and deadly COVID-19 outbreaks in Victorian is facilities were from a staff member. Granted. No, it hasn't been. This, uh, is the, this, is the, this is the fact you Senator deny. Wong, please. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to Minister Rustin, representing the Minister for Resources. The G7 said earlier this week that genuine climate action requires countries to stop giving public subsidies to fossil fuels by 2025. And the International Energy Agency has said there should be no new coal, oil or gas projects to prevent climate disaster. Given this clear message from our international trading partners and experts, why is this government intent on opening up a climate bomb and handing a quarter of a million dollars in public money to allow the Northern Territory Labor government to frack the Beetaloo Basin and opening up acreage that would allow new offshore oil and gas wells near the Twelve Apostles? The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Waters, for your question. Well, first and foremost, the, the government, the, the Morrison McCormack government, is absolutely committed to make sure that we work with the Australian public to make sure that we have uh, an energy mix in this country that, first of all, is reliable and affordable, but at the same time that we meet our international obligations as well as protecting our environment. And we actually believe, Senator Waters, that we can do all of those yeah. things at yeah. the same time. Um, you refer um, to a, a, a number of projects. Um, you know, as an example, um, you know, the, the project um, in Victoria that you're referring to, or offshore in Victoria. I mean, clearly we already have independent regulators that have processes in place yeah. in which to assess, to make sure that any project that is undertaken in our amazing Australian environment is protected in the process, but we also have resources that are owned by the Australian people. These resources are for the benefit of all Australians, and as long as they are extracted in a mechanism and a manner in which the environment is protected, then every Australian deserves to be able to benefit from the benefits of being able to get access to those resources. So, In the case of the Victorian offshore program that you are referring to, of course, NOPSEMA is the independent regulator and they will make sure they go through their robust and independent processes to make sure that any, in, uh, any uh, exploration, which is what you're referring to, that is undertaken, is undertaken in a manner that is consistent with the protection yeah. of Australia's environment. So, I mean, we have been very clear as a government that we believe that we have multiple obligations, obligations to the Australian public mm -hmm. for cheap reliable and accessible power, but we also have an obligation to our international requirement on carbon emissions 
and we have an obligation to make sure that we protect our environment, our very precious environment, but we will do so in a manner in which we can extract the resources that are the propriety property of all Australians, and all Australians deserve order, to benefit from Senator them. Rustin. Senator, order. Senator Waters, supplementary question. And the Northern Territory inquiry into fracking said there should be full informed consent from traditional owners before any exploration or fracking takes place given the impacts on cultural heritage, water resources and access to land. Traditional owners from lands covered by the Empire Energy Licence Area in the Beetaloo are in the building today, saying that they have not been properly consulted or given their consent. How can the minister justify handing out public money for projects that do not have the consent of traditional owners? Senator Rustin. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Senator Waters, for your, your continued uh, for your other next question. Um, first and foremost, there is an absolutely required process by which the government and its instrumentalities have to go through to make sure appropriate consultation is taken place uh, to make sure that everybody who has an interest in a particular project has the opportunity to, to be heard. Now, we are not in any way suggesting that any of those processes are going to be circumnavigated. They will be thoroughly adhered to and gone through, and that includes consultation with all of the people who are impacted by any of these developments, including the Beetaloo Basin development that you're referring to uh, in the Northern Territory. I mean, the Beetaloo Basin is a very, very important resource for Australia, but I also understand that it is, it is a very important issue for many Australians, and that's why we have robust processes in place to make sure that they are protected the people's uh, interests are able to be heard, and broad consultation will be undertaken to ensure everybody's Order, interests are heard. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. One of the biggest investors in the Beetaloo Basin is Empire Energy, run by Paul Espy, chair of the Liberal Party's Menzies Centre, who has donated nearly uh, a quarter of a million dollars to the Liberal Party in recent years. Other significant players include Origin, Santos, Gemina, right. and billionaire Order. Gina Reinhart. Order on my right, so I can hear the question. Senator Waters, continue. Thank you, Chair. Other significant players include Origin, Santos, Gemin Gemina, and billionaire Gina Reinhart, all donors and friends of the Liberal Party. Why is the government handing out Order. public Senator money Waters. to its donor Time mates the against the advice of Senator Waters? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, first and foremost, I reject the underlying premise of the, of the accusations that are being made by Senator Waters. Um, the decisions in relation to the exploration and the extraction of valuable resources that belong to the Australian public are undertaken by independent and thorough means. The importance of this sector to Australia cannot be understated. The importance to our rural and regional communities because of the economic development, because of the jobs that are created, but the broader impact that it provides to the Australian economy cannot be understated. But to suggest that there is anything apart from a robust, transparent, defensible process that is undertaken to ensure that the extraction of these particular resources on behalf of every Australian is anything but that is completely and utterly false. And so I would Order. suggest that, uh, that the importance of making sure that we continue to meet all of our obligations, we continue to consult, but we continue to have a transparent process is absolutely Order. there for every Australian to see, and I don't know why you Order. can't Senator see it Senator Rustin. Senator Wong, were you seeking to table? No. Okay. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Payne, the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment. Will the Minister please update the Senate on yesterday's historic announcement that Australia and the UK have an in-principle agreement on an FTA? And what does this mean for Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg uh, for his question, because it was an historic announcement last night in London, Mr President, between Prime Ministers Morrison and Johnson agreeing to the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement that will deliver more Australian jobs and new opportunities for uh, our exporters. It's going to bring access to a, range of, a greater range of, of products, of greater access for businesses and workers, and more opportunities for Australian producers and farmers in the UK market. It is about creating new opportunities and jobs for business by eliminating tariffs on each other's goods and removing the red tape that slows trade down, by enhancing pathways for workers and young people to work in both countries, by making it easier for our service companies and professionals to do business in each other's markets and deepening our already very strong investment ties. 
In fact, the Australia-UK FTA is Australia's most ambitious free trade agreement with any country other than New Zealand. Both countries have made commercially significant commitments that will strengthen our diversification and export-focused COVID-19 recovery. The ambitious bilateral free trade agreement will also help pave the way for the UK's accession to the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, furthering our cooperation within the CPTPP uh, on a prosperous and secure Indo-Pacific. We have sent the world a very strong signal that we are trading nations that believe in democracy, open markets, high standards and the rules-based trading, global trading system. This deal delivers a strong message about the strength and importance of this relationship between Australia and the United Kingdom, and it opens a new chapter in the long and close history between our two nations. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. How is the Morrison government working to further diversify Australia's exports? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Bragg for his supplementary question because we know that uh, free and open trade will continue to drive economic growth as we emerge from the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the, Australian co the coalition government is supporting Australian exporters to compete freely and fairly and securely. In fact, in last month's budget, we also announced significant new support to Australian exporters to ensure they can expand and diversify their markets as widely as possible. Despite COVID-19, Australia recorded a record trade surplus of $73 billion in 2020, up from $68 billion in 2019. Since this government was elected in 2013, Mr. President, the percentage of our trade covered by FTAs has grown from 26 per cent to what will be 75 per cent once the UK FTA takes effect. We welcome every opportunity to further diversify our exports because the more diversified your exports are, the better placed you are for the peaks Order. and troughs Senator of global Payne. commodity trade. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, how is the Morrison government supporting a rules-based global trading system? Senator Payne. Mr President, the Australia-UK FTA will strengthen our post-COVID-19 economic recovery while signalling our very strong commitment to the global trade and international rules-based order. The coalition is working to keep global markets open and trade functioning, including through bodies such as the WTO, the G20 and APEC. We support a strong, effective world trade organisation, which is why both Minister Tian and I have met this year with the WTO's new Director-General, Dr Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala, in Geneva. Australia is working in close partnership with the WTO. We're leading a Cairns Group effort uh, to tackle distorting domestic support in agriculture. We continue to invest in and advocate for WTO reform to ensure a strong system of rules, to secure the rights of Australian exporters, to provide opportunities for our businesses to grow and to create jobs for the future. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister confirm disability support workers were classified as Group 1A, the highest priority in the vaccine rollout? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Brown for that question. Uh, we have some very good news in terms of the progress now of the rollout, both for NDIS participants and also for workers and their primary carers. Uh, workers are in 1B uh, and are eligible and are all eligible now for vaccinations, and in fact are indeed becoming vaccinated. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, um, <coughs> Minister. How many disability support workers have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Uh, for all disability workforce, we don't have a central register because it, in the past we haven't had a need for a, such a register for a workforce that is quite transient and is also crossover with aged care and also order and order. also sorry the Senator vaccines. Reynolds please I, I have on my left I have during question time repeatedly repeatedly called senators to order I'm having trouble again hearing a minister's answer I would appreciate not being interjected on when I'm asking people to abide by the rules the chamber sets for itself I don't make them up 
Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I can confirm that NDIS workers uh, are not required to disclose to their provider or to the Commonwealth whether they have or have not been vaccinated. In the same way, they are not required and obligated to disclose a medical condition. However, irrespective of their vaccination status, uh, they are required to follow public health orders and are bound by workplace health and safety laws in relevant states and territories. Senator Brown, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sorry. President. I would ask that the minister go back and check which um, group disability support workers are, are classified as, and also on what date it is 1A, as I understand it, not 1B. On, and what date will all disability support workers who want a vaccine be fully vaccinated against COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Well, Senator Brown, I don't need to go back and check. Uh, it is in 1B. Uh, we recently made sure that all NDIS participants, uh, their workforce and their carers were in 1B. And in fact, all are eligible now and there are many uh, there are the four main uh, channels to get vaccinated, and we've also set up additional hubs based out of providers. Uh, Senator Brown, the answer is really up to the workforce themselves. Uh, they have the opportunity to voluntarily be vaccinated, and uh, when they choose to get vaccinated, uh, they, they can be. Order. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Will the minister please outline how the new free trade agreement between Australia and the new United Kingdom will provide our primary producers with new opportunities to export the world's best food, fibre and rice overseas? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Davey, for her question. Because, like uh, you, uh, Senator Davey, I know that Australian farmers will be the yeah. big winners for yeah. the free trade agreement yeah. that was negotiated between our Prime Minister and Prime Minister Johnson um, overnight. Um, and the deal will open up such an amazing new set of avenues for our farmers uh, and the broader agricultural sector. because. The agriculture sector has always been terribly important for the Australian economy, and none more so than it is at the moment as we recover from the COVID pandemic. Um, this free trade agreement is, uh, is, is a very comprehensive agreement. It's high quality and it's mutually beneficial uh, for, uh, for both of our countries, but most particularly for our agricultural sector. It will allow 99 per cent of Australian goods entering the UK to be duty-free. And that includes yeah. the immediate elimination of tariffs on wine, which means a lot to the area that I come from, and rice, which means a lot to the area that you come from, Senator Davey. Um, so beef tariffs will be eliminated over 10 years. Right now, we'll get immediate access to 35 tonnes of beef, uh, and that quota will rise to 110,000 tonnes. Sheep meat tariffs will be eliminated after 10 years as well, which means immediate access to 25,000 tonnes, which will rise to 75,000 tonnes. Um, sugar tariffs will be eliminated over eight years, dairy tariffs over five years. This agreement absolutely means that our farmers now have another new yeah. and exciting market for which they can sell in their amazing high-quality Australian produce. And not only that, Senator Davey, but they will be able to access markets that are actually paying really good prices and understand what the quality of Australian produce is all about. So it has never been more important for Australian farmers to have a diversity of markets of which they can access. And this new trade agreement is a win for us. Yeah. It's a win for our country, but it's most particularly a win for our rural economies. Yeah. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you. Will the minister outline the importance of export opportunities like this free trade agreement for Australian primary producers in meeting the industry's goal of $100 billion of agricultural production by 2030? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, this year, farm grape prices and farm grape production is set to reach an all-time high of $66.3 billion. And of that, $47 billion will be generated because of our exporting of our fantastic primary produce. We know that we grow amazing food, but 80 million people, not just here in Australia but around the world, are fed by Australian producers. 
1.6 million people in Australia are employed by the agricultural sector through its supply chain, and more than 334,000 Australians are employed directly in our agricultural sector. This is fantastic news for the whole of Australia, but most particularly to the areas, uh, the regional areas that support our agricultural sector. We know our primary producers are absolutely first class. Uh, they're innovative, they're forward thinking, and they're always prepared to have a go. So this free trade agreement helps them be able to help themselves to support Australia. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And how, how is the Liberal and National Government supporting primary producers to take advantage of the new export opportunities such as the Australia-UK free trade agreement? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, we absolutely, as a government, the, the Morrison McCormack government, understand the importance not just of sustaining our agricultural sector, but building it because it is such an important uh, part of the Australian economy. So we've invested nearly $100 million in the current budget, in the 21-22 budget, to make sure that we are providing the agricultural sector with the supports and tools so they can take advantage of the opportunities that are presented by these new free trade agreements, such as the one that has been struck in the last 24 hours. We want to transform the way that we support our agricultural sector, particularly around export services and support for exporters. The busting congestion for ag agricultural exporters package continues to modernise and streamline our systems. Um, the package will also generate more than $200 million in other benefits for the agricultural sector um, by 2030. And as part of the Agribusiness Expansion Initiative, we are supporting 2,000 uh, agri-food exporters yeah. through the AusTrade-led Accelerate Senator Program. Rustin time has expired. <clears throat> Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister told the G7 summit that Australia will join the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, and that Australia is committed to protecting a combined 30 per cent of domestic land and ocean by 2030. But of course, the goal of the HAC uh, Minister is to protect 30 per cent land plus. 30 per cent ocean. Isn't this just more trickery from your government to global commitments, just like wanting to use carryover credits to meet Paris uh, targets and commitments? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr. President. And Mr. President, uh, I thank Senator Hanson Young at least for the uh, opportunity to note uh, further some of the successes of the yeah, yeah, Prime yeah, Minister's yeah. visit uh, to the G7 summit yeah. and associated meetings. We've had the opportunity in question time today, of course, to highlight the benefits of the Australia UK Free Trade Agreement. But that wasn't the only agreement that the Prime Minister uh, signed as part of, uh, part of his work overseas. Uh, the Prime Minister indeed made other commitments, those included. Uh, hydrogen cooperation commitments with uh, Germany and with Singapore as part of our technology roadmap and our commitment to engaging with international partners around how it is we drive uh, down emissions in the future through new technologies that Australia can play a leadership role in. We signed an agreement uh, with Japan in relation to decarbonisation, Mr President. Order. Senator uh, Hanson Young on a point of order. Mr President, I'd ask you to bring the minister to the question. Uh, it was a, in relation to the government's commitment to the HAC and the, tricking, the trickery and accounting that the Prime Order. Minister has used. Senator Hanson Young, it was a particularly broad question, and I've ruled before that when questions include part, uh, contentious phrases, ministers have more discretion in answering. Um, I'm listening carefully to the minister, but specific questions can, are easier to make rulings around direct relevance. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, I was just referencing uh, an agreement. I would have thought the Greens would have quite welcomed the agreement between Australia and Japan in relation to cooperation on decarbonisation, building on those other agreements that the Prime Minister entered into whilst overseas. Now, Mr President, Senator Hanson Young has asked particularly about oceans, and of course Australia has, uh, has responsibility uh, for some of the broadest reach of oceans in the world. Uh, and that's why in the recent budget our government released a further $100 million as part of an oceans package to further strengthen our leadership in relation to marine management and ocean protection. Uh, that includes some $30 million to restore coastal marine ecosystems, uh, particularly those systems such as mangroves, seagrasses and tidal marshes. 
but also some $40 million Mr. President, to expand the marine park network into the Indian Ocean and protect some 45 per cent Mr. President, of Australian waters, as well as extension in particular to incorporate sea country into Indigenous protected areas across some nine locations, further expanding not only Order. those Senator networks Birmingham, of protected areas, but especially of Indigenous has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I note that the minister didn't reference the 30 per cent need for protection of domestic land. And isn't it true that if these weak environment laws that the that the Prime Minister wants pushed through this place this week, if they, if they were to pass the Senate, there's no way you could meet this commitment. The Prime Minister's just signed up to something he knows he will never be able to reach. Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President what, uh, what Senator Hanson Young describes as weak, our government is determined to make sure are effective. Our definition of effective isn't to simply have laws in place that are a quagmire of bureaucracy and stop everything, our definition of effective as a government is to make sure that indeed they protect the nationally significant environmental assets that need protection, but they also facilitate development and opportunity across the Australian economy that jobs depend upon. Now again, Mr. President, in the recent budget we outlined some close to $30 million in further support around Australia's environment laws and particularly around the operation of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, funding to ensure the operation of an independent Environment Assurance Commissioner to pursue a pilot regional plan for priority development region in partnership with a state or territory to further support stakeholder engagement in relation to Indigenous cultural heritage. Things Order. I would expect Senator the Greens Birmingham, to welcome some of them, the but of course that they never expired. give it. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Will Australia commit to a target of zero extinction, or is the Prime Minister intent on giving everything to the mining companies and nothing for the koalas? Yep. Senator Birmingham. And, and, and Mr President, uh, for, for the Greens and particularly for Senator Hanson Young, we know that there's the YouTube moment that will be sliced and diced into a little clip that will be used and, uh, and that it's all about the cheap grab, the cheap stunt and never, of course, about the serious policy work or analysis as to how you achieve the objectives of absolutely protecting Australia's biodiversity, of protecting Australia's wildlife, but also enabling, enabling business to be able to operate in a commercially competitive way in Australia in a very competitive global landscape. The types of approach our government seeks to bring, following the very thorough review of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, is all about ensuring that we have effective environmental protections in place, that we work in a more harmonised way with the states and territories for the application of those protections, but that we don't have a quagmire of bureaucracy that prohibits projects from even getting Order. off the ground, as the Greens Senator seem to prefer. Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. At the recent round of uh, Senate estimates less than two weeks ago, we heard that out of uh, the 22,285 uh, people living with a disability, only 335 of them had both doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, why were only 1.6 per cent of people living in a residential disability setting fully vaccinated, despite being in the priority 1A for the vaccine rollout? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator for that question. Uh, the issue of vaccinations for people with disabilities, particularly those on the NDIS, their carers and also their support workers, has been of uh, great importance to me and a great focus in my first couple of months in this job. Um, so we have actually had a significant increase over the last few weeks with the new measures that we've been implementing. Uh, we've now got uh, many more hubs, particularly based at providers, and again I thank very much uh, the, particularly the SIL providers uh, for opening up their facilities around the nation and providing vaccinations both for participants, uh, for their carers and also for workers. Uh, since uh, the last lot of figures that are uh, published, we now have just under 50,000 NDIS participants who have had at least one dose of the vaccine, which is an increase of 18,700 since just the 25th of May. 
Now, this includes 9,500 people with disability living in residential aged care or el people eligible who are living in residential, uh, dis disability residential care under phase 1A of the scheme. And that's, uh, now it's an increase of over 3,300 uh, since the 25th of May. So we are making significant uh, inroads, and again, it's due to a fantastic effort between the Department of Health, between our department, uh, and also now with the providers, who, as I've said, I'm very grateful for their assistance in speeding up the rollout. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank the Minister. Uh, Minister, Rosemary Simon, her daughter that lives in a group home in Albury, has said on uh, ABC Radio Melbourne recently, and I quote, Nobody has been able to give me any information for months, and they're not to be able to get through the 1800 number. The lack of information has just been appalling. If it's not as if the federal government hasn't had time to plan for this. She goes on to describe the Morrison government's vaccine rollout as, quote, non-existent. Is she right? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much for that question, and I would adv advise uh, all Australians living with disabilities, their carers, their family members and also their workers, that there are many avenues now for them to receive uh, vaccinations. Uh, the main four channels that uh, everybody, including the family that you have just mentioned, Senator, uh, they can do. there's now more than 4,600 primary care sites uh, that they can go to. There are the state and territory operated clinics, which are now more than 600 across the nation. Uh, there's the Commonwealth inReach and hubs. Uh, which are now pr being provided, as I've said, through NDIS uh, providers who are making their facilities available, and they in particular have the transportation to assist to bring people in and meet their uh, special requirements according to their uh, disability. Uh, GPs are now doing inReach, and in some states, uh, pharmacies are now also doing inReach. So there are now many channels, and that information is available on the Department of Health's website, and it's also Order. available Senator via the Reynolds. NDIA website. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, what date will all Australians living in a residential disability setting be fully vaccinated against COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Senator, for that. Uh, my hope is as quickly as possible. But as this is a voluntary, uh, vo it, this is uh, vaccination is voluntary. Uh, ultimately, we've now made many more channels available for people with disability, their carers uh, and their support workers to get vaccinated, either within their, within their home or uh, other facilities that they are living in, or that they can go or be transported to many facilities. So we have the channels available, uh, we have the means of providing vaccination, but ultimately, uh, under this scheme, we cannot force anybody to be vaccinated. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Selja. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the highly successful Pacific Labor Scheme and Seasonal Worker Program is helping Australian farmers to harvest their crops, which is protecting jobs and regional communities through the impacts of COVID-19, as well as supporting economies within our region? Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Well, thank you very much, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for his question. I note his home state of South Australia's wonderful leadership in supporting Pacific labour mobility. Uh, now, firstly, uh, as we all respond to COVID-19 and look at economic recovery, I want to reiterate that there has never been a more important time for Australia to stand shoulder to shoulder with our partners across the Pacific. The uh, Seasonal Worker Program and Pacific Labor Scheme have been instrumental in helping to address critical workforce shortages in rural and regional communities. There are now more than 12,000 Pacific and Timorese workers in Australia, with another 27,000 in the work-ready pool. In fact, Pacific Labor has been the lifeblood uh, for many Australian businesses and ensured fresh fruit and vegetables have reached our supermarkets and our tables. And the Australian government values the contribution that Pacific workers have made to our economy. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, has brought into sharp focus workforce shortages in critical sectors, including agriculture, and highlighted the importance of Pacific labour. Since the restart of COVID safe recruitment of Pacific workers in September 2020, more than 7,400 Pacific workers have arrived and supported our horticulture and meat processing sectors, and 2,700 further recruitments are currently being planned. 
More than 5,000 Pacific and Timorese workers stayed in Australia working during COVID. The Australian government is grateful to these thousands of Pacific and Timor-Leste workers for choosing to work in Australia, for helping Australian businesses in our time of need. They're far from home, far from their family and communities, uh, from their one talks, and I'd acknowledge the sacrifice they are making right now. And that these programs are delivering for Australian farmers, for Australian Order. consumers and for our Pacific family. For our part, the Australian government is committed to the future of Pacific labour mobility and seeing workers and employers benefit from these highly successful programs. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate on how the coalition government is improving and streamlining Australia's labour mobility programs to further maximise the benefits of these initiatives for Australian businesses as well as Pacific workers as we recover from the pandemic? Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, and I can. Last week, along with my fellow ministers, Little Proud and Payne, we announced a public consultation <coughs> process to streamline our Pacific Labor Mobility Initiative. Now, our commitment is to ensure that Pacific Labor Mobility is sustainable and efficient into the future, and to position Pacific Labor Mobility for significant Order. future growth. Uh, through this redesign, we'll make it even easier to recruit Pacific workers to meet current and future workforce shortages, while also continuing to ensure the integrity of the programs and the welfare of workers. Now, worker welfare is absolutely paramount, and I can't stress this enough. Welfare and program integrity remains at the heart of our enhanced labour programs. But we also know that Pacific Labor alone cannot fill the huge seasonal workforce shortages that our farmers and rural industries will experience beyond the pan pandemic. As we consider how to meet future workforce needs, Order. we will ensure any new arrangements build on and complement the gold standard set Senator by our Pacific Labor Mobility Order. Programs. Senator Seselja. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, can the minister outline how these programs underpin our strong relationships with our Pacific and Timor-Leste family and the government's commitment to seeing these programs prosper and thrive into the future? Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you. The seasonal worker program and Pacific Labor Scheme are the centrepiece of Australia's Pacific step up and engagement in the region. The remittances sent home by Pacific workers are a key source of family and national income in the Pacific, and these will be even more integral to the pandemic recovery and future growth of Pacific economies. Now, through the streamlining of the programs, we are committed to growing Pacific labour mobility participation. Our Pacific and Timor-Leste partners should be confident that we remain committed to growing our Pacific labour programs. These initiatives are hugely beneficial for Australian farmers and our Pacific family, and the government's committed to building on this success. And we know from the great feedback from far north Queensland to Tasmania that the Pacific will continue to be the priority partners for the Australian government and for Australian farmers for many years to come. It's disappointing the Labor Party seems Senator opposed by, by the nature of their interjection, Senator but our commitment to these highly successful Sorry, programs— Senator Seselja, please resume your seat. Senator O'Neill, I have called you to order repeatedly by name. I ask people to at least pause breaking the rules before they recommence. Senator Seselja. Thank you. And unlike those opposite, it seems, our commitment to these highly successful programs and to the Pacific is Order. absolutely Senator steadfast. Seselja. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. On the 11th of May this year, this minister was asked about the tragic death of 23-year-old Liam Danher, who died waiting for a seizure mat. The minister first claimed she personally had, had been in contact with Liam's father. Then she claimed she had offered to meet and been in touch with Liam's father. And then she admitted it was her office who had been in touch with Liam's father. Can the minister now clarify whether she has personally apologised to Liam's family? And if she has done so, when? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And first and foremost, can I reiterate my condolences to Mr Dan uh, Hur's family. Uh, any death of a child is always tragic. Um, I have, my Chief of Staff has been in, in contact uh, reasonably regularly with Mr Dan Hur's father, who the family has relocated interstate. So I have offered to meet with him, uh, to, with, in fact both parents, at their convenience, and they have asked for me to wait uh, until I have further information which will come from the outcome of the inquiry.
Senator, have you concluded your answer? Senator, sorry, the minister's concluded her answer. Senator Kitching, you have a sup supplementary question? So why, after 78 days, has this minister failed to pick up the phone to personally apologise to Liam Danher's family? Why has she left it to her office? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President. And as I've said, um, I, my chief of staff has been in contact with Mr, with Mr Danher, and I have offered, and through my chief of staff, offered to either in person or on the phone talk with Mr Danher myself. And my understanding is he, he, he does want to talk to me, but when I've got answers uh, that will come in the outcome of the investigation. So at that point, and at his request, that is when I will uh, have contact with him directly, if he still wants to have that conversation. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. When asked how many thousands of taxpayer dollars the Morrison government spent on legal advice and lawyers to deny Liam his $445 seizure mat, the minister failed to answer and falsely claimed she had been in contact with Mr Danher personally. Remember that? Will the minister now be up front with the Senate and answer that question? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if my chief of staff does something on my behalf, then I consider that is, that is the case. And I did, on further questioning, clarify that point, that it was, in fact, uh, my staff. Order. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the Minister outline to the Senate what the Morrison government is doing to develop Australian women's jobs of the future? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Chandler for this Order. very important question and for her enduring commitment to the prosperity and progress of Australian women, and particularly their economic security. Yeah. As Australians on this and those on this side of the chamber know, the Morrison government is committed to seeing more Australians in jobs, and that is particularly so for Australian women. The best way to secure uh, women, Australian women's economic to, well, sorry, excuse me. The best way to secure Australian women's economic security is to ensure that the economy is strong and that there are plenty of jobs to go to. Now, at present, there are more. There are more Australians in jobs than ever before. There are more Australian jobs than there were before the COVID-19 pa pandemic began. In March 2021, uh, women's employment, in fact, hit a record high. The women's workforce participation rate is now hovering around record highs. Mm. Uh, and what's more, the gender pay gap is at record lows, around 13.4 per cent, which of course is considerably lower than the 17.4 per cent that was observed during the Rudd-Gillard Rudd Labor government. But Mr President, we're not resting on our laurels. There is certainly more work to do. The Morrison government uh, is particularly focused on policies that generate jobs in emerging industries, industries that require technology, skills in technology, in science and engineering and maths, known as STEM, and particularly so for Australian women, for these are the better and higher paying jobs of the future. Mr President, Australia's talent pool is too often limited by the underrepresentation of over half of Australia's population in STEM education and careers. We have such a highly educated workforce and a highly educated female population, in fact the most highly educated female population of any developed country. And yet there is a leaky pipeline and low representation of women in STEM. That's why in the 2021 budget, 22 budget, the Morrison government announced a $42.4 million investment to support Order. women Senator to Hume, secure higher legislation. Time for the answer has expired. <laughs> Senator Chandler. A Thank you, Mr. Question. President. Can the minister advise the Senate of the anticipated effects of the government's measures? Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I can talk about the uh, more than 230 women who are going to pursue uh, STEM scholarship programs through, um, uh, through the Morrison government's announcements in the budget. In fact, this program will see more Australian women supported into the jobs of the future. The program builds on the Women in STEM Cadetships and Advanced Apprenticeship program that were announced previously, providing support for more women to undertake university-level STEM qualifications. These scholarships are co-funded with industry and, uh, and are industry-led in areas that are most important to that industry have identified 
identified as most important to them, those fields of STEM with the highest potential to support future growth industries uh, and better and higher paying jobs. For example, Mr. President, in the med tech industry, which was identified as a national manufacturing priority in the Morrison government's modern manufacturing strategy, uh, this is a critical field, in particularly in light of the coronavirus. Now, most importantly, these measures create a bigger pipeline of women entering STEM careers, as well as increased number of role models and peer Order. networks Senator specifically Hume. for women. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate of the industry and community feedback on these measures? Senator Hume. Thank you again, Mr. President. Yes, I certainly can. As a matter of fact, I've in, in visited very recently a number of organisations where the feedback to this program has been exceptional. A medtech organisation in Melbourne, SEER Medical, an innovative organisation which simplifies complex systems, medical systems into technologies that people can benefit from in the comfort of their own homes. I also visited Cicada Innovations in Sydney and met the CEO there, Sally Ann Williams. Sally is a terrific role model for young women contemplating a career in STEM and was particularly supportive of this government's actions to get more women into rewarding careers in Australia's jobs of the future. Misha Schubert of the Science and Technology Australia organisation said that the new STEM scholarship program will pave the way for more women and girls to study science and technology. Carly Walker, the CEO of the Academy of Technology and Engineering, also welcomed the program, saying that increasing investment in STEM education and research translation will strengthen Australia's capacity to rebuild after COVID. And indeed, Michelle Gallagher, CEO of health data analytics company Opal, said that scholarships Order, with the private Senator sector are an excellent Time investment. For the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. And my question is to the Minister for National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. I refer to the Australian Government's document entitled Australia's COVID-19 Vaccine Rollout, National Rollout Strategy. Um, it was available on the Department of Health website. Can the minister confirm that page two of that document setting out the COVID-19 vaccine national rollout strategy, aged care and disability care staff are listed under phase 1A? Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I can confirm that. And as I said in my pre as I said in my previous answer, for the two hundred for the majority, the two hundred and seventy thousand workers, they are in one B. And it is possible that uh, a number of workers who work in residential aged care were vaccinated as part of the aged care rollout. Order. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Order. Senator O'Neill. Order. Senator O'Neill is on her feet. Order. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Thank you um, Mr President. Um, Senator Reynolds, despite now being given multiple opportunities to correct the record, the minister has continued to insist that she's correct when she says disability support workers were classified in 1B. Will this minister now correct the record? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And uh, as I've said, there were some workers who were in 1A, and I've said that's exactly right. Um, but the majority is in, is in 1B. The majority of the 270,000 workers uh, and their, care, their support staff and care workers are in 1B. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Order, Senator Watt. When the minister herself doesn't even understand the Morrison government's COVID-19 vaccine rollout to disability support workers, and she has no idea how many disability support workers have been fully vaccinated. How can Australians living with a disability and their families possibly trust this minister to protect them? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And I stand by, I stand by what I said. And that is that we are now rolling out through five channels vaccinations for workers, for participants, and also for support, uh, support workers and also for their carers. Uh, it is true that in, in, in one uh, it is true that in one A, uh, some of the workers who work in either residential aged care or disability homes may have been vaccinated, but the majority now have the opportunity to get vaccinated at their convenience through five different methods. Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Oh, Senator Wong. Uh, I'd I sought leave earlier in the proceedings to table the document that demonstrates the 84 per cent figure, and I think that is now agreed. Leave is granted. Thank you. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Kitching. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Reynolds to the questions asked by Senators Brown, Ciccone and O'Neill. The Morrison government's rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine for those living with a disability has been woeful. Woeful under this minister, woeful under the previous minister. In fact, let's face it, it's almost non-existent. In Senate estimates less than a fortnight ago, it was revealed that, wait for it, 355 people of more than 22,000 of people living with disabilities living in residential settings had been vaccinated, despite being in the highest priority group 1A. That's right, 1A. There has been a slight update to that figure, but it's still well below what would be rightly expected in a wealthy, first world and relatively privileged country such as ours. I was shocked when the government confirmed that they had not kept a record of how many disability workers have been vaccinated. As Senator O'Neill asked in her question um, and, and, and asked about families, how could they possibly trust this minister to protect them? Oh, you're leaving? Really? You're leaving? You don't actually want to, you don't want to hear any of this? Really? And uh, just a moment, uh, Senator Kitching, if you wouldn't mind resuming I'll, I'll do it through the chair. Senator Henderson. Deputy President, look, I would just ask you to draw um, your attention to Senator Kitching to the standing orders which prevent senators from reflecting on a senator when he or she leaves the chamber. Thank you. Um, senator Henderson. Uh, yes, Senator Wong. Ms. Deputy President, there's nothing in the standing orders which prevents that. There are conventions around that, but I suggest if this senator wants to apply conventions, she should start observing some herself. That's right. uh, thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Henderson. Uh, um, I, I regret to well, say that in responding to the point of order, Senator Henderson, um, I'll on just, reflection, I'll just conclude. Yes, I'll could conclude I just make first. another point of order on another matter? No, Senator Henderson, yes. resume your seat. I'll conclude the first matter. So uh, it is correct to say that it's not in the standing orders, but it is custom and practice. And more recently, the president has drawn it to the chamber's attention that in the COVID environment, when we're not quite sure where whether senators take leave or not, it is not appropriate to, um, to make reference to whether senators are in the chamber or not. And now you want a second point of order. Thank you, Senator Henderson. But, um, it is a breach of the standing orders to reflect on senators, and Senator Wong has just done that in um, relation Senator to me, Henderson. me raising the point of order. So I'd ask that she not do that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Um, I don't believe that's a point of order. Thank you. Please continue, Senator Kitching. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Oh, oh, look there, Senator Henderson. Um, Are you leaving? No, she's reflecting. Uh, order. Reflecting. Order. Order. I would ask senators. Um, I've just explained the custom and practice. Um, I would ask people to observe that, please. Um, please continue, Senator Kitching. One only has to look at the hand side to understand why Senator Henderson needs to understand the standing orders and how to behave in committees. Um, as Senator O'Neill asked in her question, um, Australians, li Australians living with a disability and their families, how could they possibly trust this minister to protect them? The NDIS looks after the welfare of the most vulnerable people in our society. and This is one of the most serious duties of our type of government, is to look after those who are vulnerable. But that will require, of course, the most capable, the most competent and the most composed, which, as we know from uh, Senator Reynolds, is not always the case, um, the most composed of the decision makers that this government can offer. The consequences of the poor leadership which we have seen from this government that will be more people dying in their own faeces, more people waiting for a wheelchair, more people approved of, for plans but then die before they can actually avail themselves of those plans. This is a very, very serious portfolio, and Minister Reynolds 
um, who often has trouble with her recollection, as we've seen over this year um, quite a lot. Um, Senator Reynolds is, uh, is actually not really probably the most competent minister to have this portfolio. There will also be more people left behind by an uncaring bureaucracy. Let's go to the NDIA CEO, Martin Hoffman, who told Senate estimates earlier this year that Liam's death was, and I quote, a complicated matter. That is what he said. Minister Reynolds also said, I cannot imagine the grief that they are going through. But actually what we've heard is, of course, she hasn't actually understood that grief because she hasn't actually phoned the family as she claimed she had done earlier in the year. So if this scheme was managed properly, then Minister Reynolds would not have to imagine the grief of the Danaher family um, and they would not have to go through it. But this scheme is not run competently by this government. Thank you. We have seen the dev devastating effects of the pandemic and what this does when it gets loose in aged care facilities. We should be doing everything we can to ensure that a similar breakout does not happen in the equally vulnerable dis disabled community. I mean, really, this is basic stuff, but the government continues to shirk its responsibilities, whether they are constitutionally mandated or not. They are much more comfortable outsourcing risk to others, including the states, than piling on when something goes wrong. Nowhere have they done this more in my home state of Victoria. During the recent COVID-19 outbreak, the Prime Minister had to be dragged kicking and screaming to help in providing even the most basic of support to struggling businesses and workers. This is a Sydney-centric government, and despite the treasurer of our nation being a Victorian, we were discarded, the state of Victoria was discarded on the road. Now, let's go back to people who are on the scheme. So you imagine them in the pandemic, cooped up for long periods inside their homes, terrified of the virus, some of them not, their condition not really being one that can actually deal with being coped up in, cooped up inside. But there has been bare minimum support from this cruel and heartless government. But should we be really surprised? I'm sure the minister, if she had managed to stay, um, has recovered from lo losing her previous portfolio and now understands the mess she has to fix that was left by her predecessor, um, the member for Fadden. Under his reign of errors, of course, it was revealed that 1,200 Australians with disability had died over three years Thank while you, waiting Senator to be Kitchen. funded by the scheme. Uh, your time has expired, and I, I don't want to have to constantly remind senators when I've drawn their attention to the custom and practice to not make reference to whether senators are in the chamber or not to then have that same comment repeated again. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the question of vaccinations uh, in this country in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic is, of course, a very, very important series of questions. And uh, today, uh, there's been a number of questions on this particular topic. Uh, one of the most important things we need to be doing in coming in here uh, at this time is to be doing everything we possibly can to be encouraging Australians that are eligible right now to be able to go out, uh, book in a vaccination and get that done. Uh, we've got uh, hesitancy that exists within the community. We all know it. We get to speak to people. We speak to people in the community about it. Uh, there's a, uh, also, for some, there's a complacency. We're probably a victim of our own success in this country where COVID uh, thankfully uh, has uh, evaded uh, many, uh, so many of us because, uh, because of the success of the policies that have been implemented across this country, be it uh, policies of this uh, Morrison government or indeed those of state governments who have successfully also managed the health pandemic. And there, is a, there is a complacency in, in, in some. And we have a responsibility as, uh, as political leaders in this country to come into this place and, and take that responsibility seriously and encouraging people, using the influence that we've got, to encourage people to uh, get out, book in a vaccine and make it happen. 
Uh, I've just recently become eligible in my home state uh, to be, uh, be vaccinated, uh, and so I've booked it in. As soon as I get back uh, from this parliamentary fortnight, uh, I'm booked in on the Tuesday, and I'm beginning my, my vaccine, my very first dose. My wife, uh, she's in, in health care. Uh, she's in fact had her two doses of uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, she's a, a health care worker, and she took advantage of that as soon as she possibly could. And we need to be encouraging more and more Australians to do that. But what we see by these questions of those opposite coming in here is undermining the confidence that is uh, necessary to encourage Australians to get out there and make it happen. But thankfully, we are seeing uh, uh, many Australians taking up the opportunity uh, that's before them to go and get vaccinated. We've seen, uh, just to give you a, a, a bit of a, a taste of uh, what we're seeing across the country, it took 45 days for the first million doses. For the first million doses, it took 45 days across Australia for those first million doses uh, to be uh, 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 to be put into the arms of people across the country. It then took 20 days for the next million doses to get us to two million people. Uh, it then took 17 days for the third uh, million, the, the next million, to go through, and then it was 13 days. So you can see that it's diminishing. It went from 45 days to 20 days, to 17 days, to 13 days, and in this last 10 days, we've seen another million doses. So we're seeing this uh, rapidly increasing vaccination program across the country. And instead of uh, highlighting the success of that, and instead of getting behind the success of that, and encouraging even further, further uh, embracing of the opportunity to go and get vaccinated. We get questions from these op those opposite uh, that are uh, just really guided uh, by some sort of political motivation to undermine the, the confidence in the system. And it's disappointing when you come in here and you see that that's what's going on. And we had questions on this today, whereas there actually could have been questions about the efficacy of the vaccine program and how it's impacting and what it's doing. Uh, recently, we saw in Victoria, with the, with the cases go through Victoria, I heard of one particular example of where a 95-year-old gentleman uh, contracted, sadly, COVID. Uh, but because he had received the vaccine, he actually had no symptoms at all, and he's, and he's uh, got through his uh, case of COVID-19. And instead of highlighting the, the impact that this program is having, uh, we get questions that are seeking to actually undermine the confidence in the program, which is very, very disappointing to see indeed. We're seeing Australians step up to the plate, doing their bit to take up the vaccine, uh, doing their bit in spite of the, the great success that there's been across the country and the fact that we don't have the prevalence of COVID in our community. Australians know that the best way for us to move forward as a nation and to take advantage of all the opportunities that have been created, particularly across the economy. We heard today about the uh, last night we saw the announcement of the free trade uh, in principle agreement. Uh, there's opportunities that are bound for us as a nation, and we need to see Australians you, take Senator up that opportunity Sullivan. by getting Your time vaccinated. Has expired. Senator Carr. Well, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Uh, it was Gandhi that made the observation that a true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. And I think this issue that's been identified today in the questions that have been put to Senator Reynolds just highlights our difficulty in this country. We are not treating our most vulnerable in a humane and civilised manner. We are allowing our most vulnerable to be subject to a far greater risk, a far greater danger than need be. Now, the media reported today that the government was in fact uh, withholding supplies of vaccines from the states. The Victoria's COVID response commander, Jerome Vimar, has said that the state government was grateful that it had received an extra 500,000 vaccine doses. And hence, the minister in question time today uh, repudiated the ABC report. Now, it may be asked, however, how is it that an extra half a million doses can be found so readily if doses are not being produced and imported that are being released? So, whatever the accuracy of the media reports, it's become abundantly clear that the Morrison government does not understand how to respond to this pandemic. It's preparing 
for possible future waves of virus, and if it's arguing that's the case, it's sitting actually on a stockpile, it's not the way to go. Increasing the production, the distribution of vaccine is the answer to that. And the government should ensure that that actually happens. But it must also ensure that existing stocks are made available to people who actually need them now. And no group of Australians needs to be more fully vaccinated as soon as possible than the people with disabilities and for those that actually care for them. For the minister to suggest that this sort of laissez-faire approach, that it's up to individuals to get it sorted out for themselves, is simply not good enough. Many disability people are reducing their immunities and are extremely vulnerable in such an environment. The government's estimates about the number of people that have been fully vaccinated, some 355, and that was the position they put to the estimates, that's only 1.6% percent of the people living in residential disability facilities. The government's confirmed that it just doesn't know how many people have been fully vaccinated. In other words, the rollout for disabled people, especially for those in residential care, is almost non-existent. Now that to me is what constitutes a national disgrace. The Royal Commission in only in May rightly called out the slow rollout for disabled people is an abject failure in the vaccination program. And the responsible minister at the time was a minute little power to however was not to say that the figures show that the vaccine rollout is working as he said as it should be. Because he said this was so because there was no COVID infections among people with disabilities. He was boasting about people's good luck. What he didn't say it's not being vaccinated and confined to those people in their homes. It's been forcing them to live in what amounts to permanent lockdown. Nearly four million disabled Australians are cooped up in their homes, afraid of what the continuing pandemic will mean for them. And only this government, surely, can pretend that that's an acceptable situation for a country like this. The situation becomes so bad that some organisations working in the disability care have taken it on the role that the government is in fact shirking. Scope Australia, for example, has taken the matter into its own hands and opening up specialist vaccine hubs for people with disabilities. Admirable, even heroic. But that's the job the federal government should be doing, because only the federal government has the resources to do the job properly. Scope is asking for further clarification from the government as a guide for staff who may be questioned getting the vaccine at all. And you've got to ask yourself, how does it come to this? This government has reminded many, many times that it has two jobs during this pandemic, one the rollout, the other the quarantine. And it's effectively shifted quarantine onto the states despite its constitutional responsibilities, and it's been dragging its feet in terms of the vaccine rollout itself. Thank you, oh. Senator Carr. Your time has expired. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And in rising to take note of answers from Question Time today, I think first and foremost it is important for all of us in this chamber to remember the unprecedented nature of what we as a country, as a community, as a society have dealt with over the last 18 months, and, and I think it can be quite easy to forget the quantum of uh, policy response that has been required to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic in a country like Australia, where we have been so fortunate in the way the pandemic has been handled. Um, to, to remember that it, it could have been a lot worse than this. I don't think anyone um, in this chamber 18 months ago when COVID-19 first hit, thought that we would be in this position now where we are rebuilding the economy, where we are um, developing and administering and rolling out um, a COVID-19 vaccine. I mean, we have to remember, 18 months ago, we weren't even sure if a vaccine could be invented in that shorter time frame. I can remember speaking to a few experts at the time saying that this sort of thing ordinarily takes 
decades, and we were able to do it, of course, with the help of experts around the world in a matter of months. And that is an incredibly, an incredibly impressive thing, and it's something that we have to keep in mind when we are thinking about um, the way that all levels of government have dealt with the COVID-19 pandemic and the response, and the way that the vaccine has been uh, rolled out, is that we are doing something unprecedented, unprecedented and, quite frankly, completely remarkable. Um, in the current situation. I was having a look at the news uh, during question time. Obviously, ordinarily, I would be paying attention to all of the questions and answers in great detail, but I, I did have a quick look at, um, at, at one of the, the news feeds and saw that we did tick over six million doses of the vaccine in the last few hours today. And I think that is a really exciting milestone that, that should be celebrated. And, um, I come in here often and happen to do take note with uh, Senator O'Sullivan at the same time, and sometimes it's hard to find something to say after Senator O'Sullivan's made his contribution because he's so measured and reasoned and, and has said all there is to say. But I, I will um, touch on a few of the points that he made, and, and this is around the importance of the vaccine, and, and I, I think I have alluded to that already. But um, in hitting those six million doses today, obviously there is still work to be done. There are still phases to be rolled out. There are still people out there who are yet to have uh, a dose of the vaccine. I am one of those people. I am not quite yet uh, anywhere near the front of the queue, I, I suspect, given uh, my age, but I will be looking forward to having the vaccine when I am able to at the uh, young age of 31, um, because it is important that Australians do get vaccinated. We know that the vaccine is our best way of keeping safe from this virus and, and getting life more back to normal as we continue the COVID-19 recovery. And I see um, the vaccine is a really important part of not only how we deal with this issue through a health lens, but also through an economic lens as well. Um, if we can ensure that as much of the population as possible gets vaccinated, then we might have some hope of getting back to living our lives the way that we want. And if there is uh, one thing that I've heard resoundingly from Tasmanians in my local communities, but also across the country more broadly in the last 18 months, is that we all want to get back to normal. And I think that is uh, in entirely understandable. And Senator O'Sullivan spoke about in his contribution um, how rapidly the vaccination program is increasing. And again, this is a really important point. Uh, yes, we started off slowly, but I think that rapidly increasing rate of vaccination demonstrates that Australians do have faith in our vaccine program, and I look forward to seeing that vaccination rate continuing to increase, Madam Deputy President, President because, like I say, Getting as many people vaccinated as possible is key to our COVID-19 recovery. It is key to dealing with this health issue on an ongoing basis, and it is key to enabling Australians to get back to living our lives the way that we did uh, in a time before COVID-19. So an incredibly important issue that we have discussed here in the chamber today, and I'm just so proud of all of the efforts that our government is going to rolling out the vaccine and ensuring that Australia can recover from the COVID-19 uh, economic and health issue. Thank you, Madam Thank Deputy you. President. Senator Chandler. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And if you heard the contribution from those opposite uh, during taking note, you'd think there's nothing wrong with the vaccine rollout. And I heard Senator O'Sullivan talk about uh, some of the questions from Labor that we're talking about here undermining confidence. Well, nothing would undermine the confidence of Australians than seeing the performance of Minister Reynolds today. Nothing would undermine the confidence, confidence of Australians than seeing the performance of Minister Colbeck over the last couple of months as well. Uh, and unfortunately, or sadly, I'm not surprised by Minister Reynolds' performance in question time today, because I think Minister Reynolds, well, I know Minister Reynolds owes her position to the Prime Minister. And I think that Minister Reynolds thinks that if you just emulate the Prime Minister's performance, then that's the ticket to surviving this government. Because we saw a minister today, in answering questions, fail to take responsibility, fail to take ownership of being responsible for vaccinating those most vulnerable Australians. And we've seen it from the Prime Minister down, time after time, when it comes to important issues confronting the most vulnerable Australians. And if you don't take responsibility for vaccinating the most vulnerable Australians, 
then what confidence does that give the Australian people that you're going to get it right? And the vaccine rollout is too slow when you compare our performance internationally. Uh, and that is something that Australians are going to have to confront over coming months. So it is disappointing that those people who work in disability have been let down by this government. It's disappointing that those people living with a disability have been let down with this government. And it's disappointing those Australians, families and loved ones who care for a person with a disability are being let down by this government. And it is a continual refusal to take responsibility for those people in aged care and those people in disability care. And it does undermine the confidence of the Australian people as a result. And the questions that we talked about today uh, from Senator Brown around uh, disability care workers, what became clear from the answer from Minister Reynolds was that there is no central register. And her, re her reason for that is because the workforce are transient. Well, that's exactly the problem. That's what we saw, the problem in aged care, particularly in Victoria, because people were working between various uh, organisations as a result of the workforce. So it shows you the need or the urgency for actually having a central database so you can track who is vaccinated uh, and where they are working as a result. And then the minister claimed that they're not required to provide vaccination to their employer. Well, again, another problem that we identified and we saw what went wrong with aged care. You think the government would see that and act. Instead, the government see this and actually try and run out, avoid being responsible for it. They actually run the other way Rather than actually trying to fix these problems, they try and avoid taking any responsibility for it as well. So Minister Reynolds looks at the Prime Minister and thinks, well, he tries to get out of avoiding any responsibility. That's the model that I'm going to, I'm going to replicate as a minister. So no duty of care to those people that the minister is responsible for as part of her portfolio. Uh, and then in regards to uh, those people uh, in disability residences, again, there was no plan. A refusal to, com to commit to a date to have these people uh, vaccinated. Uh, and then uh, the best the minister could do was hope that this was done as quickly as possible. So still we get the rhetoric from the government that this isn't a race. Well, I can assure you for those people uh, living in disability care, for those people who are uh, uh, loved ones or friends of, uh, I'm sure they want it to be a race. They understand how important this is, particularly when they don't get the other part of this puzzle right, which is on quarantine. They continue to avoid any responsibility for quarantine as well. So there's no wonder that Australians are frustrated but also concerned about the fact that we can get an outbreak at any second and it can have an impact in aged care. It can have an impact in disability care, and that is what concerns so many Australians. So we are being left behind internationally, and it's a government that aren't taking responsibility on these important, uh, on these important tasks that they have as the federal government, uh, whether it be vaccinating those people who are vulnerable, uh, whether, it whether it be uh, bringing in proper fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities. They continue to thumb their nose at Queenslanders in that regard, uh, and it is so disappointing that we see the performance from Minister Reynolds today and again, a failure from this government to take responsibility for what the Australian people have tasked with them. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that the motion is moved to, by Senator Kitching to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from Senator Birmingham to my question. Uh, earlier today in relation to the Prime Minister's announcement at the G7 summit uh, some two days ago uh, that Australia would be joining the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. Now, this uh, particular coalition of some uh, 70 uh, countries or 60 uh, countries uh, is a pledge to protect 30 per cent of, uh, of the world's um, land, domestic land, and 30 per cent uh, of the world's oceans. And of course, uh, what we have uh, from this announcement is more trickery from this government, more game playing from this government. Well, on one hand, they have committed to this 
30 per cent by 2030 by saying it is a combined 30 per cent, together uh, protecting the land and protecting the sea. When, of course, that is not what uh, this uh, coalition uh, of countries is calling for in the lead up to the biodiversity conference uh, in China in a couple of months' time. Uh, what they're asking for, of course, is for countries to be fully committed to protecting at least 30 per cent of land plus at least 30 per cent of their oceans from environmental devastation and destruction. So, just like we saw this government time after time after time lie, mislead, be tricky over Australia's commitments uh, to uh, reaching uh, the Paris uh, targets by ca counting uh, Kyoto carryover credits, we see again tricky accounting being used right here under this process. And for what purpose, Mr President? Is it purely so cynical that this government uh, knows that the people of Australia want our environment protected, so they say that they're going to do something while at the very same time doing nothing. In fact, Mr. President, going backwards. And the reason I say this is because while the Prime Minister has been standing up uh, at the G7 saying uh, that Australia commits to protecting our environment, we have right here in this parliament this week the government introducing and pushing through laws that would weaken our environmental protection to pave the way for easier approvals for new mines and big development. And you don't have to take my word for it, Mr. President, as to what is going on here. The Prime Minister himself declared that this bill that amends Australia's environment laws is precisely for the resources sector. It's for keeping the mining companies happy. The Prime Minister has said that himself. It has nothing to do with strengthening our environmental protection laws, to nothing to do in helping halt the extinction crisis that not just Australia faces but the world faces. And when it comes to the issue of extinction, Mr, De Mr. President, Australia, sadly, rates the worst in the world. Can you believe that? Isn't it just shocking that Australia has lost more native species than anywhere else in the world? We're a world leader in extinction, a shameful record and something that we need to start turning around and halting, which is why, under this particular coalition of countries, they're also asking for, for uh, signatories to commit to an extinction target, to halt the destruction of our wildlife, to stop the disappearance of our native species. But of course, Mr. President, the Prime Minister didn't sign up to that particular pledge. The Prime Minister has uh, said one thing at the G7, but here in Canberra, at the very same time, his government is pushing through laws that do nothing to help the environment but do everything to make it easier for big mining corporations and big greedy developers to keep destroying wildlife habitat, to keep destroying Australia's precious environment. Saying one thing at the G7 and another thing here in the nation's capital. And Australians are sick and tired of this game playing and trickery of this Prime Minister. And here today we've called it out and the Minister, when I asked the question, could not give a simple, straight answer. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fioravanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. On behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one for four sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Amendment, Law Enforcement Agencies Regulations 2020, and business of the Senate notices of motion 
number, numbers three and four for 11 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the competition and consumer, consumer data right amendment rules number three, 2020, and national health data matching principles 2020, and business of the Senate notice of motion number one for 14 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the telecommunications fibre ready facilities exempt real estate development projects instrument 2021. Thank you, Senator Ferrante Wills. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I shall come to the Placing of business, Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Askew. It's leave granted. It is Senator Smith. Thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Askew for today for medical reasons. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. In other matters, I'll call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. A general business notice of motion 1127 in the name of Senator O'Neill for today to the 17th of June. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business and I'll commence with government business notices of motion. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I ask that government business notices of motion numbers one and two be taken together as formal. Is there any objection? There isn't. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I move that the following bills be introduced a bill for an act to amend the law relating to sport and for related purposes, and a bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dunningham. I present the bills and move that these bills may proceed without formalities and uh, may be taken together and be now read for a first time. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Major sporting events in this year and images protection and other legislation amendment bill 2021. National health amendment decisions under the continent's AIDS payment scheme bill 2021. Senator Dunningham. I table the explanatory memoranda relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted in accordance with Standing Order 111. Further consideration of these bills is now adjourned to 3rd of August. Senator Dunningham. I move that the bills be listed on the notice paper as separate orders of the day. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now, I will try and manage this for the convenience of the chamber and get, start with Senator 11, uh, 1124 in the name of Senator Ciccone. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice for motion number 1124, proposing an extension of time for the Select Committee on Temporary Migration uh, to report be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rice is not... Oh, I'll give you a moment to get to your seat, Senator Rice. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1125, standing in my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to require reporting on electric vehicles and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it, Senator Rice. <laughs> Um, I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a, second, uh, read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rice. I move that this bill now be read oh, a second. Oh, sorry. I have to call okay. the clerk. I always forget that step. My apologies, the clerk. A bill for an act to require reporting on electric vehicles and for related purposes. Senator Rice. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an, an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? It is. Senator Rice. I table an, ex, an, an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? It is. Thank you, Senator Rice. Could we go to 1128 in the name of Senator Pratt? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. Before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I inform the chamber that Senator 
Smith will also sponsor, sponsor the motion. I'm suspecting that Senator Dean Smith, but this doesn't say that, but I'll put that down. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1128 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none? I'm Senator, oh, there is. Thank you. Um, 1128. Order. Okay. So I'll now move to 1129 in the name of Senator Stirl. Senator Urquhart. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1129 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. There is. I'll now go to 1130, Senator, in the name of Senator Polly. Before asking the motion be taken as formal, I inform the chamber that Senator Griff will also sponsor the motion. I ask that General business notice of motion number 1130 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. I'll now move to. Sorry, just taking notes here. I'll now move to number 1126 in the name of Senator Steelejohn. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask uh, that business notice of motion. Uh, number 1126 in relation to the holding of works at the Australian War Memorial until the completion of the appeals process be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Steelejohn. I move the motion. Senator Dunham. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the National Capital Authority uh, consideration of the Australian War Memorial development was one of uh, several processes that independently considered the project. The Public Works Committee also considered the need, scope, cost, purpose and value for money of the proposed works, and the Parliament agreed to the expediency motion to carry out the project in February of 2021. Heritage aspects were assessed in accordance with the EPBC Act. Following this, the proposal was approved with conditions in December of last year. The NCA considered all issues raised and concluded that the proposal is not inconsistent with the National Capital Plan. The question is the motion moved by Senator Steele, John, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Someone want to uh, attend to that? We don't answer phones in the chamber. 
where so they're, they're let in as a courtesy if they're kept on silent? Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1126 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt tell of the ayes, Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 36. The question is resolved in the negative. I now jump to question 1131 in the name of Senator Rice. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1131 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, uh, Mr President. Ambition is important, but action and outcomes are ultimately what matter. Between 2005 and 2019, Australia reduced emissions faster than Canada, Japan, New Zealand and the US, faster than both the G20 average and the OECD average. We have the most solar per person of any country in the world, the highest rate of household solar in the world, and the, uh, the most wind and solar per person of any country outside of Europe. The Morrison government is committed to reducing our emissions in a way that preserves Australia's strengths by protecting our regional communities, our resources industry and our heavy industry. 
The government's practical, technology-driven approach is reducing emissions without imposing new costs on households, businesses or the economy. The question is Senator Roberts. Big leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. One Nation opposes this motion. Under my cross-examination during its presentations, CSIRO has admitted it has never said that carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. CSIRO later admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. CSIRO then cited references proving that, the, that proved that the rate of temperature increase is not unprecedented. Former Obama science adviser Steve Coonan recently admitted, quote, the warmest temperatures in the US have not risen in the past 50 years. For more than 10 years, the current Green Senate leader has refused to debate the empirical data and refused to debate the corruption of climate science in which the Greens call is based. There is no empirical scientific evidence for decarbonising and deindustrialising our nation. Yet Green's leader, Adam Bant, supports European Union tariffs and Korean levies for supposed climate inaction. Without evidence, the Greens' nightmare call on the government would hurt the poor, hurt our natural environment, hurt jobs and gut our economy. Senator Gallagher. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. At the recent G7 meeting, um, demonstrated again that Australia is an international laggard on climate action. But good climate policy and the jobs that come with it will only be delivered by a majority Labor government. And the Greens know this. It won't be delivered by stunt motions by the Greens party in this place, and Labor opposes the motion. Question is motion number 1131 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1131 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What tell of the ayes? Senator Urquhart, tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 38. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Waters, could I come to your matter number 1121? Thanks, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 1121, standing in my name for today, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to establish an inquiry into when, whether Christian Porter is a fit and proper person to be a Minister of State and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. I present the bill and move that the bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The oh, I'm making a call based on my assessment of the chamber. The question is that the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the bill being introduced by Senator Waters be read a first time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell for the ayes. Senator Smith, tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber for the final matter, which is matter number 1132 in the name of Senator Watt and others. Senator Urquhart will be doing that on behalf of Senator Watt. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1132 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator, there is. Okay, so Senator Urquhart, do you have a motion to move that, that oh, Senator Gallagher? That concludes the list. Senator Patrick. I think you've missed uh, Senator Lambie's motion for, for today. I was informed that was being debated later. My apologies, Senator Lambie. Uh, you can do it now if you wish. I was informed it was coming up later. No, so it is coming up later. Thank you. So that concludes the the list of motions. Senator Gallagher, we'll go Thank through you. the routine. Thank you. I seek leave to move motions uh, 1128, 1129, 1130 and 1132 and that they be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Move so much of standing order. I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving motions 1128, 1129, 1130 and 1132. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, tell of the ayes, and Senator Patrick, tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 61, noes 2. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call Senator Gallagher to move the four motions. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I move the motions, uh, Mr. President. 1128, 1129, 1130, and 1132. Thank Senator you. Dunningham. Just ask on behalf of the government that 1132 be put separately to the other three, and in doing so, just table our statements. I will do that. Senator Roberts? I seek leave to, to table a, a short statement uh, on, in regard to 1132. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. All right. What I'll do is I'll put motions number 1128, 1129 and 1130. The question is those motions be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll now put matter number 1132. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1132 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. Senator Waters, sorry, can I have some? I'll, I'll let people get across the chamber. Can people sort of not go between me and the speaker, if possible? I'll call Senator. I'll call Senator Waters. Thanks, President. I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum and the second reading speech as accompanying documents to the bill of which notice of introduction was accepted. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted at the moment, Senator Waters. Um, the people are indicating if you might circulate them. They might be. Well, I can only say I can't comment on that. I can only say at the moment leave is not granted. I'll give, I'll, what I'll do is I'll read out the MPI and then um, th th this can be leave is not granted. Give notice of a late motion pertaining to the introduction of a bill relating to parliamentary procedure. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted, Senator Waters. President, and I seek leave, uh, pursuant to contingent notice. I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would pre prevent me um, from uh, moving, giving notice of intention of a late motion. And I just want to outline sorry, for no, the benefit. I've got to, so, sorry, I just want to. I've just got to clarify. Your seek. I just want to clarify before you speak, Senator Waters. You're seeking to suspend so much of standing orders as would allow you to submit a late notice of motion. I just want to check, is there a contingent notice to this effect? It's not. So I just want to check. Well, President, it's thank you. In that case, Senator I— Senator Waters, I'll let you, you, you have the right to speak to the motion. Thank you, President. Um, sorry, you've granted me leave, yes? No, you're moving to suspend standing orders yes. to thank allow you. you to submit a late notice. Thank you. Thank you, President. I just want to outline um, to anyone uh, listening, and certainly there will be many survivors of sexual assault who have in fact been listening to what's just occurred. As folk know, there are unresolved rape allegations against uh, current Minister Porter, who's no longer the Attorney General but remains a minister. The police have not been able to investigate. The Prime Minister has not seen fit to investigate. The Prime Minister asked his mate, Mr Porter, if there was any truth to the allegations and accepted Mr Porter's word for it. The Prime Minister did not read the dossier of allegations from the victim provided to him. He has simply accepted his mate's version of the story. Since there is no other avenue to ascertain the truth of what occurred, and since the Prime Minister refuses to call his own inquiry into the fitness of uh, the people that he has appointed to be cabinet ministers, uh, to be so cabinet ministers, I was attempting to introduce a bill and, in fact, was able to got so far as to introduce a bill for a commission of inquiry to ascertain whether 
Christian Porter is fit to remain as a cabinet minister making decisions for the benefit of all Australians. Now, in a virtually unprecedented move, this government blocked that bill from being read a first time. They have stopped the bill in its tracks. They just then denied me leave to even table the explanatory memorandum and second reading speech. This is a government that cannot handle transparency of any sort. I have now sought uh, uh, leave to introduce the bill a second time, and once again the government has de denied me leave to do so. This is a government that thrives on secrecy. We all knew this, but this is a new low to stop a senator from introducing a bill uh, for a measure of transparency that goes to the functioning of this democracy is an absolute outrage. It is an outrage to process and democracy, but more so it is an outrage to survivors of sexual assault everywhere. 90,000 people signed a petition earlier in the year and they marched on this parliament. The Prime Minister didn't want to talk to them then either, but they signed a petition saying we need an inquiry into Minister Porter's fitness to be a minister of the Crown. Now, many of Kate's friends uh, have been rallying around this issue, and in fact, Jo Dyer is sitting in the chamber with us now, witnessing this. She was ready to witness the introduction of a bill. Instead, she's witnessed this government blocking the bill from going forward. Uh, just when you think this government can't uh, sink to new lows, they manage to find a way every single time. They have just stopped a bill from proceeding. I can only think of two other occasions in my 10 years of being in this place that that has happened. Um, it may well have happened on the very odd occasion prior to that uh, time, but it is highly unusual to stop senators introducing bills, particularly when it's a bill about process and it's about making sure that this democracy can function properly and that members of the Australian community can have confidence in the institutions of government and that rape survivors everywhere can feel emboldened to share their stories and seek justice, this government is they should be utterly ashamed of themselves. And I want to know who gave the authority to shut this bill down. I want to know if it was just the folks sitting over there or was it the Prime Minister that issued a decree that says this bill will not proceed. My mate Christian Porter has to stay in the Cabinet because he assured me he's innocent, and that's all I need to know. I want to know who gave the order to shut this bill down. The Australian people deserve to know why have you shut this bill down? What is your reasoning and what are you going to do? If not this commission of inquiry, what are you going to do to make sure that justice is served in this case? Will you just have anyone on your cabinet benches? Do those prime ministerial statement of ministerial standards, do they actually not mean anything? We thought as much, but you've just proved it today. This is an outrage. Women across the country, decent people across the country will be horrified that this government is once again shutting down this semblance of a measure of seeking justice. This is nothing but a protection racket for the boys' club that is this government and this cabinet. I urge you to reconsider. I'm not going to let this drop. The 90,000 people that signed that petition are not going to let this drop. The 51 per cent of the population are not going to let this drop. I mean, by all means, go to the election with this as your position, and I look forward to you being condemned to the dustbin of history on the opposition benches for many years to come. But women deserve better. This country deserves better. Shame Order, on you. Senator, Senator Rustin, I'll, I'll call Senator Rustin next, but I'll ask Senator Waters a question just because I wasn't to clarify. You are seeking to suspend standing orders to give notice is it of reintroducing the same bill or is it a different bill? If I need to change a word in the bill, I will. Okay, so the motion is to reintroduce a bill. Sorry, to introduce a bill relating to parliament, parliamentary procedure, as you first outlined. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Move that the question be put. Question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. But the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Thank you. Order.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be put. Those are, uh, the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Dean Smith, tell off the ayes. Senator Urquhart, tell off the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the question. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion to suspend standing orders moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes, Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 33. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, that concludes or we have concluded formal business. I'll now move on to the MPI and give senators a moment to take their seats or vacate the chamber. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. 28 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator Stirl. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The need for the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services to apologise to Victorians for claiming a very positive record across the board with respect to maintaining a safe border for Australia at the same time as Victoria faced new COVID outbreaks because of the Morrison government's failure to implement and maintain safe national quarantine. Is the proposal supported? 
It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I'll let people vacate the chamber, and then I will call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, President. Well, this Morrison government has failed Victorians. They have failed. They have had months to prepare Australia to safely deal with the ongoing impact of the pandemic. They have had months to effectively roll out the vaccine. They have had months to get safe national open-air quarantine facilities up and running. And have they? No. Throughout this pandemic, the Morrison government has denied its responsibility for quarantine. It has failed to set appropriate national standards for quarantine. And all the while, they sit back and critique state government responses to breaches in hotel quarantine. Prime Minister Morrison said on hotel quarantine back in April, a system that is achieving 99.99 per cent effectiveness is a very strong system and is serving Australia very well. How did he come to that conclusion and that figure? 21 breaches from hotel quarantine in this country. Tens of thousands of infections in this country. More than 800 tragic deaths in this country. Does that sound like a system that is serving Australia well? It sounds like a system that is dangerously struggling to keep up. So when will the Morrison government get it? Hotels are built for tourists and for short stays. Hotels are not built for virus control. And this government was told in October by their own hand-picked adviser, Jane Holton, that they needed to build fit for purpose open air quarantine facilities. That was seven months ago. The Victorian government handed them a proposal for a new purpose-built quarantine facility back in April. And when did Prime Minister Morrison finally agree to build a facility in Victoria? In June, in June, when Victorians were already battling with new outbreaks of more failures of the hotel quarantine system, this time from Adelaide. This government just does not think ahead. They don't plan. And when they are finally dragged kicking and screaming to act, it is already too late. So according to this Prime Minister, the vaccine rollout, it's not a race. mRNA vaccine manufacturing starting in four years' time, that's fine. Purpose-built quarantine facilities, they can wait. The states are just welcome to give us their proposals. Financial support for casual workers in crisis in Victoria. They can wait too. They can wait a week without pay, and you'll have to drag us kicking and screaming to deliver it. And according to the acting Prime Minister, a week without income, well, it's not that long to wait anyway. What a heartless response from this government. And this government should be embarrassed and they should be ashamed at the pace of the vaccine rollout in Australia. Embarrassed and ashamed. Victorians, we entered 2021 expecting a fast and efficient vaccine strategy, only to be given the exact opposite by the Morrison government. I was there with all Victorians going through the winter with the virus spreading throughout our community last year. And one of the things that got us through was the hope, the hope of a vaccine on the other side, the hope of effective national quarantine. That is what got us through last year. But here we are again, here we are again, facing yet another Victorian winter with the virus again trying its best to spread through an almost entirely unvaccinated population. Because today, less than 3 per cent of Australians are fully vaccinated. Less than 3 per cent. Let that sink in. And we are currently 4.2 million doses behind the government's current vaccination target. Not their first target, not their second target, behind their third target. They just keep dropping the bar lower and lower, and still they are missing the mark. They still can't tell us how many aged care workers have been vaccinated. They still can't tell us when aged care workers will be vaccinated. And the Health Minister, 
Mr Hunt is not even sure whether he wants us to be vaccinated. One day he's telling over 50s to get AstraZeneca. The next he's saying they can wait for Pfizer until the end of the year. Well, which is it? Which is it? You could not make this stuff up. You couldn't make it up. Australians, and especially Victorians, had to dig deep to get through last year. Victorians sacrificed so much to beat this virus back. And they should have been able to come into 2021 with confidence that this government had learned the lessons of 2020, that it would have a real plan that ensured Australians would be able to beat this, this virus and that they would be safe, that people wouldn't be sitting ducks waiting for the next outbreak to hit, that we would be vaccinated, that quarantine would now be safe. But the Morrison government, it has failed Victorians because it is impossible for a federal government to deal with a pandemic if they don't actually believe in governing. It is impossible for a federal government to deal with a pandemic if they don't want to roll up their sleeves, if they wait time and again to be dragged kicking and screaming to do anything, to do something. It doesn't work. The Morrison government's approach doesn't work. They have left Victorians exposed, they have left Australians exposed, and it doesn't have to be this way. If only the government believed in actually governing, if only they believed in taking responsibility, if only they would act instead of just react. It is a race. It is a race. And it isn't a case of slow and steady wins the race. So it is time for this government to pick up the pace, to get moving, to get on with the job of building fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities in every state and territory, to start a public health campaign and ramp up the vaccine rollout with some urgency. There is no room for more excuses from this government. The Prime Minister needs to step up and do his job because, actually, lives depend on it. And until this government does step up, all of the hard work that Australians put in to get our country moving again, all of that hard work last year in 2020 into this year, it is just waiting to be thrown away. Now, Labor, Labor knows that if we are to beat this virus and to keep Australians safe, there can be no more delays. There can be no more delays. Labor would build dedicated quarantine facilities in every single state and territory. We would fix this bungled, bungled vaccine rollout. We would start a mass public health campaign around vaccines. Where is the public health campaign around vaccines? And we would make it a first priority to manufacture more vaccines right here in Australia. It's the only path forward towards a real recovery that leaves Australians secure in getting on with their lives. But all of this, apparently, it just seems like it's too much work for the Morrison government. They would rather sit back and be reactive instead of be proactive, deal with it once the damage is already done. Don't, don't hold the hose. Don't take responsibility. Don't admit fault. They should feel real shame for what Victorians have been going through the last few weeks. Real shame. They should look at the evidence and see what their repeated failure has done, their inability to take responsibility and actually run this country take us through the pandemic is actually hurting Victorians and hurting Australians. Real people are impacted by this government's weakness. It is no longer day one of the pandemic. It's been over 500 days since the first COVID case in Australia. The Prime Minister cannot pretend like he doesn't know how this virus moves, how infectious it is, how devastating it can be. He needs to wake up and be honest with Australians. He needs to realise how big of a mistake it is every day that we miss the vaccination mark, how big of a mistake it is every day that we wait for fit-for-purpose open-air quarantine, every day. Prime Minister Scott Morrison and his government might be prepared for Australians to make the sacrifice again and again for their failures for the Morrison government's failures. But Australians are done. We are done. We want the Morrison government to do the job that they were elected for, and that is to stand up for Australians 
and to protect Australians. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to rise and speak in this matter of public importance debate about the need to apologise to all Victorians. And I have to say uh, I am incredibly disappointed to hear Senator Walsh's contribution, which I can only say is highly irresponsible, uh, to misrepresent in particular the advice of the Federal Health Minister in relation to the vaccination is a disgrace. And that's what Senator Walsh has just done. And we all have a responsibility in this chamber, no matter which side of politics we are on, to make sure that Australians have accurate information. And for Senator Walsh to get up with that ridiculous spray and say what she did, uh, she should be totally ashamed. And, and this is a, an MPI about the requirements of an apology. And yes, an apology is required, and Victorians have worked it out. An apology is required by the Victorian state government and by federal Labor Victorian M MPs and senators who have stood in silence through four lockdowns as Victorian residents, including Victorian families, businesses, seniors and students, have been brought to the knees as a result of the mismanagement of the pandemic in Victoria by the state Labor government. The fact that Victoria has suffered four debilitating lockdowns, unlike what we have seen in any other state or territory, is, is no coincidence. So to Labor senators in this chamber, I say, please perhaps consider apologising to Victorians for the hotel quarantine fiasco, including the engagement of security guards who had no proper infection control training or expertise, which allowed coronavirus to spread into the community and, of course, resulting in the deaths of hundreds of senior Victorians, and that was the finding of the Coat Inquiry. Apologise perhaps to Victorians for not accepting the offer of help from the Commonwealth, such as the provision of ADF personnel to support the state's quarantine responsibilities. Apologise to Melburnians for the curfew, which effectively locked them in their homes and, w and which was without doubt in breach of the Victorian government's Charter of Human Rights. Apologise to the people who lived in the public housing towers in Melbourne who were locked down with no warning whatsoever, leaving parents without food for their children and older residents frightened, which the Victorian Ombudsman found was a clear breach of human rights. Apologise for the Victorian state government's incompetent contact tracing system. and There have been some big improvements, and I am pleased to say that. But it's still a far cry from the gold standard in New South Wales, and it meant that for many months the government ignored the advice of the experts to adopt a unified QR code and check-in system, to adopt proper IT systems and to publish exposure sites so that people could immediately, if they'd visited those sites, isolate and get tested. And perhaps also consider apologising to school students for missing so many weeks of school, to families for not being able to see their loved ones. And, and even now, families in regional Victoria can't visit their loved ones in residential aged care unless they are at end of life. So I say apologise to Victorians for four statewide lockdowns, including the most recent lockdown in regional Victoria, where there has been no community transmission, which has resulted in insurmountable financial and mental health pain and which left so many businesses broken or closed when there was no basis to do so, including the IGA supermarket in Anglesey, which was forced to close as a result of a false positive case and which has now suffered losses in excess of $100,000. Perhaps also apologise to our regional tourism and hospitality sector and to regional chambers of commerce and regional committees including the committee from the Mornington Peninsula, which are pleading for the state government to put in place a proper COVID-safe response plan so that whenever a positive case arises, it can be dealt with locally whilst allowing the rest of the city and the state to function as happens in New South Wales. The facts are that this latest lockdown has caused such a loss of faith and confidence uh, because it demonstrates that the Victorian government does still not have the capacity to control the virus and the outbreaks locally in any sort of proportionate manner as occurs in other states. So last weekend, the long weekend, uh, the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry estimated that lost visitation and cancelled trips cost regional Victorian business, um, businesses and the visitor economy 
around $150 million just over three days. And that, of course, due to unreasonable density caps, some major tourism businesses such as Sovereign Hill could not open. Um, many major businesses were closed, such as Heathcote on show, the Castlemaine Jazz Festival, wineries, restaurants, hotels, cafes, and accommodation providers and other tourist operators were left high and dry. So, acting Madam Deputy President, it is time that the state government worked out how to keep our state's economy open whilst protecting lives and livelihoods. None of these issues, of course, were addressed by Senator Walsh in her contribution. So I want to now move to the facts in relation to the Commonwealth's quarantine responsibilities, and they are very clear. Again, these are facts not acknowledged or even referenced in Senator Walsh's contribution. Mandatory quarantine with COVID-19 testing is currently considered the best strategy for incoming travellers, and it is a key pillar of our nation's response. Hotel quarantine was mandated by National Cabinet on 27 March 2020, and these requirements have been implemented under state and territory legislation with the support of the ADF and Australian Border Force when necessary. Since the implementation of hotel quarantine, there have been 372,000 international air arrivals, with some 4,000 COVID positive cases, most of which have been in hotel quarantine. And apart from the major failures which occurred in Victoria, uh, there has been very little other outbreaks. So, in accordance with the resolution of National Cabinet, the Commonwealth is supporting the states and territories. It's supporting, obviously, Northern Territory at the Howard Springs Quarantine Facility. The investment is in excess of half a billion dollars, and that's also supporting our national effort to repatriate Australians flying in um, to Australia, and that is a major incoming port, of course, for all Australians. There's the agreement with Tasmania to support Australians returning there. And then, of course, there's the memorandum of understanding for a quarantine facility in Victoria, and I welcome that. And it is a pity, though, again, Senator Walsh did not reference this, that the state Labor government has proposed an animal quarantine facility at Mickleham as its preferred option. And uh, from where I sit, as a regional senator based in Geelong, that is absurd because that presents a whole range of biosecurity and logistical issues which the state government have not even considered. And that's why I've been such a big supporter of uh, placing this quarantine facility at Avalon Airport, where incoming travellers can fly directly into Avalon uh, to an international terminal, a first-class terminal, and then travel a very, very short distance to their accommodation facility. So even on this issue, it does seem that the Victorian government has not done its basic homework. I do welcome the fact that the Victorian government is open to Avalon, and I'm very confident and I hope that that will be the decision as negotiations continue between the Commonwealth and the state. But this makes great sense for Victoria. It makes great sense for the Geelong region. It would be a huge boost for jobs in our local economy and, of course, would utilise Avalon Airport, which has endured such financial pain over the last 18 months or so. So I say to Labor senators, there's a lot to apologise for in relation to what has happened in Victoria. It has been a very torrid time, and as I say, it's no coincidence that there have been these rolling lockdowns in Victoria, unlike any other state. Uh, I'm really proud of the Morrison government's management of this pandemic. And to a large degree, the Morrison government has worked very successfully with the states and territories. Uh, just think of this. More than 12 months ago, it was hard to envisage that we would have a vaccination. That vaccination rollout is happening at a very, very fast pace. We are at total vaccinations of almost 6 million vaccinations. Uh, and that is a great achievement. Uh, yes, there is more hard work to be done. We urge all Australians to get vaccinated, but can, we can be very proud of our efforts together. But I say to the state government in Victoria, please get your act together in relation to the issues for which you are responsible. And I hope and trust that the new quarantine facility in Victoria will be at the wonderful Avalon Airport. Thank you so much.
Senator Seward. I rise to speak to this matter of public interest. The need for the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services to apologise to Victorians for claiming a very positive record across the board with respect to maintaining a safe border for Australia, at the same time as, as Victoria faced new COVID outbreaks because of the Morrison government's failure to implement and maintain safe national quarantine. Now, the reason that the minister has to apologise for this was for the comments that were made, and these comments have been repeated a number of times, about the fact that they have a very positive record. How can you call it a positive record when, during estimates, a document was tabled that documented 21, 21 quarantine breaches? And since then, I don't think that one included the, the, another Perth uh, breach. Or the one happening right now in New South Wales, quarantine breach. Now those breaches, 23 people may say yes, and the government does say there's been thousands of people coming to Australia. But the point is, look what the impact that one breach had on Victoria just recently. Wasn't even an escape from a Victorian hotel. It was an escape from. It came through the South Australian quarantine breach into Victoria caused the current outbreak or the outbreak that led to the lockdowns that I noticed today the restrictions are being wound back uh, again thank goodness for Victorians but the fact is one breach has a very very significant impact and the Commonwealth knows this the Commonwealth knows this so how can they say we have a very positive record when in fact there has been a number of breaches now we know hotels are not the right place to be quarantining people fair enough when the pandemic first hit we had to take immediate action and hotels were then brought into play it was important that that happened but we are now a significant period down the track we are still having we are now having breaches from quarantine which are causing lockdowns western australia has had several victoria has had a number south australia obviously and new south wales and queensland that is why we need specialist facilities for quarantining like howard springs no no leaks or breaches of quarantine in Howard Springs. That's because it has what is necessary to ensure effective quarantining. People in their own space, able to get fresh air. No, none of the impact that we're seeing in hotels, which is this issue specifically around ventilation and aerosols. Now, while the government, again in estimates, said we're paying attention to uh, aerosols. There has been a problem since the beginning with aerosols. Yes, they mouth the words. Do they do something about it? No. Problem with getting effective PPE out that deals with aerosols, but specifically the ventilation in hotels for quarantining in a lot of those hotels is not adequate. And they've known that for a long time. But do we have guidelines across Australia around ventilation and aerosols? Guess what? No, we don't. And while I mistakenly believed an answer to one of my questions in the COVID committee was that, yes, they are developing some guidelines around that across the nation, in fact, estimates turn, in estimates, the answer to my question then was how they're proceeding was that, no, they're not actually working on that. So we still have no national guidelines on ventilation and ensuring negative pressure in these hotels. And while, some, while states have moved to try and address this issue, it is still happening, clearly meaning the Commonwealth needs to be taking action to build special purpose, fit for purpose, quarantine facilities, because we are going to be dealing with this issue for a significant time into the future. Then that takes me, of course, to the issue around the need for vaccines. Of course, we, have, we are very pleased to see that vaccines have been developed with a lot of effort around the world. But for the government to claim that they are way up there in the rollout of vaccines, that is ridiculous. So the number of targets we've had and the number of assurances by the government the government missed the target 
in March. The government missed the target. At the, sorry, the beginning of March they missed the target. The end of March they missed the target. In April they missed the target. In January the government announced there'd be 40 million total doses in, at the end of October this year. Missed that target. Well, they've, they've already admitted they're not going to meet that. We now have December. We've seen um, the 40 million uh, dose target has been revised uh, in new, a number of times. We clearly, clearly have missed the mark on vaccinations and specifically in aged care, both for residents but particularly for staff and, and also in uh, disability uh, shared accommodation and group homes. Again, missed the mark for both residents, disabled people and their carers, and in aged care in particular. And we still don't know how many workers have been vaccinated. And the government has contracted this out. And when the first contractor didn't deliver, what did we do? Oh, yeah, we went to another contractor to try and fix the first contractor's failure to actually roll out the doses to meet our targets. This has been, in many instances, in fact, farcical. The number of contracts, the amount of money we have paid, instead of actually making sure that we, the, the public service could do it, that the government could do it, states and territories. The reason so many have now been rolled out is because the state and territories have picked up the slack and set up hubs. They're the ones doing it. So yes, the minister does owe an apology for, com for continuing the myth that they are doing safe border management when we've had so many breaches that have such devastating consequences. Thank you. Senator Seward, I call Senator Polly. Yes, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I want to make a few comments in relation to this MPI. But to start with, I think we have to correct the record. When Senator Henderson, who is typically uh, keeping her, her head in the sand, comes in here and tries to rewrite what's really happening in this country and saying that this is all Victorians' fault. The, the whole pandemic rests with the Victorian state Labor government. Well, what a lot of nonsense. What a lot of nonsense. Then she goes on with some more diatribe, trying to tell us that there's a fast rollout of the vaccine. Well, we know quite clearly that that is not the case. What we do know is there are two facts that we should put on the record which makes it very clear what is happening in this country and why it's happening. Firstly, it's the Commonwealth Government's responsibility to roll out the vaccine. It is the Commonwealth Government to provide quarantine. They have failed in their duty of care on both counts. We have, as Senator Seward has just uh, spoken about in her contribution that there's been 23 breaches of hotel quarantine in um, a number of states, including New South Wales, West Australia, South Australia and Victoria. What we haven't seen from this government is any leadership when it comes to ensuring that there was an efficient, fast rollout of the vaccine. Now, we have known for some time in this place, because we have evidence of it every time we sit in this chamber, of an incompetent minister in Senator Colbeck when it comes to his responsibilities around aged care. What we saw was the Prime Minister remove a lot of his responsibility and put them over to Minister Hunt. Well, we've seen how well that has worked, and I'm sure that he just sees Senator Colbeck as a dispensable commodity in this place. Because if he really believed when he spoke the words that he was going to make aged care and aged care workers and older Australians a priority of his government in rolling out the vaccine, then he would never have left uh, Senator Colbeck in charge. He has been an embarrassment to this government, and I know that Australians generally have no faith in him as a minister when it comes to aged care. 
Now, Senator uh, Colbeck quite clearly, despite what Senator Henderson, who is a Victorian by the way, uh, denies that there needs to be an apology to the Victorian people, quite it almost leaves me speechless that she could come into this place and try and shift the blame like the Prime Minister does, like all the ministers do, that the whole problem around the pandemic rests with Vic the Victorian Labor government. Well, it does not. The buck stops with the Prime Minister and his government when it uh, is a matter of rolling out the vaccine and when it comes to quarantine in this country. Now, we know, and I have the utmost respect for Jane Holton, a former secretary of the Department of Health, the Prime Minister's own Captain's Peak has made numerous comments and recommendations in relation to quarantine and what is needed in this country, and yet we still see uh, the government ignoring that advice. Well, quite frankly, if Senator Henderson in her contribution says that the vaccine is being rolled out at a fast rate, why is it then that we have less than 3 per cent of the Australian population that's been fully vaccinated? Heavens, I'd hate to see them if they were going at a slow pace. This is really frustrating for people who have relatives and friends and their loved ones in residential aged care. Because what we have seen is neglect by this government and in particular by uh, Senator Colbeck and his responsibility around aged care. And that is ensuring that not only were the aged care residents in these residential homes have been fully vaccinated, and we know that they all haven't been, but he has failed in his duty to ensure that aged care workers have had the opportunity to be fully vaccinated. And they still don't know how many workers have in fact been vac vaccinated. But it's even worse than that, because knowing that we are still in this pandemic, knowing still that the virus is mutating around the world, and we have various uh, different versions now in Australia, they took away the supplement that was being paid to aged care workers in this country to ensure that they were not being forced to go and work across a number of sites, because we all know they're so lowly paid. And what did this government do? They stopped it. And yet the pandemic is still going. How irresponsible is that? Where is the leadership? Where is the strategy for ensuring that we get ahead of the game when it comes to rolling out the vaccines and getting ahead of this, this pandemic? They don't have one. They don't have one. And there's no way that anyone, including Senator Henderson, come, come into this chamber and try and spin it because we know that they have failed in their basic duty of care to older residents in this country. Because we know of those older Australians who were in residential care that died, the virus was taken into those homes through workers. And what have they done to remedy that situation? They've taken away the supplement. They have not supported to the degree that they should with ensuring that aged care workers have been vaccinated. What we do believe is there might be some 9 per cent of the workforce that have been vaccinated. There's over 360,000 people working in aged care. So I've got to tell you, 9 per cent is not very many of them, and it isn't good enough. Quite frankly, people on that side of the chamber should be quite ashamed of their government's contribution when it comes to ensuring that Australians, and particularly older Australians and their workers and their carers, are, have been actually vaccinated. And we're not even talking about yet people in disability and their carers. But this government, as they always are, are so arrogant, they think they can just spin their way out of any situation. I have never in my lifetime, and I've been following politics since I was a, a young student in high school, I've never known a Prime Minister 
who will let the lies just slip off his lips as easy as this Prime Minister does on a daily basis. And the really sad thing is, I think he believes his own lies. I really do. He believes his own lies. And he is now being seen for the deceptive, very shonky Prime Minister that he is. And quite frankly, Senator, the Australian Senator people Polly. deserve so Senator much Polly. more. Uh, point of order over here. Order, uh, Acting Chair, um, it is against standing orders to reflect on people both in this place and in the other place, and they are personal reflections, uh, and they should be withdrawn. Um, I, I note there's been fairly robust debate in the chamber this afternoon. Senator, you might just want to clarify co comments and, and, and move on. Thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy uh, President. It is shocking, as a senator, have to come into this chamber and expose the shortcomings of the Prime Minister of this country. But I will come into this chamber every day and draw attention to the mismanagement and the lack of compassion and the lack of urgency in relation to us being able as a country to get ahead of the game when it comes to this pandemic. And quite frankly, the minister does owe the Victorian community an apology. And certainly the prime minister owes the Victorians an apology. But to have you know, the Prime Minister and other members of the government saying that this is not a race to roll out the vaccine, well, quite frankly, this is a race that we need to win. We need to get ahead of this virus. It is mutating to the extent that we don't know if there's any bounds to this. Therefore, we should be ensuring that the most vulnerable members of our community, whether they're older Australians, whether they're people with a disability, whether they're the people who are on the front line, they should have access as quickly as possible to ensure that we get ahead of this virus. But for this government to continually blame the states because they never want to accept any responsibility, the Prime Minister is being known as the Prime Minister who never takes responsibility. He's a Prime Minister who can't be trusted. Thank you, Senator Polly. I call Senator McKenzie. Thank you so much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, as a Victorian, as someone that uh, has seen my home state slowly come out of its fourth lockdown as a result of a state premier absolutely obsessed with power, uh, a, an approach, a totalitarian approach to running our state like I have never seen in this country. The facts are we face a global pandemic. And in about March last year, the Prime Minister rightly called all leaders in this country, himself as Prime Minister of the nation and every single one of our premiers and chief ministers, to discuss seriously as one nation how we were going to deal uh, with a global pandemic, uh, the likes of which we have not seen since the Spanish flu. And it was in that national cabinet that Premier McGowan, Labor Premier from WA, Premier Palaszczuk, the Labor Premier from Queensland, Chief Minister Barr, the Labor Chief Minister from the ACT, Chief Minister Gunner, the Labor Chief Minister from the NT, and Premier uh, Daniel Andrews, Premier of Dunestan, as we now know him, uh, all agreed at that uh, point. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Point of order. Thank you, Madam Senator Acting. Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. You've quite correctly ruled that uh, members should be referred to by their proper titles, and I'd ask that Senator McKenzie do the same.
Thank you. Thank you. Senator, Senator Watt, your, your, your point is noted. Um, Senator Mackenzie, you wish to seek clarification on that point of order? Uh, I wish to make uh, a submission to the point of order. I was not referring to Premier Daniel Andrews anything other than that title. My home state has, in fact, become known as Danistan. I so wasn't referring to Daniel Andrews Senator, by anything other than Senator his Mackenzie, name. If, if you can, Senator Mackenzie, if you, if you can just reflect on your comments and continue your contribution. Thank you. Well, thank you for your positive ruling in my case. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I wouldn't uh, want to characterise now, it as particularly uh, positive or negative. Senator McKenzie, Senator McKenzie, I cannot leave your comment un unnoted. Um, I seek that you don't uh, reflect on my ruling, that you accept it, and you do, as I've asked you, to continue your comments, mindful of um, a decorous conversation on this matter of importance in the parliament. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Deputy President. So, coming as I do from Dunestan, all of those Labor premiers and chief ministers agreed in March that they would take responsibility for quarantine and we would take responsibility for other aspects of dealing as a nation with a global pandemic. And you know what? Uh, you know, Premier McGowan, it's been tough on the borders, but you know what? Hasn't, doesn't hold a candle to Daniel Andrews' failures. Premier Palaszczuk, at least you can contact trace in Queensland. In Victoria, they cannot contact trace a zebra crossing Collins Street after 18 months. And so if you want to talk about where the failures in our system are in this country, I lay it firmly at the feet of the failures of ministers, from health ministers, uh, right up to the Premier in my home state of Victoria, who, 18 months after the fact, have only one trick in their back pocket on how to uh, deal with outbreaks in my home state, and that is to lock everybody down. Everyone back on, put your masks back on, can't leave home, can't get married, can't bury your loved ones, can't get elective surgery done, can't open your business. The latest lockdown, the first seven days, uh, cost regional Victoria $150 million. Just sounds like a number to people who don't care about small businesses, but these are people who've put their mortgages uh, on the line to run these businesses and have absolutely no certainty. And you know how confident people are in Dunestan about our state government's ability to manage uh, uh, the COVID-19. your seat. Point of order, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I remind you. Well, I, I asked. I noted that you asked Senator McKenzie uh, to reflect on her language, and I can see that she's um, flagrantly ignoring you. And I ask that you bring her to order, please. Thank you. Uh, Oh, we're getting a little exercise here. Yes, Senator Sizelja. On the point of order, um, it's not clear to me at all uh, what the use of language by Senator McKenzie, how that could possibly breach a standing order. And if there is to be a ruling against Senator McKenzie, it would be good if that was clarified. Because on my reading of the standing orders, there is no standing order that is offended. Thank, thank you for your contribution there, um, Senator Sizelja. Can, can I just indicate to you, Senator McKenzie, that it is good practice to speak in plain English so that the people of the state might recognise that you are speaking to them? Um, and I encourage you to use the term Victoria. I'm assuming you are a proud senator of the state. It would be helpful if you could refer to it as Victoria um, going forward in the debate. Thank you. Our current malaise. I am a, a proud Victorian. And, and just, just to assure you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that everyone in Victoria understands where we're talking about when we talk about Danistan, uh, because we are actually Senator living in a totalitarian McKenzie, please take state. A seat. But Senator McKenzie, resume your seat. Yes, Senator Watt. I think you know what I'm going to say, Madam Acting Deputy President. I mean, the Senator keeps ignoring your your requests. Um, she's making adverse reflections on uh, the Premier of another state, um, and uh, I believe that I, sub I submit that that's unparliamentary language. Sorry, there's a point of order. 
Senator Watt, I'm ruling on Senator Watt's hearing. Right. Matter first, I'll come to you in a moment, Senator McGrath. I bel Trust me, I'll come to you. Senator Watt, your point is not. So, Senators, um, I, I did use the word decorous. I think that this has descended way past that. Um, Senator McKenzie, I, I think it's pretty clear that you know, this is a heated issue and it matters to everyone. It would be helpful if you could make a contribution that doesn't uh, ignore the general guidance that I'm attempting to give you. And I would ask senators if we could take the temperature down a little with regard to this debate. Uh, just, uh, Senator just McGrath. Clarification. Is Danistan being ruled as unparliamentary? Senator McGrath. So it's, it's either the senator can either say Danistan or cannot say Danistan. We, we need a ruling either way because Labor clearly are on slippery slope or slippery stairs indeed. Senator McGrath, uh, please take a seat. And just to be clear, there is no point of order. And if you wish to have a debate of that, I suggest you find another vehicle uh, to advance that in the parliament. Sorry, sorry, on the point of order, we just... Senator McGrath, we are moving on. There no, will be no further points of order on this particular matter. Senator McGrath, please take your seat. I call Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I do thank my colleagues for their support. It is like living in a gulag, living in Victoria for the last 18 months, where at any given moment this guy, because he cannot contact trace, because he's got a bureaucracy that's doing their best but doesn't have the systems in place, uh, is being locked down at a moment's notice in such a draconian way. When you've got other, and this isn't about Labor versus Liberal. This is not, because I, I praise Senator the Chief Boyd. Minister of the ACT, Ms. Chief Minister Barr, when he actually recognised that regional Victorians didn't carry the same COVID risk that someone from Melbourne might have at, at an earlier breakout. And so he sensibly applied a definition of a hotspot that was nuanced, that just wasn't this carte blanche, lock up and leave approach of Daniel Andrews in my home state. That is the reality. So for those to characterise how Victorian senators in this place feel about how our citizenry is being treated, how our economy is being decimated, how 26,000 people fled at the end of last year to other states to live. And if you had have seen the lineup of cars and four-wheel drives with tents stuffed in the back and caravans hitched on the back, families shoved in it so they could exit Melbourne as quickly as possible uh, at the, the start of the last lockdown, you would think you're in a third world country and we're about to have a military coup. That is actually the reality, because none of these decisions are being made on medical advice. They are simply being made by an incompetent state government who cannot get its act together despite 18 months. And I will call once again for a nationally consistent approach to a definition of a hotspot. That would be great. A nationally consistent approach to handling quarantine and a consistent approach to contact tracing, because Labor states have been able to keep themselves open. Liberal states have been able to keep themselves open and going, but there is something decaying and wrong at the heart of the state Labor government in my home state of D, ending with N, um, that, that really you have to live there to understand what it feels like. And at the last, we have presentations to uh, hospitals and to specialists on mental health issues by young people increasing upwards of 30 per cent as a result of this behaviour. We have elective surgeries, people in danger now uh, of not getting the health care they need because of uh, these restrictions. It is absolutely unprecedented, it is unwarranted and it is simply because of their incompetence. And for those opposite to come in here from states not from that are having to endure this, this, this particular motion 
has been lodged by a Western Australian Labor senator, not even someone who's actually having to live with the reality of these decisions, uh, really gets on our goat. I mean, if you, act, if you had to go through it, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't believe it. Towns like Mildura, 550 clicks from Melbourne, had lockdown restrictions forced upon them, despite recording zero cases. Not zero cases this week, this month, this year. Zero cases ever. But we're going to lock down your main street. We're going to stop you burying your loved ones, which we saw a tragic case in Warrnambool. A mother begging to have a funeral uh, for her primary school age son down in Warrnambool um, denied an exemption by a Premier who cares more about uh, inducing Stockholm syndrome in his citizenry to secure the next election than he actually does yeah, good question than he actually does about the health, well-being and economic future of our once very proud state. We have you coming in here taking cheap political shots when you all know the Premier's made that decision, when you all know we've fast-tracked an MOU uh, for a federal quarantine facility uh, in Victoria, that we took that proposal from the Victorian Labor government, despite them not offering to put a cent on the table, I might add. Uh, and you do that despite knowing we're doing everything and that the vaccine rate is actually accelerating. Every single million uh, a group of Australians that are getting vaccinated uh, is happening quicker and quicker and quicker, which is great news. Despite us stepping in with essential economic support for Victorian families and businesses. Um, you want to talk about all being in this, in this together? Well, I tell you, if you live in my home state of Danistan, it doesn't feel like we're all in this together. It feels like we are paying the price for a Premier drunk on power, drunk on, drunk on power, Senator Van, drunk on power, uh, and that we've done the right thing in striking the balance. And I call on all leaders of this nation to develop a consistent approach to hotspots and quarantine so Thank that we you. actually can Thank deal you, with the pandemic. Thank you, Senator And I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I agree with the need for ministers to apologise to Victorians and all Australians. This includes ministers from state governments, particularly Queensland, Victoria and Western Australia, and the federal government. But let's dive deeper. After 16 months, we still have virtually no data and certainly no plan. People are feeling scared, confused. Some are now terrified about the vaccine because crucial uniform Crucial universal human needs are not being met. Needs like security, health, reassurance, confidence, honesty, leadership, direction, care and competence. Where's the plan for managing this virus and managing our economy? The inconsistent behaviour across states and nationally reveals no plan. Queensland, Victoria and WA have deepened fear and confusion. Ministers are lurching from event to event, crisis to crisis. The people have been abandoned and there's just confusion and lack of accountability. There are seven strategies for managing a virus, and I've checked this with the Chief Medical Officer and the, Sec and the Secretary of the Department of Health. First one is isolation or lockdowns. The World Health Organization admits that this is used only in limited use to get control. So lockdowns are now an admission that they don't have control of their states, the state governments. They're not managing the virus. The virus is managing the states. We see now in Victoria 184 per cent increase in attempted suicides from children, 184. Lockdowns are failing. Secondly, testing, tracing, quarantine. This is partially in use, but to very poor standards. The third, third uh, factor of strategy is restrictions, things like masks and social distancing, capricious and dubious of benefit. The fourth one, vaccines. We now have deaths from vaccines, thousands of people dying overseas from vaccines. We have a wide variety of side effects, from blood clot, including blood clots, and the health minister himself has been uh, hospitalised with cellulitis as a side effect. The chief medical officer, the Therapeutic Goods Administration and the head of F Federal Department of Health refuse to declare the vaccines 100 per cent safe. And the vaccines fail to prevent transmission. 
The fifth factor, cures and prophylactics. Ivermectin, I took it in, in 2014. There have been 3.7 billion doses around the world over six decades. It's proven safe. It's cheap because it's off patent, and it's now being proven successful, highly successful, overseas. We have 655 aged care residents have died, and yet this drug is available, proven and safe. The two other factors that I won't go into. The main point is there's no plan, and governments lurch from event to event, issue to issue. They're making it up as they go. Premiers and prime ministers hide behind health officers. Australians have had enough of the fear, the fear mongering, and the spin. Australians need honest, responsible, competent leadership. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, look, it is quite amazing when you've just someone wants to just tune in. Uh, on one hand, state governments have been accused of making up the virus, and on the other hand, we're getting accused of going too hard and trying to protect you know, the citizens, whether they are from Victoria and our good state, Senator Van. Uh, and, and, and Patterson, or from any other state around the country. I mean, governments have an obligation right around this country to make sure that they protect their citizens. You know, this is a new phenomenon that we're all trying to live through. Um, and quite frankly, the contributions from, our, from some on the other side um, really, I feel like, are very juvenile. And saying that we're not trying to politicise the issue, well, sorry, but some others on the other side are being political about the issue. Trying to say that you know, the state government down in Victoria somehow just wakes up one morning and decides, oh, we just want to shut down the state because you know, we can do so. No one wants to shut down their state. No one wants to shut down their economy. But quite frankly, every state government has had to make decisions, including the federal government. Let's not forget, Prime Minister Morrison invited all the state premiers to come together around a concept called the National Cabinet. The National Cabinet set down the rules in place around how we would manage the lockdown and other factors as a result of COVID. So let's just all take a bit of a deep breath. I know, um, you know our great state of Victoria, we've had uh, quite a few challenges over the last 12 to 18 months, but nonetheless, we are managing. We are managing through those issues. And quite frankly, we have shown the rest of the world that how our, our Commonwealth integrates with our state governments, we are living quite frankly, in paradise compared to the rest of the world. Do we want to compare to how we are going over in the UK or over in the rest of Europe or the United States or Asia or Africa? Because, quite frankly, I wouldn't rather be anywhere else than here in Australia right now. So when Senator Stirl puts forward a motion, I think we all just need to read the words of what he was after. And it was around the, the, the comments that the minister, the minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care and Services made no one else but what the minister said. You know, there was a very positive record across, across the board with respect to maintain a safe border for Australia. That's what he was claiming. Now, what we are saying is that, that the minister has misrepresented this place. And time and time again, when we have put questions to him, whether it be here in question time or in estimates, he hasn't been able to provide a straightforward answer. Having to go through his pack or not being able to provide simple, simple answers to questions, how many people have been vaccinated, Minister? Cannot even get a simple answer. And we heard that today from another minister in this place when I asked a couple of minister, uh, questions to the minister uh, for the NDIS. How many people have been vaccinated who have been in a home under the care of, um, of organisations that are looking after those with a disability? And the minister wasn't able to even provide a straightforward answer, especially not understand the difference between Group 1A or Group 1B. So before we all get in here, beating our chests, saying, you know, what a, a bad job some of our state governments have been doing, I think we all need to have a look at this at ourselves and say, have we all been doing a good job? And can we make this situation better for everyone? And I'm sure Senator Van will have a contribution later on, given his uh, cheeky grin across the aisle. But look, as a nation, we do find ourselves you know, 12 months into this health event. And we are still waiting, though, sadly, for the government, the federal government, to step up, in my opinion, and take more responsibility around quarantine. So there's been the two issues that Labor has been pushing this government hard on, having a national consistent quarantine system around the country and making sure that Australians right around the country take up the vaccination to a level 
that we can then start to slowly open up our economy. Because until we get to that point, we are going to be in this scenario where we will have constant challenges about what do we do when there is an outbreak. You know, and, and recent reports uh, in the last couple of hours suggesting that New South Wales is now having a, a, a small outbreak down in the south of Sydney. There may be another one in Queensland. So before we start taking cheap pot shots here at Victoria, let's also just remember that there are other states that will have to grapple with the issue as, as soon as we start opening our economy. And ultimately, that is all that we want in this place. We want to protect our economy because the sooner that we can get out of this mess, the sooner that we can start creating more jobs and start having better outcomes for people right around the nation. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I love MPIs because it's just exactly what we always expect from Labor. They're going to throw some Dorothy Dixes at us that we can come back and, and show just how political they are going to be. And while my good friend, Senator Cody, says the cheap shots, there's nothing cheaper than this MPI today. There's nothing cheaper. We have a very safe record, mostly in Australia. But, however, as he said, I would probably have something to say about what the media have called Danistan and have on many, many occasions the media have called Danistan. So I think my good friend Senator uh, Mackenzie had every right to, to use that, that language. Now, Senator Coney was right about one thing. The states came together under national cabinet and they agreed that the states would run hotel quarantine for very good reasons. They agreed it because they have primary responsibility for the quarantine arrangements under their public health legislation. This enables those jurisdictions to best manage their public health response. And why? Well, Ch Senator Ciccone mentioned Senate estimates. And our chief medical officer said quite clearly in Senate estimates just earlier this month um, that the, um, this, the, this is clearly that hotel quarantine was made was clearly a public health matter. And that was why the decision was made, that decision being the states run that. And it's probably the most important thing that we've done in relation to keeping Australia safe since that time. And he went on to say that there's a lot of questions we've had in this committee and others about types of quarantine. But the key important part, Senator Ciccone, is you get public health issues right. And he went on to say the public health workforce sits in the states. My colleagues, he said, on HPPC have ample and very experienced people to do that work, and that is why they chose to do it. Since hotel quarantine measures were implemented, we're talking about an MPI about keeping our borders safe, over 358,000 international air arrivals have come into hotel quarantine. And among those international air arrivals, there's been an estimated 3,900 COVID cases, the majority of which were detected in hotel quarantine. This represents approximately 1.1 per cent of all international air arrivals that, had, that, were, that became COVID-19 positive. Now, out of those, only six of those have gone on to be on the household of the person, either worker or someone who has been released from quarantine. And again, I'm quoting our CMO, Professor Paul Kelly, that six out of 3,900 positive cases. That's an extraordinary record of how we have managed our borders. Managed quarantine has been Australia's first line of defence. And Professor Kelly went on to say hotel quarantine was the key, the most key, I'd say, ring of containment. But where did those cases go, those six that went out there? Well, they started going on to other things. And how have states managed where cases have got out of hotel quarantine? Well, that job is down to contact tracing. And that's where my home state, the one that the media called Danistan, has failed miserably. And every time, every sitting period last year, I challenged my Victorian Senate colleagues to talk about what was happening in Danistan. 
They never once said a word about lockdown. They never once said a word about hotel quarantine. They never once said a word about the failures of contact tracing. Now let's just look at the empirical evidence here. Australia has had, and I think this is pretty close to accurate as of today, 30,274 cases. Victoria had 20,668 cases. That was 68 per cent of cases in Victoria. Australia had, sadly, 910 deaths. Victoria had 820 of those deaths. That's 90 per cent of deaths due to COVID happened in Victoria. That empirical evidence shows a failure in my home state, my very proud home state, the one that the media call Danistan. Thank you, Senator Van. The time for discussion has expired. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to table a document relating to a petition to the House of Representatives tabled on the 15th of June, which was signed by 70,540 people, calling on the government to provide exemptions to Australia's COVID-19 international travel ban for parents of Australian citizens and permanent residents to be reunited with their children in Australia and for reunification with family to be considered a compelling and compassionate reason by the Australian Border Force. I understand that I have the agreement of whips to table the document. Is leave granted? Leaves granted. Thank you. I table the document. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation today. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. I'm seeking the call. Sorry, Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in my name. I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a matter to provide that a motion relating to consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate, and I move that the question be now put. Senator Wong. Uh, I think the only option to me is to say, seek leave to make a statement. Is leave granted? Leave. A short statement. Yeah, Senator well, Wong. isn't that, you know, that's very generous, isn't it? The leader of the government rings me at 5.08, comes in and says, I'm going to upend the program because I've got a deal, uh, including with a senator who is not here, I assume, including with a senator who is not here, uh, to require the Senate to sit at short notice late tonight uh, to resolve these three bills. I mean, this is no way to run the Senate. And if this leader of the government thinks that we are then, that, well, Senator Lambie is right. There's no way to run the country. We've seen a fair bit of that. But to, to come in here to, with Sen to senators and say to senators, we're now going to pull on at 5, 5.45, when a German is at 7.20, uh, a, a debate on three bills, which are listed later in the program, are supposed to be debated tomorrow, is pretty extraordinary and, frankly, very discourteous. Like I accept, um, I accept that uh, Senator Hanson uh, and Senator Roberts may have differences of views about the content of legislation. I accept that Senator Griff may have differences of views about content of legislation, but it is no way to legislate uh, to turn up in the chamber at quarter to six on a Wednesday night uh, and demand that the Senate sit late uh, in order to deal with this because you've got a deal. So, you know, next time this, the government wants some cooperation from the chamber around its program, you might want to think back to this moment, Senator Birmingham. You might want to think back to this moment. Uh, it really is amateur hour on legislation, which is important. We have very strong differences of views with the government on the legislation, which need to be ventilated. There is a committee stage which needs to be dealt with. All of that is legitimate. What is not legitimate is to do a deal, come in here at quarter to six, and then not even want to debate on this motion. I'm only speaking because you give me the charity of allowing to speak. Senator Griff can't speak. You're going to let him. Senator Lambie can't speak. You're going to speak. You're going to let her. I mean, this is really undemocratic to turn up and say we're going to roll over the Senate program. That was our program. The Senator Birmingham's program. He's now upending because he, he wants. He's decided it's better for him. We're going to roll over our program. You know, we're not even going to let you debate it. We're not even going to let you debate it, and we're going to do it with the vote of somebody who's not here. That's what he's going to do. 
I mean, this. <laughs> I am actually a, a, quite astounded at this way of managing the chamber. I'm, I'm quite astounded that a government thinks it can just rock up, rock up with a few minutes' notice. I think 5:10. I got my first telephone call. I don't know when other senators got there. Just saying, basically, we've got the numbers. We're going to ram this through. The government's just going to rock up and up in the program and say, "Oh, by the way, senators, the Senate is going to sit tonight. It's going to deal with these three bills until we rise." I mean, what what sort of way to run the government is this? And I hope for once you might actually tell us what the dirty deal is, because usually we have to, you know, try and grab it out of you. Acting Deputy President, uh, it is really quite shameful the way this government chooses to exercise its numbers in this chamber. Uh, and it is, really, um, it is really quite shameful the, the lack of notice, the lack of courtesy to senators and to the Senate about this. Uh, and, even, uh, and equally, it is, uh, I think, demonstrating a lack of respect for this institution that the minister won't even allow this change to be properly debated. So I would say to this minister, I see uh, other crossbench senators here, you should have the courage to debate this motion. You should have the courage to debate it. If you think this is such a great idea to turn up in the Senate and say, oh, by the way, we've got to sit till as late as it takes tonight to, to pass the second reading of three bills, three bills, and I'm only going to give you an hour and a bit's notice, I'm going to upend my program. Will you come in here and defend it? You stand up and defend it and explain why that's in the interests of democracy. Because as far as we can see, it is not. It is not. It is no way to run this chamber. It is disrespectful to uh, other senators and it is disrespect, disrespectful to the, this chamber as a legislative chamber. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Waters. Well, what a absolute debacle we've seen today. First, they're blocking a bill, which has only happened five times in the history of the Senate. And now, at five seconds to midnight, proverbially, I get a missed call from um, Senator Birmingham, and here we are. We're going to be sitting all night to do second reading speeches on three contentious bills. And conveniently, the time for voting on those bills tomorrow will be when we would otherwise be doing motions. How convenient for this government to be avoiding scrutiny uh, of the matters that we would have put to vote tomorrow in motions, because you couldn't arrange your way out of a paper bag. Um, this is a disgusting abusive process. This government uses this chamber like a plaything. It picks up process and puts it down as it suits. This is sheer opportunism on display, and once again One Nation are facilitating this government, treating the Senate like a rubber stamp. Um, and here we go. Uh, yep. See you later at the next election. Thank you, Senator Waters. The, the question is that the question be now put. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath tell if the ayes and Senator McCarthy tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I will now put the motion moved by the minister to suspend standing orders. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bell for one minute. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McGrath tell if the ayes and Senator McCarthy tell if the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I move that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question be now put. The question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the question now be put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McGrath tell off the ayes. Senator McCarthy tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McGrath tell off the ayes and Senator McCarthy tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move the motion as circulated. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Birmingham is circulated to be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Uh, I am informed prior to that we return to the consideration of documents. Sorry, Senator Hanson. Sorry, my apologies, yeah. Senator Hanson. No, I seek leave to table a non conforming petition. It's a petition against vaccine passports for interstate travel. The total um, number of signatures of 56,032. Is leave grant order? Order, Senator Watt. Is is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Thank you. I understand that I have the agreement of the whips to table the document. Yes. <coughs> yes, Senator Hanson. That's... Okay. I tabled the document. Thank you, Senator Hanson. So I'm just. Looking for the documents on page four, am I correct, Clark? Documents on page four of today's order of business. You, Senator, who is I'm just saying, who's are you seeking is anyone seeking the call? Is anyone if if we're not seeking the call yeah, sure. Senator Senator Wong. Well, whilst uh, people are trying to um, check where we are at, it's unsurprising that uh, you know, there is a little bit of confusion in the chamber about what happens next, given that we've just had the program upended. Um, 
And I again reiterate. Are you seeking leave to make a statement, Senator? Oh, well, I was just, you know, I'm passing time, time at the uh, lectern, actually. Um, <laughs> if, we're, if we're not but doing I that, I, we, I, I will. Um, someone could hand you a red, and I'm sure. Uh, I'm all right. Um, Thank you. But if not, then I'll move on to the next item, which I believe will be the legislation. I'm looking at the clerk having just stepped into the chamber. Legislation committee reports. They are matters. Senator Fieravanti Wells. Thank you. <laughs> I present delegated legislation monitor eight of 2021 of the Standing Committee for the scrutiny of delegated legislation, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Request Senator Fieravanti Wells, you can speak to that motion. Thank you. Uh, Mr President, um, I rise to speak to the tabling of the scrutiny of delegated legislation, Delegated Legislation Monitor 8 of 2021. I would like to take this opportunity to draw, draw the Chamber's attention to the Committee's scrutiny concerns regarding the Australian Renewable Energy Agency Amendment 2020-2021 Budget Programs Regulations 2021. The instrument amends the principal ARENA regulations to allow ARENA to invest in non-renewable energy technologies. The committee is concerned that this instrument expands the remit of ARENA beyond what was envisaged by Parliament when the Act was passed and may therefore be beyond the scope of this enabling Act. It is the view of the committee that there is nothing in the explanatory memorandum to the bill preceding the Act to suggest that it was ever contemplated that ARENA would have the ability to foster anything other than renewable energy technologies. The introduction of these significant changes to the role of this agency via delegated legislation instead of primary legislation is of significant scrutiny concern to the committee. As a result, the committee will write to Minister Taylor about these uh, scrutiny concerns. I will update the chamber about progress in relation to resolving this important matter in due course. Concerningly, this is not the only instrument the committee has scrutinised recently which significantly expands on entities, jurisdiction and powers. Earlier this year, I advised the Chamber of the Committee's concerns regarding the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Amendment Law Enforcement Agencies Regulation 2020. This instrument significantly expands the jurisdiction and therefore the investigative powers of the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity to include the ACCC, APRA, ASIC and, and the ATO. I am pleased to advise that today the Attorney-General has made an undertaking to amend this instrument so that it will repeal in three years. The committee welcomes this undertaking, which will provide an opportunity for this significant expansion of Ackley's jurisdiction to be set out in standalone primary legislation prior to the sunset date in 2024, or at least in a further regulation which would provide an opportunity for further parliamentary consideration of this significant measure. I would also like to advise the Chamber about significant progress that has been made in relation to the Committee's ongoing scrutiny concerns regarding delegated legislation in the Treasury portfolio, which modifies the operation of primary legislation in some cases for over 10 years. I thank the Treasurer for his continued good faith engagement on this issue with the committee. I am pleased to advise that last month the Treasurer made a number of undertakings to the committee to ensure that explanatory material for instruments which modify the up operation of primary legislation will, in the future, include the information and justifications required by the committee. The Treasurer also undertook to consider the duration of these instruments, including whether shorter timeframes can be applied and to consider whether amendments to the primary legislation can be made instead. In this regard, the Treasurer has already indicated that an expansion to the types of services that BAS agents may provide and exemptions for employee share schemes will be moved from delegated to primary legislation. Further, the Treasurer advised the committee that his office and department 
will continue to engage with all of the agencies in his portfolio, including the regulators, to ensure the committee's concerns are addressed before instruments are made. The committee looks forward to continuing to work with the Treasurer to address these scrutiny issues over the longer term. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation, Monitor 8 of 2021, to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Ferravanti Wells. Just to clarify, could you formally table the report? Oh, yes, I tabled the report. Thank you very much, Senator Ferravanti Wells. Uh, Senator Patterson. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security on its review of the listing of the Sonnenkrieg Division as a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Thank you, Senator Patterson. I rise today to present a statement of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security for the review of the regulations listing the Sonnenkrieg Division as a terrorist organisation under the Criminal Code Act 1995. Regulations that specify an organisation as a terrorist organisation cease to have effect on the third anniversary of the day on which they take effect. Organisations can be relisted, provided the minister is satisfied on reasonable grounds that the organisation continues to directly or indirectly engage in terrorism or advocate the doing of a terrorist act. The Sonnenkrieg Division has not previously been listed as a terrorist organisation by the Australian government. It is the first extreme right-wing organisation to be listed in Australia. The committee is currently conducting an inquiry into extremist movements and radicalism in Australia and may make further recommendations. The regulations to list the Sonnenkrieg Division were tabled in the parliament on 23 March 2021. The committee's review examines the minister's decision to list this organisation. Section 1021A of the Criminal Code provides that the committee may review a regulation which lists or relists an organisation as a terrorist organisation and report its comments and recommendations to each House of the Parliament before the end of the applicable 15-day sitting uh, disallowance period. The statement serves this purpose and is being presented within the required period. In determining whether the regulations listing this organisation should be supported, the committee reviewed the merits in accordance with the Minister for Home Affairs explanatory statement, ASIO statement of reasons for the organisation and other publicly available information. This included a submission received from the Australia-Israel Jewish Affairs Council. Their submission is supportive of listing and makes note of the threat of, to the Australian Jewish community by individuals and groups with, who have racist and nationalist ideologies and suggests the government to consider additional approaches to combating the threat. In its deliberations, the committee determined that the Sonnenkrieg Division seeks to encourage lone actor terrorist attacks against its political, racial and ethnic enemies. SKD members acting on behalf of the organisation have encouraged, promoted and glorified terrorist acts through online propaganda. SKD, SKD adheres to an ideology that is violently opposed to multi-ethnic Western societies, and there is a possibility that a lone, act attack, lone actor attack directed or inspired by SKD could result in harm to Australians. Whilst Australians are not directly involved in SKD, its encouragement, promotion and glorification of lone actor attacks could inspire some Australian extremists, and the availability of SKD propaganda online has the potential to contribute to the radicalisation of others. The committee encourages the government to continue investigating other like-minded organisations with, with a mind to listing them as terrorist organisations under the Criminal Code if they meet the criteria. The committee will continue its own investigations in this regard through its concurrent inquiry into extremist movements and radicalism in Australia. In examining the evidence that has been provided, the committee is satisfied with the listing processes and considers that they have been followed appropriately for this organisation. The committee therefore supports the listing of the organisation under Division 102 of the Criminal Code in order to protect Australians and Australia's interests and finds no reason to disallow the regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, Senator Keneally. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I rise to take note of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security Statement for the Review of regula re Regulations Listing Sonnenkrieg Division as a Terrorist Organisation under the Criminal Code Act 1995. I acknowledge the comments of the Chair of the Committee, Senator Patterson, and do associate myself with his remarks as a member of the Intelligence uh, and Security Committee. Uh, I, I note that this is a uh, bipartisan report and a unanimous report of the Intelligence and Security Committee, and I also wish to place on the record my appreciation 
uh, for the uh, way in which the committee operates uh, in the national interest and in a bipartisan fashion. Um, I do want to make some comments regarding uh, the listing of the Sonnenkrieg Division and the rise of right-wing extremism in Australia, uh, but in doing so I want to be clear that I support Senator Patterson and his remarks and the listing that has been provided here today. Uh, Sonnenkrieg Division is the first right-wing organization to be listed in Australia. And for anyone who's been paying attention, the fact that right-wing extremist groups have found an audience in Australia sadly comes as no shock. What is shocking is that it has taken this government this long to prescribe just one right-wing terrorist organization. What is shocking is how long it has taken for this government to realize how very real and very serious the threat posed by right-wing extremism is to our safety and our democracy. And I do use the term right-wing extremism deliberately because as the ASIO Director General has said, uh, he is using terms such as religiously motivated and politically uh, motivated ideology, uh, but he also acknowledges uh, that it is appropriate at times to use the specific term of right-wing extremism to name the threat uh, that we face, and this is a certainly an appropriate term to use in the context of the Sonnenkrieg division. What is shocking is that this government has not done more to censure those in their own ranks who promote or permit dangerous right-wing ideas. Last month, ASIO Director General Mr. Mike Burgess told Senate estimates that right-wing extremism is approaching 50% of ASIO's counterterrorism workload. Only three years ago, this was just 16%. And in those three years, we have watched in horror as an Australian man, an Australian right-wing extremist, radicalized here in this country, attacked two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, killing 51 people and injuring dozens more. We've seen his manifesto and his actions spread and find an audience online, joining other racist, divisive and hateful ideas that seek to inspire acts of harm. And we've watched those who expound such ideas deliberately navigate the law as it stands to avoid the sanction e even as they clearly encourage violence, display paraphernalia, and propagate ideas that disgust and dismay. We've watched again in horror as the product of a conspiracy theory and the extreme right wing attacked the United States Capitol in January, a day where democracy came under direct assault from an ideology many were too slow to take seriously. Yet this was a day the Prime Minister's good friend and far-right conspiracy theorist Tim Stewart described as, quote, one of the greatest days on earth. The FBI has warned us that this was no anomaly that QAnon and its far-right bedfellows could carry out more violence. That's a warning that came as recently as this week. The NYPD has warned that this is a broad movement with anti-Semitic underpinnings. And the Biden administration has warned of the risks of underestimating how quickly, how easily, far-right digital campaigns can cross into the physical domain. In January, and we, in, January in Washington, we saw all too clearly what happens when the far right is allowed political space, when far right extremist thinking is not immediately excised and far right extremist proponents not immediately exiled from political influence. That such thinking can gain traction in some members of those opposite and most concerningly in the personal relationships of Australia's Prime Minister should appall us all. We should be appalled that someone who could believe and promote such fear and hatred could be trusted by Mr. Morrison to house sit the official residence at Kirribilli. And it should appall us that Mr. Morrison will still not answer questions about whether he has received briefings from his department or other agencies on the dangers posed by QAnon. We cannot let extreme right-wing views gain any more ground here, for we have seen how very quickly what seems like a fringe idea 
what seems ridiculous, what seems unthinkable, can become a tragic, terrifying reality. Here in Australia, our security agencies are warning of the increasing threat posed by right-wing extremism. 50% of ASIO's domestic terrorism workload, Mr. Burgess says, 50%. And yet this government has only seen fit to list one right-wing group, and only this year. Our Five Eyes partners have been awake to this threat for some time. We are the last of our partners to recognize right-wing extremism for the terrorism it is, but the Morrison government has been sadly caught sleeping. This is why Labor called for a bipartisan inquiry into extremist movements and radicalization. What we heard from the experts so far is that right-wing extremists in Australia are more organized, sophisticated, ideological, and active than ever before. In Australia this year, right-wing extremists have been arrested on counter-terrorism charges, in possession of weapons and improvised explosives. And right-wing groups, extremist groups, have gathered openly, burning crosses, chanting Nazi slogans, championing white supremacy, in open defiance of everything Australia stands for as a country and as a society. Make no mistake, the threat of right-wing extremism is real and it is increasing. Mr. P er, Madam Deputy Acting President, the PJCIS found that Australians had little direct involvement with Sonnenkrieg Division, but its reach into Australia via its online activities posed a threat through its potential to radicalize and its incitement of terrorist attacks. But there are other right-wing groups active in Australia, far-right, I should say, Madam Deputy President, there are other far-right extremist groups active in Australia that also meet the requirements of prescription. They are hiding in plain sight. They are the ones gathering and terrorizing our community here in Australia already. The pandemic has shifted more of our interactions online, and this along with the economic and social impacts and anxieties and uncertainties of the last 15 months has intensified the spread of right-wing extremist narratives. What is most concerning, terrifying even, is that some in the media and some in politics entertain these insidious, dangerous views. We cannot allow the mainstreaming of these views. The Morrison government must sever itself from those who promote or give comfort to conspiracies and far-right extremist views, even if they exist in the coalition party room. The Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, never takes responsibility. He always finds someone else to blame. But this is about our safety and our democracy. This responsibility is too important for him to shirk. We need to deny territory, online and otherwise, to the extreme right wing and their corrosive ideas. We must work with online providers to monitor and remove abhorrent, violent, extremist right-wing con content. We must encourage prevention through improved de-radicalization programs and interrupt radicalization when it's occurring. And we must ensure our security agencies have the right funding, settings and legislation to combat the evolving far-right extremist threat. The government has the prescription powers to list extremist right-wing groups as terrorist organizations. They should do so to make abundantly clear that Australia will not tolerate racist, divisive, and violent ideology. I call on the government to make clear they, they care about the safety of all Australians by listening to our national security experts and taking the threat, the threat of far-right extremists seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Shikoni. Oh. Sorry, Senator Shikoni. I'll just put the question on um, the motion to take note of the report. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Shikoni. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, at the at the request of the Chair of the Standing Committee for Scrutiny of Bills, Senator Polly, I present Scrutiny Digest No. 8 of 2021. Thank you. Are you tabling the report, Senator Shikoni? Thank you very much. There being no further speakers on committee reports, I will ask if there are any ministerial statements. No? Uh, 
We move on to committee memberships. The president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. I call the minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Do we have messages from the House of Representatives? The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. The Fuel Security Bill 2021 and the Fuel Security Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2021. I call the Minister. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion is moved by the Minister to be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to make arrangements in relation to fuel security and for related purposes. A bill for an act to deal with consequential and transitional matters arising from the enactment of the Fuel Security Act 2021 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that these bills now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated into Hansard. Leave is granted. The question is that the um, motion moved by. Oh, ap apologies, um, Minister. I move that the debate now be adjourned. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. And I call the clerk to call on business. Business of the Senate. Notice a motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Lambie, reference to Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee regarding Australia's relationship with the People's Republic of China. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting Deputy Madam President. Do I need to do my? I ask that the business. Um, Senator Lambie, you need to move the motion. Okay, thank you. Uh, I ask that the, biz, that the business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Senator Lambie, all you have to do is move the motion and then you can speak to the motion. <laughs> so confuse me. Uh, I move the motion. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Righto. The head of Home Affairs says the drums of war are beating with China, but the Coalition and Labor don't want the Senate to look into it again. Our largest trading partner is squeezing the bejesus out of our beef farmers, wineries and barley growers, but the major parties reckon there's no reason for the Senate to get involved. A country that is known for human rights abuses and its disdain, disdain for democracy is openly trying to influence what goes on in this chamber. They've even hacked this building on numerous occasions, but the government and opposition still aren't interested in investigating. They don't want us to look at it. They don't want us to mention the word China, let alone CCP. They don't want us to pull up the rug and see what's underneath. They don't want us to do what I reckon 80 per cent of Australians would like us to do, to have a good look at what is going on in China. God forbid. Don't want us to go there. Well, here's a wake-up call. Get your boots on. Because that's what most Australians want. That's what they want. And I bet what you'll find will not be pretty. And I think we know that, they know that, so let's just get on with it. It will not reflect well on the, on the state of our major parties, who have been caught more than once taking money from people with links to the Chinese Communist Party. It won't look good for defence, who have stuffed up our military procurement so badly that it's going to take a decade or more for us to build submarines that take China 18 months to bring online something seriously wrong. And it won't look good for our Foreign Affairs Department, who have spent months playing politics on the Belt and Road Initiative in Victoria, but are too scared to touch the port of Darwin. Keep going on with it. Keep showing them who's, who's running the show here. That's what needs to be done. This will be the fifth or sixth time Senator Patrick and I have tried to get up an inquiry. We are not asking a lot. We're asking what many Australians are asking. They want to know more. Every time the majors have voted against it, and that's exactly what you've done. What are you scared of? Time and time again, they tell us nothing to see here. Move it along. Let the bureaucrats deal with it. While one person, a senior bureaucrat, is saying, hey, beating the drum here, going to war. Which one is it? Let the people in fancy suits at the G7s and the WTOs and whatever else have the conversations over tea and sort all of this out. This is the sad truth of this matter. 
and the major parties won't let the Australian people have a say in what's going on here. They don't want us to get a good look at, look at it through a parliamentary inquiry. They won't front up to the Senate and say, yes, we have a problem here. Yes, it's difficult, but we trust in the key principle of Australian democracy, in our own democracy, that the people should have a say about the things that affect their lives. This is where we're at. The Senate is a place where we're supposed to review. We're supposed to debate, to take our time, go into detail, make it a better country. That's where our strength comes from. And the way we elect people in the Senate is designed to protect the small states from being controlled by the large ones. It's a sentiment we in Australia should be familiar with. The little guy needs some help. Give a helping hand. And when it works, it works well. We pass things, we block things, we debate, we turn up, we do our jobs. This motion, this inquiry, this is part of our job. As difficult as it is, as difficult as it is, it's part of our job up here. If you're going to let fear hold you back, then none of us should be here. Fear will never achieve anything, let alone get to the bottom of it. If you want to let fear rule your life, go be my guest. But that is not a way to run a country. This is the sad part about it all. We are trying to defend our own democratic principles from a country that is hostile to them. But our own parliament is failing to meet the standard we set for it and is failing the people of this country by not doing what it should be doing out of fear. We are in terrible shape here and this has been going on for way too long. It is not going away. It is not going away. How many times does Senator Patrick and I have to move this motion before the Coalition and Labor wake up? It is time to wake up. It is time to wake up. It will go against you in the next election, I can assure you. Go out there and have a look and listen to the Australian people, because they are onto it. They are onto it. No good ignoring it, because they are already onto it. They are miles ahead of us. What we're asking for shouldn't be controversial. It's not about playing politics or making a cheap shot or making or looking for a headline. It is as plain as day that we have a problem and it should be as plain as day that we can't do nothing about it. This is something we cannot sit here and say, nothing to see here, don't want to deal with this, can't deal with this. This is not how leaders act. This is not how our parliament in this country should act. We can't go to war with our biggest trading partner and expect that to be cost-free. We're going to pay a cost for that. But we either shut up and don't say anything and let them, to con let them continue to walk all over the top of us, or we stand up for ourselves. We stand up for this country and we stand up for the people that walk the soil in this country. That's what we do. We have to do and we have to be brave and do that. Ignoring it will not, no issue, it doesn't matter what it is, ignoring it will never make that issue go away. It will only make it worse. That is human psych. That is how it works. By suppressing an inquiry, suppressing questions, that isn't how you ease tensions. You can't wish away this problem. You can't pull out your wand. It's not going away. And by ignoring it, it's making it worse. And when you wake up to that fact, it's going to be worse even still. And trying to make amends the further we go along is going to be even more harder. Deal with it today. We have a problem with China. Be honest about it and deal with it. Show the courage that this country needs. We're being told here that everything's under control and we just need to leave it to the unelected bureaucrats and public servants to take care of Ever while we keep ourselves busy asking each other softball questions in question time. That's not how this works. This Senate is an institution of the Australian democracy. It's an institution that has been threatened by the growing aggression of the Chinese Communist Party. We've been hacked. We've had our phones, our computers, our networks in here in this building hacked by the people we're pinning our hopes for on an economic recovery. How stupid are we? And we're supposed to be some of the smartest and brightest up here. Well, if that's smart and bright, God blow me over. 
Our security, uh, here, even our security agencies say that there have been about a 500 cases of foreign attempts, agents attempting to influence Australian politics in recent months. 500 cases. And most of it's coming from the CCP. That's right, China. That's where it's coming from. But we're running on fear. We're running in the wrong direction. We're certainly not running the Australian way. They're actively trying to shape how our politicians behave when we're up here in Parliament. That's what they're doing. And if you can't see that, then wake up or go to Specsavers and have a good look, because that is what is going on. Party agents are working their way into political offices and party fundraising events, and they're collecting information. They're using it to their advantage against us. Against us. They're doing what they can to change the decisions that get made in this very chamber right here. These votes, these decisions we make, they want to pull the strings on. They want to get a say on what we do in here. Well, it's about time we told them they're not getting a say in this parliament. They're not getting a say on how to run this country. And we can't do that by being silent and showing fear. It's time to set the record straight and say, we don't give a stuff what your consequences are, but we're not putting up with your behaviour and your threats against our own sovereign nation. And sit there and watch those veterans over years have their lives taken from them by fighting for this country for its freedoms while you're letting the CCP walk all over the top of us. Why is it so controversial to say the Senate should look into this? Why is it so controversial to say the Australians have a right to know about this? It's only through institutions like the Senate that we get the ability to have an open, transparent conversation with the Australian people about what's at stake, what's at risk, what's our choices in the future. I don't think we've got time up our sleeve, I can tell you that much right now. So once again, if you're going to sit in here and think this is just going to go away, I don't want to deal with it, you are on another planet. You had better deal with the CCP and you had better deal with China and you had better do it quickly. And if the drums of war are beating, how loud, how far away, how long? If Australia's relationship with the Chinese Communist Party is what's contributing to that rising tension, then don't we in the Senate owe it to the nation to investigate what parts of the relationship are making us vulnerable and what parts need to change? The first thing that we need to change in here is to show some courage. We're an island nation. And last time I checked, we didn't have missiles all around the outside of us to scare anybody, let alone China. God forbid we have just enough troops to fill over half the MCG. That's where we're at. And I can guarantee there's only about 3,000 of them that are fighters. Combat, they call it. So if you want to sit here and see where China goes with all this, then be my guest. But I would suggest we start leading from the front foot and we start controlling the situation instead of the other way around before it's too late to do anything, which is exactly where we are heading. Now, all we're asking for is an, inqu is, is an inquiry. That is it. We already know there are elements of influence from China and Australia that are positive. Of course they are. But there's a lot of stuff coming from the Chinese government that scares the bejesus out of me and everybody else out there. Because we won't talk about it. Because we won't show that we're not, we don't have fear of it either. There's nothing wrong with showing a bit of fear. But for goodness sakes, come out and do something about it so you can defeat it. If there is a way to salvage the parts of our relationship with China, then that's good. And shut down the bits of the toxic, that's great. Although I don't see that happening. I think it's going to go a lot further than that. We're asking the Senate to have a grown-up conversation with the Australian people about the problems that we are facing with the CCP and China. That is what we're asking. We have problems, we have issues here. Like I said, the Australian people already know. And while you're sitting here ignoring it, you're actually not looking in good light, I can tell you. They already know. They're out there talking about it. So you put it to rest and take control of the situation and run with this inquiry. 
Let the truth come out. We need to start telling people what's going on, what the plan is. We have no plan on how to deal with them except, oh, hello, just ignore them. Pretend they're not there. They'll go away. <laughs> they ain't going away. <laughs> Let me be quite clear about that. They are not going away. And the situation is only getting worse. How much worse do you want the situation with whatever's ever left with our relationship with China, which is not much, how much further do you want this to go on? How much, long, how much more damage? Is this going to, if it's going to do damage, then great, let's blow it out of the water, let's go do it. But this slow, strangling death thing that we're doing, by just saying it's okay, nothing to see here, is putting all Australians' lives at risk. You've got no idea what their plan is for us in the future. I know something, they've got military hardware we can only dream of. They can move a hell of a lot quicker than what we can and they can shut down any trade they want tomorrow. And you're not worried about that? Well, I would be. I would be terribly worried about that, and I am. And so are millions of other Australians out there. And I can tell you what, you're doing nothing up here to settle that worry. We are doing nothing. Here's the crossbench having to drag the major parties kicking and screaming to protect this country's way of life. It's way of life. Why is that? Why is it always the crossbench who has to call this stuff out? Why is it, why is it the crossbench the only ones with courage in here? You know, at least I know when my time's up, I tried. I got out there and fight for it. I'll be able to sleep at night time. Good luck to the rest of you. And God hope we're not at a war. I know the conversations we're having here will be hard about this and it's going to be painful for some people, but it's already painful. And we'll be capable of having sensitive conversations without falling into cruelty. We do it a lot. If we're asking for an inquiry into sports medicine or water trading or climate change, we'd have had this inquiry a long time ago. But no, it's China and all of a sudden Australia's lost its nerve, it's grown cold feet and says, oh, I don't want anything to do with this, I'm done. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Rice. Deputy President, I rise to speak in support of Senator Lambie's referral motion about Australia's relationship in China. The Australian Greens are supporting this referral, as we have supported a number of referrals in the past, because our relationship with China is a really important topic that we think deserves serious scrutiny. And there's a whole, it's a complex. Our relationship with China is incredibly complex. It's exactly the sort of stuff that the Senate should be considering in a full, proper inquiry process. Our relationship includes issues of human rights, as well as our trading relationship, as well as the broader scope of foreign policy issues. And it's also important, we think, to actually be having an inquiry that puts the issues on the table in a careful, considered way so that we can have the debate about China in a careful, thoughtful way. And in particular, as part of this discussion about China, we must be loudly anti-racist and fight attacks against Australians of Chinese heritage, including attacks from those within this chamber calling on Chinese Australians to pass loyalty tests. I mean, this inquiry would be an excellent opportunity to really thoroughly consider these issues. It's, as I said, it's exactly the sort of complex issue that the Senate should be considering. So I now want to step through some of the issues that the Australian Greens think would be covered in an inquiry if we were to get one up. I mean, starting with human rights. And we believe that in our relationships with any country around the world, that human rights should be absolutely at the core and at the centre of our relationship. We have been consistent in our calls for action on human rights by governments around the world, including the Chinese government. In a state visit by the then um, Chinese President Hu Jintao in 2003, Greens MP Michael Organ wore a Tibetan lapel pin to symbolise the concerns that we've raised about the situation of the Tibetan people. And tragically, despite the many years that have passed since then, the human rights situation in China has not, certainly not got better. And in fact, it, it's, it's got worse. 
Human Rights Watch summarised in a recent report how Beijing's repression, insisting on political loyalty to the Chinese Communist Party, deepened across the country. In Hong Kong, following six months of large-scale protests in 2019, the Chinese government imposed a draconian national security law on 30 June, its most aggressive assault on Hong Kong people's freedom since the transfer of sovereignty in 1997. In Xinjiang, Turkic Muslims continue to be arbitrarily arbitrarily detained on the basis of their identity, while others are subjected to forced labour, mass surveillance and political indoctrination. In Inner in Mongolia, protests broke out in September when education authorities decided to replace Mongolian with Mandarin Chinese in a number of classes in the region's schools. And authorities in Tibetan areas continue to severely restrict religious freedom, speech, movement and assembly and fail to redress popular concerns about mining and land grabs by local officials, which often involve intimidation and unlawful use of force by security forces. And I have met with Tibetans, I have met with Uyghurs, I have met with Hong Kongers who have told me what the the on-the-ground impact of those policy is, policies are. And in fact, it was only yesterday that we had a delegation to this parliament of Uyghur um, Australians who told the tragic stories of what was the, uh, the awful conditions and situation that their relatives in Xinjiang were suffering through. With their um, sisters, their husbands, their families who were imprisoned who were in the, in, essentially in concentration camps, who were being tortured, who they hadn't heard from for years. And for the reasons, the only reasons been given was the fact that they had, you know, one of them had travelled to Egypt, one of them had travelled to Turkey. And for that, they were then uh, essentially in the, the indoctrination camps or then imprisoned for decades. So, we think that the issues of human rights should be at the core of our relationship with China. And we, you know, right now, re reiterate our call for the Chinese government to allow access for UN and other independent human rights observers, which is the absolutely bottom line, a simple basic step that they should take um, immediately. And you know, the fact that in terms of our relationship with China, we should see action from the Australian government on a framework for targeted sanctions to address these human rights violations wherever in the world they occur. We have seen the Australian government dragging its feet now for months on proposed Magnitsky legislation. We know that there's a letter that was sitting on the Prime Minister's desk months ago and it hasn't been answered. So we need the government to be taking urgent action and respond to the unanimous cross-partisan recommendation from the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade that they introduce Magnitsky legislation. As Senator Lambie was saying, man, this government seems to just want to walk away from these issues. They need to be brought front and centre. And certainly, by having this inquiry, it will enable these issues to be considered in a holistic, complex way. I mean, the inquiry would be an excellent opportunity to consider our trading relationship with China, which clearly is absolutely in a, in a position of tumult at the moment. And there are clear steps that we could be taking to improve our ability to manage our trade relationship with China. The Greens believe that we, must, we should be rethinking our political economy and shifting away from a reliance on an extractive-based economy to one where we add value through a strong domestic manufacturing sector powered by renewables like green hydrogen. I mean, this applies to all of our trading relationships, not just China. And any reduction in our exports of fossil fuels to China, which are you know, being forced on us by the trade embargoes that China is, is imposing on us, should be seen as an inevitable part of the tra global transition to net zero in the face of the climate crisis, and actually an opportunity be, to be reducing our economic reliance on, on unsustainable fossil fuels. And we reckon that the Australian government should be working with Australian industry to diversify our markets following the decades of focus on exports to China as the mainstay of our economic growth. And there are so many opportunities. You know, green steel, green aluminium are some of the possibilities there. And current trade disputes demonstrate that our free trade agreements aren't worth the paper they are written on. These are the issues that should be considered in this type of inquiry. What does it, you know, what does it mean to have a free trade um, agreement with China in the current situation when they can just basically tear it up? You know, these are the very things that we should be considering. Um, 
So, then moving on to our broader foreign policy. In terms of our broader foreign policy, it really needs to be seriously looked at. And the Australian Greens believe that in its international relations we should be promoting peace, democracy, ecological sustainability, equity, justice and human rights, applying to our relationship with China, as it does for every other country in the world. And as part of that, and again, something that could be really seriously looked at in this inquiry is, given the relationship between the US and China, the very strong argument that we as Australians should be pursuing an independent foreign policy, and that should include renegotiating the US alliance. Because an unthinking alliance with the US means that we are not seen as an honest independent broker in our region, including with China. And hitching our wagon to the Trump administration, it was a really powerful example of this, and it significantly contributed to the current dire state of the bilateral relationship that we have with China. And the alliance with the US makes us less safe, not more. And additionally, I think if we are going to have a focus on a relationship with China that's based on human rights, it would also include looking at the influence that we have as Australia while our human rights here in Australia are uh, under question. And while we continue to turn a blind eye to the ongoing injustices and racism suffered by our First Nations peoples and ignore calls for truth-telling and for treaties, while we jail innocent asylum seekers and refugees indef indefinitely, while we are criminalising Australians seeking to return home, we are vulnerable to accusations of hypocrisy on the world stage. And we are not in a position where we can forcibly say to China, you need to be addressing your human rights abuses while these things are ongoing in Australia. And the Australian government can talk about a rules-based order in as many white papers, policy statements and major speeches as it likes, but until we walk the talk, we are continually undermining our credibility. And finally, we think as part of looking at our relationship with China, what we need to really keep a focus on is the need to reject racism, that we need to have a strongly anti-racist approach, and that the significant focus in the media and in this place on the threat from the Chinese government, as well as the Australian government's focus on Chinese foreign influence, it has been damaging to Asian communities in Australia, to international students and other visitors to Australia with Asian heritage. And so we need to keep that in mind, and we need to make sure that we are always supporting Australians and others in Australia of Asian heritage, and that when we are being critical of the Chinese government, of the Chinese Communist Party, that, we, that that doesn't flow over into racism, into xenophobia and into attacks of prejudice and discrimination against people of Chinese heritage. I mean, Asian Australians and permanent residents and temporary visa holders must be able to participate freely in all aspects of Australian society. And so we believe that in having this sort of debate and if we got this inquiry up, that it would be really important throughout that to continue to be calling out racism and championing the rights of our multicultural um, communities. And our relationship with China is incredibly complex. And it is exactly what, because of that, because of that complexity, that it is a very appropriate issue for the Senate to be looking into. So the Greens are very definitely in support of this motion to set up this, this Senate inquiry to consider Australia's complex relationship with the People's Republic of China. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I am pleased to support the motion moved by Senator Lambie. It, in fact, is the same uh, motion or in, in the same terms as uh, I, I proposed for an inquiry a year ago on 10 June 2020. That uh, proposed motion uh, was in turn the sixth in a series of motions over 18 months uh, seeking a referral uh, to a committee on the topic of China. Uh, all of which were rejected by the Coalition and Labor. Neither has offered a satisfactory explanation as to why the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee should not inquire into the future of one of Australia's most important international relationships. I would argue that the Senate's refusal uh, to establish an inquiry two years ago, even a year ago, was a major lost opportunity. Such an inquiry could have engaged the full range of interests and stakeholders involved in our relations with China. 
The advantages of such an engagement and, were dis and discussion were clear then and are even more obvious now. Again, this inquiry would be about looking at uh, areas where there is good in the relationship, but also areas where we need to avoid or we need to fix um, or we need to take action in, in regard of. And I think that's even more important now as we face a very challenging set of circumstances that have been presented to us by the People's Republic of China. Now, a number of coalition senators uh, and Labor senators have privately expressed to me their interest in support for an inquiry into our relations with China. Senator Kitching was one, once prepared to co-sponsor a motion, only to withdraw at the last minute. Senator, uh, Senator Ferravanti Wells did vote for this motion when it was last put to a vote last year, and I thank her for that. In any case, we have a motion before us today. Our, rela our relationship with China is at uh, its lowest ebb since the late 1960s. The way forward is uncertain and fraught with difficulty as we seek to maintain a diplomatic dialogue with Beijing while defending our national interests and our sovereignty. In these circumstances, a wide-ranging Senate inquiry to report by 30 November would still be useful and indeed essential, essential to help chart the way forward. And I commend the motion to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that this is the seventh time that this motion or a similar motion has been moved. And I thank Senator Lambie and before her, Senator Patrick, for moving similar motions. I want to make it clear that the Chinese people have a long and overwhelmingly positive relationship with Australia, starting in the early days on our soil before our nation was even born. From Cape York to Victoria, the Chinese people have contributed marvellously. And I welcome their ongoing contribution on our shores, without influence from the Chinese Communist Party. There have been many apparent conflicts of interest raised publicly between Chinese officials, including Chinese Communist Party officials and Labor MPs, and between Chinese or Chinese Communist Party officials and Liberal MPs and officials. Despite this, on every occasion, the Liberal Nationals and Labor Senators have combined to jointly oppose this inquiry and its predecessors into the China-Australia relationship. I won't list all the many items that we have raised in the past to justify this inquiry, and I won't go through them yet again. I will cover some new material. We have supported this motion in the past and will continue to do so until we get what the Australian people need and want. What have both the tired old parties got to hide? Why are they putting their interests ahead of our national interest? Especially because in recent years the Australia-China relationship, or should I say the Australia-Chinese Communist Party relationship, has undergone significant adjustments. It was only this week that, based on advice from Director General of Security Mr Mike Burgess, the CSIRO announced that it would not renew an Oceans Research Collaboration with the Chinese Qingdao National Marine Laboratory, which has strong military links following an ASIO warning that the joint project could help Chinese Navy operations against Australian submarines. It was during the March 2020 estimates that I raised the alarm about this danger with Mr Burgess, who responded that he was not aware of this particular research at the time of questioning. This week's response has taken 15, year, 15 months to take effect. Now, it's apparent that these actions are designed to minimise the extensive intrusion into Australia's sovereignty that the totalitarian Chinese Communist Party government has achieved to date. Never before has the demonstrably anti-freedom totalitarian Chinese Communist Party flexed its muscles more than the posturing occurring today. The Chinese Communist Party has never been more active in the areas of expansionism and neo-colonialism in the economic sphere and in military realms, sometimes in the guise of building friendships with less affluent or emerging countries as part of the Chinese Belt and Road regime. Some describe this intrusion as assaults on the sovereignty of countries. One nation and I agree with that view. 
When China was a third world country, Australia was a willing neighbour in helping China to develop and grow. Even though much of China remains third world, with poverty and food shortages and minimal human rights, and with a massive population. Despite this, and, dis and with advanced industrialization and significant economic power, China is now approaching economic superpower status with a massive defense capability challenging the already established other superpowers. A reasonable country would harness its abilities to assist the advancement of its people. Unfortunately, the Chinese Communist Party has taken an entirely different approach. It's taken an expansionist path that's creating tensions in the delicate balance between countries. That now threatens international relationships, both economically and by way of military threat to the smaller and even large countries around it. The path includes bullying tactics, economic and, and threats of direct military intervention. When any country objects to the Communist Party's tactics on the world stage, we simply need to look at Chinese President Xi's statement directed towards Australia and the economic decisions his government makes with the intent to punish Australia when we called out the Chinese Communist Party on subjects including the source of the China virus, COVID-19, or on the Chinese Communist Party's poor human rights record in persecuting the Uyghurs and putting the whole nation of Tibet under house arrest. The Chinese Communist Party's economic retaliation against Australia as payback was swift. Brazenly, the Chinese government announced to the world that their economic retaliation against Australia was payback for calling for the inquiry <coughs> excuse me, into, into the source of the world's current virus crisis, with China now widely accepted as the source. These acts are examples that the Chinese Communist Party still has a long way to go before being recognised as leaders of a genuine superpower. This is what the Chinese Communist Party craves, positive recognition as a genuine world power capable of performing a responsible leadership role. <coughs> If the best that the Chinese Communist Party do, can do is to be considered a world-class bully, that's not much of a goal. And history shows bullies always get what's coming to them in the end. Australia is finally waking up to the Chinese Communist Party's overall plan. With the tightening of Australian national security concerns, cancelling the belt and road contract between Victoria and the, and the Chinese Communist Party, and the strengthening of ties with like-minded democratic countries, Australia is making headway in responding to the less than veiled threats from the Chinese Communist Party. In addition to the CSIRO's assistance to the Chinese Communist Party agency, I referred to the widespread Chinese ownership of prime Australian land and key strategic assets. The impact of Chinese influence into our universities and communities is yet to be fully considered. The Chinese Communist Party actively attempts to influence its students to not enrol in an Australian university, suggesting that the students would be at risk of discrimination. The placing of trade restrictions on the import of Australian produce, including a massive excise duty on barley, was said to be specifically aimed at dam damaging the export market for, of barley as a punishment aimed at Australian trade. Fortunately, Australian farmers are resilient and have found new markets. But that was some stress that they, they could have done without. I would hope the Australian government continues to wind back more of these arrangements with the Chinese Communist Party that do not support Australian values. The future of the Australian relationship with the Chinese Communist Party government will only improve when the Chinese Communist Party acts as a good neighbour and turns away from its existing destructive policies. It's beyond time to have an inquiry into the development of Australia's relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. I welcome, as I said, the ongoing contribution of the Chinese people on our shores, but without the influence from the Chinese Communist Party. We need to restore freedoms in our country and restore our national sovereignty. We need to protect our country. We need an inquiry into the China-Australia relationship. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Robertson. If there are no further speakers, I'll put the question that the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Those have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Order. Shut the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion, oh, sorry, um, I shall. Uh, those that uh, agree shall uh, go to the right. Those against to the left, I call Senator Lambie to tell it for the eyes. Senator McCarthy to tell it for the nose. Thank you. Order. Uh, the result of the division is ayes 13, noes 28. The question is resolved in the negative. Clerk. Business of the Senate Order of the Day number 1 relating to recommendations of the scrutiny of delegated legislation standing committee. Senator Fear of anti -Vels. Thank you. I move that recommendations 8 and 10 and recommendations 9, as amended in the terms circulated in the chamber, be adopted. I put the question that the motion moved by Senator Fear of anti -Vels be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. Those against no. The ayes have it. Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 2, Online Safety Bill 2021 and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate and the debate on the amendment moved by Senator Pratt. Senators, I'll just give you the opportunity to go wherever you're going so we can clear the floor and we can get a bit of order. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you very much, um, uh, Acting Chair. Um, so this legislation uh, has been rammed through uh, along an extraordinarily tight time frame. Uh, there was but a couple of weeks to... I'm sorry, but there is a heck of a lot of gaggle on my left, and I can't hear a word you're saying, so I'll give you the opportunity. Thank you. To kick off again, Senator Steelejohn. Could we bind the clock back slightly? No. Okay. Um, One minute won't make a difference. Okay. Oh, oh, that's harsh. All right. Um, so, um, uh, yes, this legislation has been uh, subject to uh, extraordinarily expedited processes. Only weeks offered uh, to make submissions uh, when the bill was presented uh, in a draft form. A mere two-week inquiry to the Environment and Communications uh, Committee. Uh, at, both stage, uh, at both stages, community members made clear uh, that there was not enough time to make detailed submissions uh, to address the complex uh, elements of the legislation. Uh, the result of this uh, extraordinarily unjustified uh, speed with which this legislation has been rammed through is that it has uh, the potential to uh, 
pose profound unintended consequences uh, among, upon segments of our uh, community. And let me just say this very clearly. Okay? Uh, sex workers in this country are some of the most underrepresented workers in our community. They are not subject to many of the protections uh, that are available to others that work in other industries. And this absence of protection is because of the inability of legislatures like this one uh, to grapple and the unwillingness of legislatures such as this one to grapple with the complexities of the work and the protections that they require. Regardless of the fact that this chamber uh, seems to be preparing itself to pass a piece of legislation which may have catastrophic impacts uh, on the ability of sex workers to work, let me say this very, very clearly. Sex work is work. Sex workers are workers, and they deserve proper protections uh, to do their work, and they should not be impinged in doing that work. Now, this bill, because it has been rushed through, because it has not been subject uh, to the appropriate scrutiny, contains many provisions uh, which may well negatively impact the ability of a sex worker to work not least of which is the importation of definitions of classified material straight from the classification codes, which we know are outdated, and the empowering of the relevant administrative body, in this case the Safety Commissioner, to be able to make uh, moralistic judgments which may negatively affect the ability of a sex worker to do their job. This is a very serious piece of legislation in relation to sex workers, and many organisations from the Scarlet Alliance uh, to Men at Work and many other organisations attempted to submit in the brief period that they were given uh, in relation to these concerns, and yet none of them have been properly addressed in the course of the legislation. There are also elements of this bill which will uh, have the potential to negatively impact the trans community, and my colleague, uh, Senator Rice, will speak to that in great detail, I am sure. Additionally, there are elements of this legislation uh, which may potentially be used uh, to prevent uh, the Senator publication Steele, John, of imagery and content online. Being oh, God. Are you seeking leave to continue? You don't have to seek leave, but I'm sorry. Can leave to continue my. Yep. Thank, thank you, Senator Steele. John, sorry to cut off. You're on a roll. Um, so, pursuant to order, uh, we will now move to debate on three Treasury bills, and I now call the clerk. Government business orders of day four, five, and six relating to three Treasury bills. Resumption of second reading debate. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, here we are yet again. It's another day in the Senate and it is another bill about superannuation because this government has an ideolo ideological opposition to superannuation that defies rationality. And this is in their DNA. As an opposition backbencher in the 1990s, Tony Abbott, Mr Abbott, described superannuation as a con. And all that has changed since then is that they have got marginally better and only barely at disguising their antipathy towards working people and their antipathy towards working people and their representatives having a say over their own future. And that is why ordinary Australians listening to this debate ought to be concerned when the government comes in here and does what they've done tonight, which is to steal into this chamber under the cover of darkness, with a dirty deal to extend hours with no notice, a secret deal which no one in this chamber, at least on this side, has any information about whatsoever. Because the bill we're debating tonight will not be, will not be the bill that proceeds through into committee stage. Because the crossbench senators who have supported this bill, because that's the only reason this is being rushed through, have done a deal. And those crossbench senators 
the ones who voted tonight for the hours motion, need to come into this chamber and explain the deal that they have done. Because if the Senate is about anything, it is about scrutiny and it is about transparency. And without information about the debate that will take place tomorrow, it is very difficult for the senators tonight participating in this second reading debate to understand exactly what it is we will be asked to vote on tomorrow when this, these bills are crunched through. But we do know one thing. This government cannot be trusted on super, ever. If you are a high net worth Australian with a self-managed superannuation fund, you probably have nothing to worry about. But if you are running an underperforming for-profit fund, you probably have nothing to worry about. But working Australians, hoping for a decent, dignified retirement, have learned by now that the government's endless tinkering with superannuation is motivated by nothing but animus. Because instead of fo focusing on the data, instead of focusing on the evidence, these bills, like every other bill on super that's been put before us over the past eight years, enact measures that reflect the hostility of the coalition government to industry super. These people simply cannot bear the idea that working people and their representatives will have control over their own money. It is true that the capacity to direct investments into all corners of the Australian economy confers a power on trustees. So why shouldn't that power be exercised by business and by workers in the interests of the Australian economy? Now, I'd hope to speak on each of these three bills. There are important matters of detail and of principle that deserve to be aired, but instead the government has done what it loves to do—cut down the time for debate and cut down the time for scrutiny in this place. But I will start with the Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Future, Your Super Bill 2021. This is a very poorly drafted bill. It will have adverse consequences for vulnerable Australians. It will damage the retirement outcomes for ordinary Australians and it will subject our superannuation system to considerable risk. Stakeholders from the ACTU to AI Group to the AIST all raise concerns with this legislation. True to form, the government has failed to even engage with these concerns, let alone address them. And Labor will be moving amendments to try and remedy the worst of the government's legislation. But without these problems being fixed, Labor stands by these stakeholders in saying that this legislation should not be passed unless its worst aspects are remedied. Let's just have a bit of a talk about the problems. In the House, we were able to convince the government to remove a directions power. Now, this was a power that would have given any treasurer, any treasurer the power to cancel investments that he or she didn't like. Now, this power could have been applied to cancel investments in solar panels, could have been applied to cancel investments in coal mines. Even coalition backbenchers were appalled by this power, by the overreach. But in the legislation before us tonight, the government has retained a backdoor regulation-making power in the bill that lets them do exactly the same thing, by declaring a payment or an investment as not being in the best financial interests of members. And for anyone playing along at home, this is in Schedule 3, Items 2 and 10. And Labor's amendments will remove these backdoor regulation marking powers and ensure that funds are only required to act in the best interests of their members, not in the best political interests of the Treasurer of the day. Now, the government made a commitment to concerned National Party MPs that they had fixed this problem. They have not. And Minister Hume should explain why she is trying to pull one over her coalition colleagues to give a future Treasurer the power to prevent any particular investment that they choose to oppose. A wind farm, perhaps, or maybe a coal mine in a sensitive electorate. Labor believes that no one should be stapled to an underperforming fund. Of course, 
people should be attached to superannuation funds that deliver for them and their family in retirement. That's not what this bill does. One of the very first concerns identified in the Economics Committee inquiry relates to the prospect of up to three million Australians being stapled to underperforming funds. The ACTU has described these provisions as a poor way to achieve its goals. The Australian Industry Group also raised concerns with the sequencing of the reforms. It will see employees stapled to funds prior to being notified if those funds have failed the new performance test. And I'll quote from them because they said the approach to reducing multiple accounts is flawed. Treasury stated that 21 out of the 77 MySuper products are underperforming, and these products hold over $100 billion in assets across 3 million accounts, charging $1.2 billion in fees annually. Of course, there's also an unknown number of Australians who may be holding underperforming choice accounts. This government's bill completely fails to engage with this problem and raises the prospect of people being stapled to underperforming funds in perpetuity, directly the opposite of what the bill purports to do. The government also seeks to introduce a best financial interest duty. It imposes a positive duty on superannuation trustees to prove that any particular payment made by a superannuation fund is in the best financial interests of members with no materiality threshold. The Law Council said of this, that in its view, trustees already have an obligation to act in the best interests of members. The Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia noted that the risk is that this system will not just create a burden in terms of accounting, documenting, attesting and providing assurance around that. In the absence of a materiality test, it will also see a vast amount of resources and effort going into documenting within a very narrow scope the costs and benefits of every single decision, failing to take account of the cumulative impacts, the interdependencies, etc. How can this be a good decision? How can this be a decision that would support a high-performing superannuation sector? Stakeholders have also raised concerns that the stapling measure may result in workers in high-risk industries missing out on insurance provisions tailored to their industry. And as a result, they may not qualify for payments in the event of death or total or permanent disability. And the ACTU has commented that the impact is even worse under these proposed laws should the worker be one of the millions who move from a low-risk industry to a high-risk industry. And is there anything here, any indication from the government that they intend to fix this problem? No, there is not. In his second reading speech on this bill, the Treasurer has said that every Australian should demand the highest level of accountability and performance from their superannuation fund. Well, hear, hear to that. That's a sentiment that we can all agree on. But the three million members in the for-profit funds who will receive no protection whatsoever from this bill won't meet that test, won't meet that test set by the Treasurer for his own legislation. And that is because of the government's insistence of focusing always, always on the politics, never on the evidence before them. And finally, this bill will make significant changes to the administration of super in Australia. And every employer around the country is going to need to make changes to their payroll and their employment systems, and super funds will need to make changes to their systems too. And the stakeholders across the board have raised concerns about the capacity of all of these organisations to be ready for a 1st of July commencement of employers to implement the necessary changes. This bill should not be passed in its current form. And if the government were more concerned with protecting Australians' retirement savings and less concerned with prosecuting their ideological agenda, they would withdraw it and fix it. The Treasury Laws Amendment Self-Managed Superannuation Funds Bill 2020 is also to be crunched through in the hours motion agreed to this evening. And this is another bad bill. And we know this because it's what countless submitters to the Senate Economics Legislation Inquiry told us. The evidence was that the bill would primarily benefit high wealth families, could contribute to undermining the industry super sector and lead to poorer outcomes for Australian retirees. Now, it's very on brand 
very on brand for the Morrison government. And it shows a great deal more enthusiasm for measures that loosen the reins on the financial services industry than measures that are designed to protect consumers. And Labor is concerned that one of the biggest beneficiaries of this bill will be unscrupulous financial advisers who are not working in the interests of fund members. And you might ask, you might ask quite reasonably, exactly whose side is the government on? Evidence provided to the committee also showed that financial advice had been overwhelmingly not in the best interests of clients and did not comply with the requirement that advice be appropriate. That's coming from ASIC. That's coming from the government's own regulatory agencies. And yet the government persists with the bill. They are deaf to the evidence. It continues to bring forward bills like this, bills like the National Consumer Credit Protection Amendments, bills that do not put the interests of Australian consumers at the centre of the government's agenda. And Labor has made a series of recommendations as part of the Economics Committee inquiry process, and you'll be surprised to hear they too have not been taken up by this government. And I turn now to the more flexible super bill. At the outset, I can confirm that the opposition will be supporting this bill. It makes a series of technical amendments to the operation of our superannuation system. But I want to note a curious point about an amendment that's been circulated. Because the Pauline Hanson One Nation Party has moved an amendment to this bill to increase the superannuation concessional contribution cap for people aged 67 to $32,500. That all sounds pretty technical, doesn't it? But this is an issue that is very dear to Senator Hanson. The thing is that many, many senators breach this cap every year. They usually have to pay thousands of dollars to reconcile their tax bill. This amendment will save senators aged 67 and over a fair bit of money. Can people guess how old Senator Hanson is? Does anyone in this chamber know the answer to that question? Because I can tell you that Senator Hanson is aged 67. What a coincidence, Deirdre Chambers. In fact, I think she may well be one of the only people who voted for the hours motion. She may well be one of the only people in this chamber who voted for that motion and who will directly benefit from this amendment. And what I am curious about is whether this is part of the deal. If it is, people should come in here and say so. Because I will be very interested to see if Senator Hanson's amendment, the one that benefits her directly, will be supported by the government as part of their dirty deal tonight. Because I can tell you what, when it comes to debating super in this place, you can be absolutely certain that it is not the interests of the Australian public that are front of mind for this crowd over here. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator McCarthy. Order, Mr. Point, Acting, of order? Oh, sorry, uh, point yeah. of order, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'd, I'd like to bring your attention to the state of the chamber. Sure. Okay. Ring the bells.
Quorum present. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you very much, President. Well, because of um, the anti-democratic anti hours motion um, supported by the government and One Nation earlier today, I'm expected to give three second reading speeches on complex pieces of legislation within 15 minutes. And I want to place on the record that is democratically fraudulent, and the Australian Greens simply will not be able to express our views satisfactorily on these three pieces of legislation Sorry. tonight. Well, I've got a point of order. Senator uh, Davey? Sorry, Mr President, but um, Senator McKim has just accused the Senate of being fraudulent. That is a uh, very definitive accusation, and I would ask that he withdraw. I heard the term a critique of a decision of the Senate, which I think is historically in order. I didn't hear the word fraudulent. Um, but I'll listen carefully to Senator McKim. If he did say that, I'd ask him to withdraw. But the critique I heard was generally allowable within the terms of debate. Senator McKim. All right, thank you, President. Firstly, on the Treasury Laws Amendment, more flexible superannuation bill. Uh, this bill is yet another in the growing list of little fiddles to the superannuation system that this government wants to make that are simply designed to make the rich richer in this country. And I want to be very clear that all of these um, small and apparently boring tweaks to superannuation only help those who have enough money to benefit for them. I will go into more detail on that legislation if I have time uh, in the 14 minutes remaining to me. On the Treasury Laws Amendment, self-managed superannuation funds Bill 2020, uh, which would allow the size of self-managed super funds to be increased from four members to six members. Again, yet another little tweak to the super system that will be of benefit to the wealthy and next to no use to anyone else. Um, perfectly to type for this government because they are very fixated on the rich getting richer in this country. Uh, the rich getting uh, a bigger slice of the pie, which means, of course, poor people in this country get a smaller size, slice of the pie. This government wants the wealthy to get wealthier because the wealthy are their mates and the wealthy are their political donors. On the um, Your Super, Your Future bill, I want to uh, make a more detailed critique of the government on this legislation. It wasn't so long ago that the Liberals were all for superannuation because the game plan was clear. Jerry-rigged the system so that the vertically integrated banks could get their hands onto a good chunk of the nearly $3 trillion in retirement savings which exist in this country. The money grubbers were very, very eager for a big compulsory super system. Now, this view was espoused by people like Senator Bragg in his former life as a lobbyist for the Financial Services Council. There, Senator Bragg openly advocated for a rise in compulsory super contributions, not just to the legislated 12 per cent, but all the way up to 15 per cent. Now, at that time, Senator Bragg was all for super because he was working for the banks, and the banks saw an opportunity to get their hands on a large chunk of money. But then the facts got in the way. Firstly, the Productivity Commission review that found that not-for-profit industry funds performed better than for-profit retail funds, including those run by the banks. And secondly, it found that keeping super in a default product was likely to yield a better return than if you exercised choice. In other words, the government's own economic rationalist think tank found that most people were better off not playing the market because their default super fund was being well managed by a not-for-profit industry body with union and employee representation on the board. Then we had the Banking Royal Commission to which superannuation was added with a view to providing some cover for the absolute walloping that the banks were expected to get and did, in fact, duly 
receive. But that backfired too, with a procession of misdeeds uncovered in bank run and other for-profit super funds, mostly in the form of excessive fees and keeping people in, un in underperforming funds, and there being not much more than some lavish marketing by one industry fund uncovered because, I mean, heaven help us, industry funds might woo clients in the same way as the rest of the corporate world. So after the Productivity Commission and after the Banking Royal Commission, the Liberals had to change their tune. Openly spruiking bank-owned super wasn't working for them anymore, so now what are they trying to do? That's right, white ant the entire superannuation system. Now, the likes of Senator Bragg, who's gone to the trouble of writing a book to demonstrate his mea culpa, are now pushing ideas such as super is the reason wages aren't rising, super should be voluntary for young people, and this is uh, one of his best efforts. Uh, there isn't enough money in the housing market already, so why don't we let people spend their super on housing too? Of course, the super for housing push is just a reinvention of the aforementioned goal of allowing the banks to get their hands on super. The trouble for the government is that the public aren't buying this rubbish because, by and large, Australians understand and support the system of compulsory retirement savings funding long-term investment and, secondly, they simply don't trust the likes of Senator Bragg. So it's not surprising that, given their total about-face, given the unpalatability of their actual aim, that this government has surfed up yet another half-baked bits and pieces investment seminar buffet piece of legislation. It's all in the name. Your super, your future. Signed copies available, President, at the door. Now, Schedule 1 of this bill seeks to eliminate duplicate accounts by stapling workers to a single superannuation fund. So instead of automatically getting a new account when you get a new job, you'll keep your ex existing account unless you make an active choice to change accounts. This was a recommendation of the Productivity Commission agreed to by the Royal Commission. But, importantly, the Productivity Commission also recommended changing the system of how workers are allocated to a default fund. But this legislation doesn't propose any changes to the way that workers are allocated to a default fund. It is absolutely half-baked. Now, the Australian Greens are not suggesting that the existing system of creating a new account every time someone gets a new job, unless they choose not to, should be kept as it is. It shouldn't, because a lot of people don't know what super they've got where or what to do about choosing a new fund, because, believe it or not, most people don't spend very much time thinking about superannuation. People don't tend to exercise choice with superannuation, which is why introducing stapling while keeping the existing system of allocating default super through industrial awards is a back-to-front way of dealing with account duplication. But this bill uh, also offers up a more sinister possibility. Don't put it past the banks to contrive a way to sign up children, potentially 12-year-olds, to their first superannuation account just so they can be stapled to a bank-owned fund for life. I mean, this bill could usher in dolomites for super. Schedule 2 introduces an annual performance test for default products. There's a two-strike process for products that fail the test. The first strike, uh, when the first strike happens, they inform their members, and when the second strike happens, they're closed off to new members. But they still get to keep existing members who will continue to remain in an underperforming fund, a fund that they are now stapled to thanks to Schedule 1. Again, uh, a half-baked scenario where Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 are basically not talking to each other. But stepping back, how is underperformance actually being determined? Well, the bill set out sets out that it is an eight-year average of the fund's investments measured against relevant benchmarks. And the relevant benchmarks um, uh, are named in the regulations as mostly indexes created by two giant global investment firms, the FTSE and the, S and the MSCI, massive cogs in the global financial system and 
uh, cogs that have become enormously powerful in the wake of the GFC. But as the indexes, but uh, the indexes and their creators are anything but unvested, apolitical, or free from corruption. If nothing else. The Australian super system, and industry super in particular, has provided a store of patient capital in a world that is trying to flip returns at an ever faster rate. But instead of trusting the existing long-term investment approach for a retirement saving system that spans a person's working life, this bill will force Australian funds to follow the rest of the herd, including straight over the edge of whatever cliff the London and New York, New York index fund managers might lead them to. Finally, Schedule 3 seeks to require super trustees not just to make decisions in the best interests of members but in the best financial interests of members. Now, this one is not half cooked or half baked. It is just simply and purely bad legislation. Even with the government's amendment to knock out the investment kill switch, this one is an absolute shocker. To start with, it's in direct contradiction to the Royal Commission. Are we starting to see a pattern emerge here from the LNP of ignoring Royal Commission recommendations? Yes, we certainly are. Commissioner Hain was, as usual, abundantly clear about his findings. Firstly, he said, I consider that the existing rules, especially the best interests covenant and the sole purpose test, set the necessary standards. Those standards should be applied according to their terms and, this is the important bit, without more specific elaboration. But remember, this, give, this government didn't want the Banking Royal Commission to start with and, to be frank, they're not really interested in its recommendations. The inclusion of the word financial in the best interest duty implies that money is all that matters. Now, just how this affects a super fund's decision to make investment decisions on a moral basis is unclear. For example, could a fund choose not to invest in tobacco or arms manufacturing or fossil fuels? Or, if it does so, are trustees then liable for civil penalties? because the bill also reverses the onus of proof in civil proceedings against a trustee. If APRA, would, APRA were to decide that a trustee wasn't acting in the best financial interests of the fund's members, the trustee then has to prove that they were. This is bad, bad legislation, bad legislation, and it could have significant impacts on ethical investing. This bill continues the time-honoured tradition of the Liberals doing whatever they can to funnel money towards the rent seekers in the financial system. This government positively detests that not-for-profit industry super funds with worker and employer, uh, and employer representatives on the board have been successful and are now seen as the natural managers of the country's retirement savings. But they can't go at it head on, so they have to try to undermine the whole system with bills like this. This bill, in conclusion, introduces a bodgy way to get rid of duplicate accounts. It puts investment managers management in the hands of global indexes and it outlaws impact investing or any other decision by a fund that is not purely for the greatest financial gain. Senators will have heard uh, this saying before, a person knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. And that is, thank you, it is indeed Oscar Wilde, and I, I'm paraphrasing there, I hasten um, to add. But the point here is there is more to life than money. And I've made choices in my superannuation whereby I know that my retirement savings are going into things that I support. And they are not going into things like arms trafficking or tobacco sales or fossil fuels and a range of other things that I don't want my superannuation going into. That is actually freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. And here we are, the government trying to take it away, trying to say that, that uh, a super fund has to manage funds only in 
the best financial interests. Well, I don't want my super managed in that way. I don't want my super managed that way. I want my super to be managed in an ethical way so that the, my investments are made into ethical products that help drive the transition out of fossil fuels, not continue to invest into it. And boy, oh boy, Order. you know in this place when you've hit a nerve, Mr President, because the hard right arc up from their seats. So uh, I am just going to say very clearly here that I know I have found a nerve in this government in, uh, in what I'm saying today. Now, uh, we are aware that Senator Patrick has amendments to this legislation, as does the opposition, and we will be supporting those amendments because they go a long way towards fixing the problems in this bill, so much so that if they are successful, the bill will barely resemble what the government has served up. As such, we will be reserving our position on this legislation until we see uh, uh, how those amendments travel tomorrow or whenever they ultimately end up getting put to the Senate, but we will not support the bill as it currently stands. And I simply say to the government, could you please um, get with the program and understand that uh, superannuation is critical for this country? Senator Bragg. I, mean, I simply make the point that superannuation is the greatest bet that Australia has ever made. Uh, in terms of forcing people to put almost 10 per cent of their salaries and wages into a scheme for the past 30 years which has not worked. I mean, this is a scheme that was created, cre created by ideology without any proper framework for its success. And here we are 30 years later with, it, which is with a scheme that costs more than it saves, a scheme that will never return a net positive position to the budget and a scheme that in 2050 will still have almost every Australian on the pension. This is a failed scheme. It was put in place by ideologues 30 years ago. And, and in, fact, in, fact, in, fact, in fact, I quote on the, the Treasury official Paul Order. Tilley, who wrote a history of the Treasury Department, saying that in the early 1990s, Treasury was not actually well equipped to do the necessary long-term work, and that the modelling done for super was done on the back of an envelope which, would, was, which was subsequently thrown out and lost to history. The whole thing was created without a framework. So that means that 30 years later, we are coming in with a, with a proposal to try and put a proper framework in place so that the scheme will actually work. Because we're actually not wreckers on our side. We, we believe this idea could work for Australia. It could work for Australian workers. And we want to fix it. We don't want to throw it in the bin. And so the Your Super, Your Future uh, bill is really all about putting that proper framework in place. Now, it's not just me saying that the system is broken. I mean, this is, this is the advice of the independent people like Grattan and Treasury and Choice. They're all saying that it's broken. Now, the problem with this debate, and it's been very good to come in and hear some of the contributions already, that almost everyone who has a view about super is conflicted. They have been bought out and owned by the, the wall of money, which is super. I mean, this is a scheme that receives $100 billion each and every year of workers' money. They open the door and the money just pours in, and they take out $30 billion in fees every year. $100 billion comes in and $30 billion comes out in fees. And with that money, they buy power and influence. They buy power and influence in the financial sector. They buy power and influence in the union sector. They buy power and influence in terms of employer groups. And we saw this week the AI group, which has received $1 million from Australian Super in the past year, disgustingly come out and defend the system without even declaring their conflict. So it shows that the big super industry can buy anyone. And this is not about sectoral games. It's not about comparing the finance sector or the, the, the union sector or whatever. This is about Australian workers getting the best possible value for their own money. And of course, we are, we are heavily invested in this scheme as taxpayers, as people, as citizens. Right? This scheme is costing the, the budget $40 billion a year in foregone income tax revenue. Foregone tax revenue, $40 billion. So we actually want the scheme to work. Um, otherwise, it is, as I say, the biggest bet we've ever made that, is, that has no prospect of ever really paying off. And so this bill is a really important structural change. It will improve the system. It will do three things. It will put in place a stapling regime so that people have one super fund for life, unless they choose to do something else. It will put in place finally, a best financial interest test 
which will stop the waste and stop the rot. And thirdly, it will put in place what should have been there 30 years ago, performance testing. For 30 years, these people have been able to take our money and do whatever they want with it, right? The, all the funds, and they have spent our money very poorly. No, I don't. No, thanks for the interjection. No, I just don't support it. No, I don't. No, I don't. Now, in terms of the single default, what I would say is the modern workforce is very different to the workforce of 1992, but yet we are stuck with a rigid system from 30 years ago, which basically assumes that you work for 30 or 40 years, you're retired for a few years, um, and now we have a, an economy where people are working multiple jobs, people can work flexibly. Um, obviously, the advent of the gig, gig economy has created more opportunities than were there in the past. Um, and so um, what this system will do is it will ensure that there is only one default fund or one, fu one fund for each Australian worker unless they choose to do something else. Uh, and so from 1 July this year, uh, employers will have to pay into the workers' default fund, that is their fund, and that is the fund that they will have until they choose a different one. Now, people have been concerned about the burden on employers. Employers have, rec have reported they can do this because of the advent of state straight through processing. Uh, this is uh, apparently quite an easy thing for employers to do through the ATO. Now, we have 100 funds today, right? about 100 default funds. Now, people have said, oh, geez, would it be bad if we had 10 big industry funds? Would I be worried about that? No, I wouldn't be worried about it because I have a view that the more that people have in super and the better the system is, the easier it will be to engage with. People will, people will decide to do something else. I mean, we shouldn't be trapped in this mindset that the whole thing has to be designed for the, the, the default person, for the disengaged person. Now, I know that suits the Labor Party and the Greens who like people to be disengaged from their own money so they can basically take, take the money from, from, so they can take the money from the, the black box, as they've done for 30 years. I mean, in the last, in the last year, $30 billion in fees have come out of the super, super system, and then there's been another $20 million paid to unions, right? So, I mean, very few people come to this debate with clean hands. I've worked inside this, the system. I've seen how broken it is. I've seen how crooked it is, and it is crooked, right? I mean, I mean the whole idea of, of you defending this position, the Labor Party defending the position that people should have multiple accounts, is disgusting. I mean, multiple accounts means twice the fees. It means lower returns. But you know what it means for the Labor Party and their mates, the unions? It means more money, more fees. That's why they're, they're defending it. So who would have thought that the party that is proclaimed to stand for the workers is wanting to defend a system which takes away the workers' money because, of course, they have to pay double fees. So the whole idea of this is to say you have one fund, which is the fund you have. It doesn't matter whether it's a retail fund or an industry fund or whatever. That's your fund. Okay? Now, you can choose a different fund. Fine. We all believe in choice. But that is, that is the backstop that we, that we have. Now, the, the second point really is— um, well, before I go to the second point, I should say, I mean, $2.6 billion a year is lost through multiple accounts. $2.6 billion a year. Now, I know, it's a lot, I know it's a lot of union subs, right? I know that union membership has, has fallen down to 10 per cent, and this is how the, the unions are keeping afloat, but it's really not, not appropriate. So don't forget, $30 billion a year is in fees. So underperformance, the performance testing should have been a feature of the system. I mean, the fact that there's been so many poor performing funds over the last 30 years really is an embarrassment to, to all of us. And I think we all share a collective blame there, that um, we shouldn't be compelling people to put their money into a scheme that isn't working. Right? Where people have been able to get great returns, fabulous, that's great. Right? We want more people to get that. But there, there have been serial unperformers. Um, as far as I can see, the bulk of these have been in the retail sector. Um, and these are, these are not, not the funds that should be able to receive the compulsory contributions. Right? This is an outsourced pension scheme. I mean, people sit in here and talk about, their, about the liberties of the superannuation scheme. I mean, give me a break. Give me a break. I mean, this is a compulsory scheme. The only reason the system exists is because of Canberra. Right? I mean, this is not the free market in operation. This is a compulsory pension scheme, which doesn't work. So the underperformance test, I think, is a good idea. I know there's been different views about whether or not the metrics are right. For, for the record, my view is it should be simple and clean and comparable. People need to be able to see that the calculation that has been done on their fund is fair and reasonable and comparable. Now, the, the way that that is to be done is obviously through the regulations. People know that. It's not in the bill. What the bill sets up is the framework to assess super funds. Now, I find it just 
unfathomable that people would come into this chamber and argue against the principle of being tested. I mean, what are people afraid of? What are people afraid of? We're making people put their money into these locked boxes. They should be tested. They should be the best possible funds. And if they can't perform, they can't even meet their own benchmark, they shouldn't be taking compulsory contributions. And, and lest we forget, these are the same people largely who come in here every day running the lines from the super funds. They can't think for themselves. They, you watch them tonight, they'll read all their speeches, they'll read all their speeches, and it really is pathetic. I mean, last year they were saying that as Australia faced the greatest economic shock in 100 years, that people shouldn't be able to have access to their super in an emergency. In an emergency, people couldn't have access to their own money, that, that they couldn't be trusted to touch their own money. Such is the depth that the, the Labor Party and the unions and co will go to to defend uh, their financial benefactors, their financial benefactors Order, at the, yes, at the uh, super funds, right? That, that is true. That is true. I mean, I look forward to your contribution, right? I mean, maybe you can do it without, a, without having to read it. Senator Stirl. Sure. Order, order. Sure, Senator, let's do it. Great. Order. Senator Stirl. I'm very happy to do I it, right? I mean, order, I mean you're Senator, selling work Senator out. Bragg, Senator Stirl, I urge you to restrain your language with some of those interjections. Thank you. Oh, well, let's not go there, Senator Stirl. You have an opportunity to make a contribution. Senator Bragg. Well, thankfully, we have people in this place who will stand up for workers. I mean, you, you just want to do the bidding of the unions, and we're trying to get a better deal for workers, right? I mean, there, there are people in this place who want to throw this whole system in the bin, right? We don't want to do that, right? We want to fix this system, right? You have a vested interest in making this thing work, because I tell you what, the longer it doesn't work, the longer there will be microscopes and scrutiny on this scheme as being busted, because it's breaking the budget, it gets no one off the pension, Order. the fees cost an arm and a leg. So we are trying to get those fees under control. We're trying to make this scheme work, right? I don't think that's, that's, I don't think that's too ideological. So the regulations we made by, by the minister, and like everything else in this place where I've had an opportunity to make a contra contribution, I do think I don't, I, don't, I don't think that the regulators should be making these regulations. So it's important that ministers who are accountable to this chamber make the regulations, and they can be disallowed, right? So uh, that is yet to be established, but they must be comparable. They must be easy to understand. It must be easy for workers and members to be able to compare the super funds. And this performance testing, which Labor and the unions are so afraid of, uh, will be an important feature, I think, I think, going forward. Now, let's just finish on this point about the best financial interest duty. And again, Labor doesn't want the super funds to work in the interest of workers, which is just extraordinary. So $100 billion a year flows into the funds. $30 billion comes out in fees. $30 million is paid to the unions, right? Will be paid to the unions by 2030, right? This is the cash cow for the unions. And they're all here, all the union people who have been appointed to the Senate to defend the union interests, right? Really is pathetic. But I, I reserve my criticism for the directors as well and the employer groups that have got their snouts in the trough. Super is the best thing they ever invented because it, it keeps them all alive, right? I mean, there's no other purpose for employer groups and unions. And the banks have been just as bad. I mean, they have, they have been, been, been proven by the Hain Royal Commission to have had their snouts in the trough, to have too often have put the interests of shareholders before members. And these are the words that Labor don't want to hear. But the fact is, the whole system has underperformed. It is a system that should have had more safeguards to protect workers, to protect people's money. But that wasn't done by the Labor Party at the time because they were so desperate to hand over the cash to the unions and the banks, and that's what Keating does. That's why Keating is still so defensive about this scheme. You come out and you attack common old backbenchers, uh, which is a, sh a sign of his defensiveness. I mean, this scheme is not working. We want to try and get it on track. The best financial interest duty is the centrepiece of this bill, and my view is re reversing the onus to make sure the trustees can demonstrate that the money that, that they're paying to the unions for directors' fees or advertising for political donations or to banks or to related parties is in the members' interests. They have to prove that. Otherwise, why are they doing it? Now, that is reasonable. There will be record-keeping arrangements put in place, and APRA will have to enforce this law. Now, I have to say again for the record, um, it's regrettable that we need to put a new, tougher fiduciary-style duty in place. 
There is already a best interest duty. There is already a sole purpose test. But as we've seen from Senate estimates, um, APRA has presided over a system which has allowed the workers' money to be stolen by the super funds at the banks and the industry funds, and that is wrong. And so, yes, the best financial interest duty will clarify. It will tidy up. The trustees collectively and individually will know. They can no longer take away the workers' money and waste it on union boondoggles and to send it off to the banks. They can't do it anymore. But APRA will have to enforce that law vigorously. And if this bill passes this chamber, um, I will make it my personal objective to ensure that this law is properly enforced. Because we've had 30 years of just wasting money, wasting money. I mean, who could imagine a scheme that is, that is concocted 30 years ago in Canberra where the modelling was thrown out because it was done on a coaster, it was done without a framework, without a proper obje objective in place, that it could be a scheme that has taken 10 per cent of people's wages, that has no prospect of ever becoming net positive to budget, has no prospect of ever getting most people off the pension, that has no, no prospect of ever really getting the fees down if Labor had their way. So the only plan to fix super is this plan. It's the only plan. And we now see today the end of Labor's policy integrity. They are only now a party of vested interests defending the tired old union movement. And I cannot wait to hear the pathetic contributions and all the speeches that will be read tonight.